Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Order. Believe it or not, I have the privilege of the prayer and the pledge of allegiance today. That's an honor. We bow our heads, please. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you direct us, guide us, and give us wisdom throughout this meeting and the business of the county. We ask all of these things in your Son's name. Amen. 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 allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, they told me that I would get better and better daily from the real breakage, and I am. You see, I'm getting up and down much easier today than last Friday. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, do we have a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve. Okay. Motion second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Public comments. Jerry, Gary Jackson. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Mr. Commissioners, my name is Gary Jackson, <laughs> and I am a citizen of the county in Elon. Um, several years ago, I was approached by one of the commissioners here about serving on the Alamance County Veterans Services Committee. I applied for that and was accepted. And that's been an education in itself over the past three years. And I'm very grateful for being uh, recommended by uh, Commissioner Carter. I really appreciate that. Um, and being appointed to this kind of committee in any kind of thing anyone serves on, you want to take pride in the people that you work with. And I tell the director, Tammy, I, she's my boss. <laughs> but. Um, being with that, uh, when things are said that aren't true about this committee uh, or the office itself, um, I take offense to that, not in a bad way, but to come to here to try to explain in depth what uh, this office um, does for the county. Um, I did a, a pulled up a what we call it, something like a pie chart. There's over a hundred million dollars that's brought into this county by um, any array of veterans. It could be retirement pay, drill pay for reservists, it could be disability pay. Uh, so <clears throat> with that, <clears throat> we have a robust veterans committee, or a veterans uh, population here in the county. Now, I don't have to tell y'all, all the ones that wrote the job description and maybe the county manager did or something, but they're not a taxi. And they're not a concierge, in other words, getting people motel rooms if they need them or not. But they do this out of the respect and desire to serve veterans. Um, <clears throat> there was a comment made by someone that over 60% of the people that are seen are from out of county. <laughs> That's not true. Um, it's, it's 98 people out of about 5,400. And uh, we should take pride in that 98 people that come because the reason they come to this county is the reputation that Director Crawford and her three uh, officers have. Um, they get better service here. And you got to understand, too, and y'all do, y'all probably have communication with the other directors. But, I mean, county commissioners, 
uh, Caswell doesn't even have a, uh, a veteran service office. And one last thing before my eight seconds are up, um, there's people that come in there that um, try to tell them what to do um, as far as running their office. They have no, uh, they have no authority to do that. Uh, I, I went, went there and some guy was coming out and said, who's that? I think his name was Jackie Chan or something like that. He, uh, he was telling them what to do. And it, they don't need that. They don't need people from outside other organizations coming in and tell them what to do. But Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to come up here, sir. Glad to see you doing better. <laughs> and all y'all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yes, sir. Uh, just in case I don't get it done in three minutes, I brought uh, a written version. Uh, thank you, sir, for allowing me to speak in spite of my funny accent. Um, I'm, my name is Peter Morecambe. Thirty years ago, I used to live in Cabra, but in 2018, I moved here largely because the taxes are lower, <laughs> and that's obviously. Um, when setting up the River Mill Charter School in Saxborough in 1998, I was highly impressed by the way Alamance County government bent over backwards to fast track the permits and inspections needed to open the school on time. I'm even more impressed today, but it would take more than three minutes to explain why. So I'll move on to the real reason I'm here, which is mold. Um, every large organization is going to have problems from time to time, but Sadly, the Alamance Burlington school system has more than its share, fair share. Um, it is low performing and getting worse. Uh, it is losing students in spite of spending staggering amounts of money. Um, the mold issues were just the, the latest in a long string of surprises. Instead of fixing the mold issues, ABSS board members publicly announced that the problems resulted from insufficient funding and they did it on WBAG radio. As a taxpayer, I'm greatly distressed by such mendacity. It's just not true. Um, as a, over the last six years, the ABSS received 279 million in capital funding, and the operating funds have gone up and up and up and reached $12,000 per student in the current finan or the financial year that just finished. Um, now they want you to fork over more money. Please don't. Uh, it would be a huge mistake since rewarding failure and mismanagement guarantees that things will get worse. Here are two, two suggestions you might consider. The first amounts to contract maintenance. Give the money to a contractor who will take over responsibility of managing the school buildings. That seems that, that way, if you don't like what's happening, you can find an, somebody else who will take over the contract. The other solution, and the one I really like, is the New Orleans solution. Following Hurricane Katrina in 2005, there were 100 schools that were too badly damaged to open on time. So the New Orleans School District solicited bids from CMOs, that's charter management organizations, to come in, take over the school, take full responsibility, and run the schools that wouldn't open. And this saved the taxpayers huge amounts of money. But there was a, the real benefit was something else entirely. The, the schools started to perform much better. And the test scores and everything else went through the roof. And that's the document that I've attached to my. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll go three seconds. Um, unfortunately, the mold isn't the last surprise you're going to get. You're going to get another surprise before the end of this month. Thank you. Do we have extra copies? <coughs> what do you need extra one? Copies? Do you need I was going to hand so one to the press. Here, give me mine, and I'm just get another note. I, don't know, I think I, I think this, we got this in email, didn't we? I did. I, I have sent emails to some, and not to everybody. Next speaker is Susan Morris. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Susan Morris, a resident of Burlington, and I work in mom of three school-aged children. 
I stand before you today to address a matter utmost, of utmost importance in our community, the neglect of our schools and the choices made by these commissioners, past and present, to underfund our schools. Our educational institutions are the lifeblood of progress, the seedbed of innovation and the pathway to a brighter future. Yet recent decisions to reduce funding to our schools are jeopardizing these vital resources. When we defund schools, we rob our children of that opportunity and jeopardize their futures. It's a disservice to them and to our society as a whole. And looking at your mission and vision and your strategic plan for 2023, what is currently happening is not in line with any of that. So I implore you to consider our schools, our community, and our future when working through your strategic plan and always have your mission in place and our children the key at the, the um, start of that. Um, investing in education is an investment in our future workforce, leaders, and problem solvers. It's an investment in a society that values knowledge, critical thinking, and progress. But when we cut school budgets, we undermine the very principles we claim to uphold and the mission and vision set forth by this board or this commission. Without safe schools, quality teachers, student resources, and supplies, we are hurting our community. The consequences of cutting education funding ripple through our community. When schools suffer, property values can decline, businesses have a hard time hiring and retaining employees in an underfunded education system, and that all affects our local economies. I implore local business leaders to hold these commissioners accountable. Blood is on your hands. These children are not in school because of the decisions made by you. Um, um, arguing over teacher raises is not productive and is not the reason we are in this bind today. Teachers deserve every cent they make, if not more. And teachers are probably the only profession where they are expected to provide, to fund their own resources. They buy books, pencils, hit, uh, sanitizing wipes, Kleenexes. These are basic needs of a classroom and they're not provided for them. Um, teachers are, deserve every cent they are paid and more, so much more. And teach, um, education is an expense, but an, not an expense, but an investment in the betterment of our community and the promise, promise of a brighter tomorrow. Let's do a better job for this community and all these children. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask not only the speakers, but people, the general audience, and those listening uh, on Zoom or whatever, at the end of the meeting, county commissioners can and often do respond to your comments, but because of our procedure, we're unable to do that at this point. The next thing here, I cannot read. Excuse me, Barry Joyce. Oh, Barry, Barry, I can't read your hand on it. Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> coming down here, I don't know why. But <laughs> seems like y'all got so many problems, you can't see them get them worked out. Uh, you know, uh, in the joint meeting, you know, Amy gave me used the uh, Union County as an example of a good system. And one thing that she left out was that in their budget, Union County budgets, 45% of their budget goes to education, 47% of their budget goes to education. 16% goes to public safety, okay? 16%. In our county, it's almost equal for public safety. Now, I don't have anything against the sheriff, don't have anything against the sheriff's department, but we can't service the state of North Carolina out of a little county in Alamance County. We got 34% of the people in this county on food stamps. $35 million of food stamps were given out in this county. We can't afford training centers, diversion centers. We've, been, we've had a group of people watching this diversion center. There's never more than two or three cars at the most there. Ever. 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 I mean, this weekend, if you had a crisis, you had a real problem because there's only one car there the whole holiday weekend. So, you know, we can't afford the training center. I don't have a problem with the training center, but we can't train people for the whole state of North Carolina. Plus, these people that are coming in here to take training, they've already been sponsored by another law enforcement agency. They've already been hired by another law enforcement agency. So they're coming here, they're pay the law enforcement agency is going to work for it, is paying their tuition, 
and paying them to come to take the classes. We can't provide training for the state of North Carolina. We just can't do it. And this is millions and millions of dollars that you guys keep spending on things, the veterans thing. I'm a veteran. We don't need five people, or we may need five people, but we can't service all of North Carolina for veterans. Union County has 270,000 people. They got four people, okay? And when somebody comes from another county, they send them back to that county. And they tell them, you know, hey, you need to go back to the county and let them provide your veteran service. And I'm a veteran. That doesn't bother me a bit. But out of their four people, guess what? Four of them are veterans that work there. And the other one is the spouse of a veteran. We have got to quit trying to be the starlight in the sky in a little county that's very not very prosperous at all. And we just keep on trying to do this with a little bit of money, and it's going to eventually come back to haunt you. I mean, their fund balance is 9%. Ours is 20-something percent. And the only reason it's 20-something percent is because you stuffed it with COVID money. I don't know what the real fund balance is. You know, but I won't come out and say, but you said the last two big deposits were made by COVID money. So, you know, what happens? We got a $20 million problem right here, right now. You can't just give them the money for the mold. You got to have the money to do the work to fix the mold. So, okay. But anyway, I mean, that's just a lot to think about right there. I mean, we got to start thinking about Alamance County and get out of doing all these things for the state of North Carolina. Thank you, Mary. Jessica Norris. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hello, my name is Jessica Norman. I am a uh, Burlington resident. Um, before I get started, I want to say that I will have to leave the meeting early to pick up my youngest child from preschool. So unfortunately, I will most likely miss the commissioner's uh, response comments, but I will be re-watching the meeting on YouTube if it's available, or ask friends who are also here um, to give me the answers to my question if it's made, if it's made available today. Um, in the joint meeting on Monday, August 28th, school board member Chuck Marsh brought up Alamance County's budget investing percentage in education. I'm quoting these numbers that he gave from the meeting. Alamance County invests 16.9%, Orange County, 36.8%, Chatham County, 34.3%, Guilford County, 45.6%, Durham County, 26.6%, Wake County, 49.3%. County Commissioner Lashley then said he would need to ask the finance lady what the exact number is, but that he was confident the percentage is more around the 33% mark. The topic never came up again during any of the meetings, so I'm requesting the actual apples to apples comparison for percentage of the budget to see how Alamance County stacks up in our prioritizing and investing in our children. I anticipate this number will give insight as to how we find ourselves here in this moment. Next, I would like to thank Commissioner Thompson for always staying on topic and representing the children and parents of this county throughout the many hours of meetings last week. I really, truly appreciate it, and I know a lot of other parents do also. Next, while in the middle of this emergency, where parents are panicking over finding childcare and then paying for it unexpectedly, children are going to bed hungry, children are missing out on learning instruction and other services that is their right to receive. Teachers are being forced to use their precious PTO this week. Commissioner Lashley took time out of the meeting on Friday to congratulate himself and Commissioner Turner for literally doing their job and funding seven of the top 10 priorities of the school board at a time. A leader, a good leader, never congratulates themselves on doing the bare minimum. What I hope all the leaders of Alamance County will do once we get through this crisis is ask yourselves what you can do differently moving forward to ensure the citizens you represent never have to deal with anything like this again. Going back to my original question about the percentage of the budget that is invested in education, committing to raising that number would be an obvious first step. Thank you. Thank you. Again, as, she, as Ms. Bloomer just pointed out, these are taped, they're uh, broadcast live, and you can go back and retrieve them and see them again later at any time. 
Thank you. Henry Vines. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Henry Mines, and I'm here today uh, to talk about several issues that's on my mind. First of all, uh, I want to talk about the uh, Meridian deal. Due to all the light that was brought up forward in the last meeting, it's quite evident that the uh, traffic study is not really accurate because they can bring up as many trucks as they want to in a day's time from from five to up to 50 or 150 because the maximum of 600 tons a day is not the day, it's the year. So they can bring in 750,000 tons, it don't make no difference. That community is going to be devastated with the amount of trucks that's going to start coming in to that community. Secondly, y'all have approved the first reading of a new franchise. I don't understand how you can approve a new franchise when the sale just occurred the same day. But on top of that, if this is a new franchise, why are they not having to apply and comply with the HIDO rules? As Mr. Pike got up here and uh, he's having to apply and comply with all the rules and regulations that are there. Uh, a lot of these rules and regulations that the current uh, landfill does not have. I know safety tanks and, and, and toilets and handicapped parking and the whole perimeter of the uh, area fenced in, plus trees planted all the way around it. If we're going to allow this to happen, then they ought to have to comply with our current HIDO. And in that HIDO too, there's also restrictions of amount of times that you can run trucks into the, to these types of facilities. So I wish that when y'all look at this, that Jesus would consider these things before you approve the second read. Secondly, I would like to talk about the, the mold issues and stuff that's, that's currently going on. Uh, folks, we're going to have to fund this thing somehow or another. And quite frankly, that core sense sales tax is looking mighty nice. Each one of you can uh, come together and y'all send a resolution to our delegation and get this core cent sales tax put on so that this could help fund this need that we're going to have. We're going to have. That's about seven to eight million dollars a year. Not only the taxpayers here in the county going to pay, the people that come in and, and uh, use our malls and everything else can pay. And I, I think this is this is time that we need to do this. Also, to people to say that this county commissioners don't fund uh, the schools is completely wrong. We, the taxpayers, fund the schools. We approved a $150 million bond, an eight cent tax increase on property taxes. So it's wrong, commissioners, I'm sorry, uh, my time's run out, but it's wrong to sit and say that we don't support the school system. We do. It's county as County taxpayers. Thank you very much. I won't guarantee, but I almost guarantee there will be comments with county commissioners as to several of these topics. Hang on to your seat. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have the consent agenda. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, can I just ask a question? It's about the consent agenda. How will the surplus vehicles best be donated by the sheriff's office? Are they going to be replaced with new ones? Most of them already have. Okay. Okay. Oh. Um, and I would make a request as well. The numbers that we presented, all the uh, 11, whatever it is, vehicles, um, did not give us mileage. Mr. Sheriff, I would ask that you include mileage in your presentation in the future. Thank you. 
you will find that this all of them are over the mileage that Heidi presented. <laughs> okay. I have a suspicion. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to item number 6A. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Lindsay Ray. I'm the clerk for Chatham County, but I'm also the president of the North Carolina Association of County Clerks. And can we ask Tori to come join you? Come on, Tori. <laughs> we want to stare at you. <laughs> so when I was sworn in um, back in the spring, I announced I had a presidential initiative to go to all 100 counties to meet every clerk, hopefully their managers and their chair, um, to be an ambassador of our association, but also to help to continue to elevate our profession. Um, you have the best of the best in Tori. Um, I appreciate you supporting her um, participating in our association. I appreciate you supporting her in the International Institute of Municipal Clerks Association. Um, as you know, Tori is the Region 3 Director for IIMC, the first county clerk to ever hold that office. So we are incredibly proud of her. Um, and she is continuing to elevate our profession every day. Um, I want to say to the, um, the residents here, there's not, as a clerk, there's nothing I love more than to see a full chamber. Um, sometimes people say, oh no, that, that means it's gonna be a long meeting. But to me, it shows you have very engaged residents. So um, that, for me, that's something that's exciting to see. Um, I also wanna say that we are not secretaries, we are professionals. And we do so many things that you never see, but we do them because we love the work and we have hearts for service. Um, and so I just really appreciate your support. The dues that you pay for Tory go for scholarships. For a lot of those clerks that don't have the financial ability to attend our conferences and educational trainings. So thank you for helping to support those, those folks. And I also have a little gift for each of you. Never have enough sanitizer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh huh. And would you tell us what's on the sticker? So we um, actually had a rebranding of our logo last year. It was a, a long process, but we're really happy with the outcome. <laughs> there was a lot of discussion about that quill on the book because we don't write minutes anymore. We type them. We don't do a whole lot of handwriting of anything, but we decided it was important to still stay in line with other clerks associations and the International Institute does have a quill. Um, but we are the record keepers of the present, past, and future. So. Um, we are essential. <laughs> the general statute 153A says you must, you shall appoint a clerk. It does not say you may, you shall. So um, we, we just really enjoy our work. We're, um, we're thankful to have support of our county commissioners and county staff. So thank you for letting me come today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ray and Tori. We always thank you both. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. And thank you for coming from Chatham County. Yes, sir. Thank you. It sounds like the record's home. Yeah, no, the, the record <laughs> needs to be reset. <laughs> we're, we're working on it. Okay, next is the Meridian. And Mr. Bryan, do you want to come forward? Okay. And Mr. Stevens. Good morning. You? present this item. Yes, good morning board. Um, so we're here today for a second vote on the franchise ordinance that was proposed last time. There's been no changes to the ordinance, no changes to the proposed agreement, but per the statute we have to have two separate votes to enact a franchise and that's what we're here to do today. So I'll let Ms. O'Brien present any materials she might have. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. As mentioned by Mr. Stevens, nothing has changed from two weeks ago, the ordinance that you passed at that time. We uh, respectfully ask for your support of the second reading, and I am available along with our Vice President of Operations, Charlie Gray, as well as Michael Stubbs, our professional engineer, if you have any additional questions. Mr. Turner, do you have questions? I have two lines of inquiry for Mr. Uh, Stevens. The first is, um, what can 
Mr. Coble slash Meridian do by way of right under the existing franchise agreement uh, in terms of the tons per day? Is that at 600? That's at 600 per day, correct. Um, and that's what's in the new franchise request? Yes. The, as I understand it, the current franchise agreement has a 25 mile limitation for where trash can, can uh, a radius around the landfill, 25 miles where trash can come into. That's land. correct, from any party. And we're talking about um, C&D landfill? That's correct. What is that? That is construction and demolition debris. So it's things like wood, shingles, um, brick, concrete block, anything that comes from destroying a building. Okay, so we're not talking about trash from people's homes and, and food and that kind of stuff. Correct. Um, so there's 25 miles, but then can you talk to me about this exception that exists in the current franchise and what that is for the for the uh, the 25 additional uh, customers that they can use, that yes. they can allow into the landfill? Yes, yeah, so there exists a, a list of customers that are, are exempted from the 25-mile restriction in the current franchise. And, and the people that are on that list are subject to change at the whim of the operator. They don't have to be approved by the county, but there's a list of people that can fall anywhere outside that 25 miles, presumably anywhere they could truck things in from um, without limitation. Including out of state? Correct. Um, all right. The current franchise creates some limitation in terms of where the, the C&D trash can come from, 26 counties, is that right? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. Does it have any grandfather clause in it? It does not. And was it? Uh, let me, Mr. Turner, yeah. let me, just for clarification, we understand, <laughs> but I would uh, request that you use, use the term the existing COBOL contract or the new Meridian contract to distinguish between the two. I can do that. I chose not to do that because, um, by way of right, Mr. Coble could allow Meridian to operate the Coble franchise uh, as a as an operator. Could I, not. I believe that's correct. I, so let me say that the existing franchise that exists between the county and Cobles is uh, is silent as to the ability to transfer the franchise, but there is a portion of that that speaks to transfer of ownership to a quote new operator so it seems um, illogical to think that there wasn't the intent to allow a transfer of the franchise as well and that franchise's terms include the 25 mile limitation and the grandfathered list if you want to call it that and the second thing is um, it, mr mr vines talked about the hydro application because this if we were to approve a new franchise does does that sort of reset the conditions so that the new HIDO would cover operations at that property. Well, rather than paraphrase, um, I will just go ahead and read from the existing HIDO Article 5, Section 5. An intent to construct or non-conformance permit issued by any for any use of land regulated by this ordinance runs with the land and may be transferred with the property provided that all operational permits are maintained as required. What does it mean runs with the land? So to me, it runs with the land, and if, if the land is sold, the new operator gains the ability to keep the existing HIDO permit rather than apply for a new one. Um, did the HIDO exist when um, Mr. Coble began operating at the landfill? It did not. Is there anything we can do about that now? I don't believe there's anything we can do about that. Uh, well, we do uh, exist these pre-existing uses in the HIDO, but under the regulations that are here, the permit changes with the land ownership. So we do address it, but we don't require them to go through the process because of the way this is drafted. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Anything else? Mr. Carter. Okay. Did, did I understand what you just said and mean that if we approve the new franchise, then under the new franchise, they will have to comply with the HIDO? No. They, they will have to comply with HIDO, but they get to take on the, the permit that presently exists in favor of COBOL rather than having to apply for a new permit. So what does that mean? Well, it means that any of the regulations in HIDO that apply to, quote, non-conforming uses, and non-conforming means that the franchise in question pre-existed the HIDO itself. Right. Anything that applies to a non-conforming use would apply to Meridian as the new operator with the HIDO permit that gets transferred. Do you want to 
to make sure everybody understood that. Yeah. Anything else? Um, motion. Yeah, restrictions on trucks in the hideout. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not. I'll take a minute to research that. What's your question, sir? Are there are there or what are the restrictions on trucks in the hideout? Okay. I'll do that research. Are there any other questions? That's it. Okay. Mr. Thompson. No. Mr. Lashley. No, sir. Thank you. My question to Mr. Stevens would be, since the COBOL contract predates the our current hideo, then they are they Meridian under the new or the old COBOL contract would basically predate our current hideo. Is that correct? That's correct. Additionally, as I recall from the COBOL contract and the new Meridian contract, I don't think there is any restriction under those two contracts or the HIDO, HIDO as to number of trucks. Um, so I will say in the contract that we are going to be approving as part of the new ordinance, there is a requirement for a state mandated traffic study and that they follow the recommendations that are given as a part of that. In HIDO, it talks about traffic impact analysis. And in that, it says that a traffic study has to be done and the regulated industry shall add projected daily vehicle trips to the most recent traffic counts. And there has to be efforts of mitigating the impact of proposed traffic. I'm not sure that those would necessarily apply under HIDO to a grandfathered or pre-existing use, but at the same time, I don't see a limitation on daily vehicle trips other than that which is proposed by the traffic study that's done as a part of HIDO. And again, we have a traffic impact analysis that was performed and was required to be performed as a part of our franchise. So the study has been completed and we have received it? To my knowledge, yes. I got a copy. <laughs> well, I, I, I say that because I believe that to be the final version, but I can't speak to that. I understand. Um, so basically, and there were some, in my opinion, dramatically shortfalls in the an original COBOL contract, such as bondage and coverage of protection for the county. Is that true? Is that correct? Um, in my opinion, yes. There were some, some things that I would make sure were in a contract were not in the contract. Um, I gave one example a minute ago. So I think that it should be clear that if there's an assumption of the business, then there's a right to assume the franchise ordinance. The new agreement does have such a clause. Right. The new contract corrects those failures of the initial original COBOL contract. In my opinion, yes. Thank you. Any other board member have anything? We have the motion before us. Do we need a uh, motion, formal motion and second again? I believe so. All right, then I make the motion. Second. We have a motion, second. Any other comments? I'll just say this, Mr. Chairman. The reason I voted for it last time and the reason I'll vote for it this time is that the the 25 customer grandfather clause in your, in your existing COBOL agreement allows, by way of right, the current operator and a new operator uh, to bring in C&D landfill and trash from anywhere, Virginia, South Carolina, any county in the state. Um, it, it, is, it is an exception that is big enough to swallow the rule of the 25 miles. Um, and it's something that we inherited. It's something that's, 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 um, that's been in existence for a number of years. Um, so for that reason, I think the current, I'm sorry, the, the new franchise is a better option in that it provides more restriction than we currently have. And it also um, maintains the same number of tons per day that the existing franchise would allow. And it also provides uh, insurance covered by um, the company operating in, in much greater numbers than we currently have insurance for, that if something were to go wrong, we can fall back on the insurance and not on the county, which is what we'd have to do under the current franchise. 
for those reasons, I don't like having to do it, but I think it's a better option than we have now. I intend to vote for it. And I agree with what uh, Commissioner but, Turner just said. May I reply? Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Turner, I completely agree that when we talked about this, this existing agreement is stronger than what COBOL currently has. I think inadvertently in the last meeting, we actually showed, I was actually arguing something about the, what the money that the county was going to take. And during that discussion, I think everybody realized that Meridian's going to bring in more than 600 tons a day in a five and a half day span. And the reason I say that, if you take the seven days that they ha they're only going to be open five and a half days, so it's a day and a half that they're not going to be, be closed. That percentage, that tonnage will be made up through the five and a half days before. So my contention is, is that there will be more than 600 tons a day coming into the landfill. I don't think anyone can argue that now, that we know that 600 tons a day based on 365 days of the year, but if you take a one third of your, your week and it's taken care of for the other five and a half days. All my contention is is that there is going to be more trucks than we think, and I also think that we're going to have more tonnage coming in on a per day basis, mon uh, Monday through Saturday at lunchtime. I think you're just going to have more tonnage coming in, which I think is a little bit discouraging because m my interpretation of it was 600 tons a day. Like most folks I've talked to in the community, they looked at it 600 tons a day, and that's how I cut 187,000 is because I was using 600 tons a day for five and a half days. And I think inadvertently we realized that there's going to be more than more trucks than we actually have the old folks are going to come through there. But that's my only contention. But thank you. Thank you. I, John. My understanding is that the existing COBOL contract allows 600 tons of and I think, and Ms. Stevens, correct me if I'm incorrect, yeah, they could do the same thing that Mr. Lashley's talking about. Um, I don't see any, I see gains with the new contract and losses if we maintain the existing contract. I'm sorry, Mr. No, Lashley. that's okay. Um, contracts. All this stuff is, is really good, and I appreciate that. It seems like a better deal, but the issue to me is still the over-traffic in the neighborhood. I'm trying to get a traffic light out near Southeast High School before there's an accident. So um, we're just, like I said in the last meeting, we're lucky to be working with such good people, but uh, I'm just on the side of the neighbors. That's all. Any other comments? Motion and a second has already been made. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, all opposed? No. So it's three to two, it passes. Thank you. Would indicate that um, <coughs> there are a number of people from Madison County as to this matter that are present as well. Uh, that's somewhat in apologizing to the school system who wanted to be moved up and we were unable to do that because of the lateness of the request. Uh -huh. Okay. Next item, resolution as to the ACC board. Ms. Evans? Yes, good morning, commissioners. I bring before you this morning um, a reimbursement resolution, and I'd like to go ahead and introduce it. Resolution of the Board of Commissioners for the County of Alamance, North Carolina, declaring its intention to reimburse said county from the proceeds of one or more tax-exempt financings for certain capital expenditures. This is the first um, logistical resolution that will be brought before this board. What it's basically doing is setting a reimbursement resolution for the county for when we issue the bonds in October for the Public Safety Training Center as well as the remainder of the, of the main PAL-G project for ACC. What this resolution does is it sets the not to exceed $18.9 million. That is preliminary. This board still has the opportunity to set the amount of bonds that we will issue and we'll be bringing that to you at our next meeting. And this is part of the 2018 bond that was passed by the citizens of Alamance County. That's correct, yes sir. Right. So it doesn't take anything away from anybody else. No sir. Or no, no other department or school system or anybody else. That's correct. Thank you. 
Any discussion? Quickly, I don't understand why, where, where the reimbursement is coming from. I mean, the money doesn't exist yet. If the bonds are issued, then the bonds get sent to ACC and their building fund for the projects. Who's getting reimbursed? So where this is coming from is if there are any preliminary costs that ACC will have to go ahead and initiate before those bonds are sold. When the bonds are sold, those proceeds come and reside with the county. Um, what we are saying is that the county would upfront those funds and then we would reimburse ourselves first and then as ACC spends those proceeds, they would submit it to the county for reimbursement. Would the county have an opportunity to decide what, uh, what funds to, to front and what amount to front before those decisions are made? Um, you would. Um, basically what we've done in the past is we've used capital reserves and then once the proceeds are in hand, then I do a transfer right back to the capital reserves for the amount that we've spent. Okay. Question, Susan. Um, yes, ma'am. Is this, I know um, when Dr. Gatewood was here, he had let us come in and come in here and talked about well, just the rising cost of everything mm -hmm. and how much this was different. And they were what, like about a shortfall of five or six million? Yes. What has happened with that? Because I know the amount that's been set for this, is that any different? They were going on a massive fundraising campaign. I mean, we were talking about doorknobs, how he was getting lowered from right. doorknobs. What's the deal with that? So if you'll remember, Dr. King came at the last meeting and made a presentation, and I believe right. he is here with us today, uh, made a presentation on where they stand, mm -hmm. and he wants to come back at the next meeting and discuss that in detail of where we stand with our funding and exactly how much they would be asking for in bonds. And he's with us here this morning. And Dr. King, if you want to come forward, you are certainly welcome to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, you're exactly right. I'll, I'll admit I was uh, sitting back there with your remarks and chuckling a little bit because I just lived this uh, in another community in terms of the inflation rate that has just hampered all of us, regardless of whether we're private or public. Uh, and the longer the delay, the more difficult it becomes. And I read an article not long ago from a trusted uh, group of people saying uh, we may not have seen anything yet. And so I think the longer we delay on, on uh, accomplishing these things, the more difficult it's going to become. And uh, quite frankly, we will have a guaranteed price, uh, you know, at our, our next meeting, as you had uh, suggested. Uh, but every additional day that we delay, uh, more uh, happens. It gets more expensive. And it's not just expense. Sometimes you just can't get the product. Uh, one of the projects that I alluded to earlier they are still waiting for a major electrical switch, and it's been over a year. So uh, that is unfortunately the supply chain that we're dealing with today. And so any uh, delay in doing the things that we need to do just hampers us that much longer in terms of serving the needs for safety and security of this community and others uh, in the region as well. So it's just a very, very important thing to do, and, and I'd be glad to respond to any questions you might have. I know in the school system when we were adding a building, we had to have a $2.5 million extra for steel, like That's when right. it comes to stuff like that. I remember all the boats out there in the Pacific Ocean waiting to, it was a nightmare. Leadership is everything. And, is. Um, we, and it comes down, it comes down to the last person on the list and, and you sitting around waiting. It's, it's amazing. Well, and I think it not only uh, comes down to the last person on the list, I think it's very accurate. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, Sometimes the respect yeah. of the organizations that are doing this kind of work is hampered. If you can't pay on time and pay the amounts and so forth and so on that we need, uh, you truly have uh, before you a real opportunity to make a huge difference, not only in Alamance County, uh, but throughout the area, which, uh, you know, if there's a major event that happens or whatever it might be, you're going to have people from different counties coming in to provide assistance and so forth. And that's the way we are as Americans. That's the way we, we've always done things. And I would presume we'll continue to do that. So I think the value and the benefit of what you're considering here, uh, per your comment earlier, uh, and getting on with the movement and trying to save as much, because there's no, there's no doubt that next year we're going to be talking about a lot more than what we're talking about right now. Well, we watched Baby Formula 
I never thought I'd see America something that we don't even think about, but when you don't have it, it's, it's life-threatening, literally. That's so right. we, that's another leadership thing. It's, um, it's kind of just flattened all of us, and I hope we've all learned from that. I would agree with you 100%. Uh, you give me a good thing as I'm out speaking. Uh, Dr. Gatewood was talking about doorknobs. I'm going to borrow that if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, but those things, I mean, they, they sound as if they're, 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 they're inconsequential, but the truth is they're very consequential as time goes by in terms of doing the things that uh, our citizens want to be proud of, that we want to be proud of, and at the same time to provide the services that we're, to which we're committed. Mr. Chair, I'm glad to respond to any questions you might have. Mr. Lashley, I'll call on you second since Ms. Thompson. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Chair first. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for coming this morning. Yes, sir. I'm just going to let you know the things that I've been hearing in this community. This bond was passed in 2018. It is quite evident to everyone who pays attention that ACC didn't have their ducks in the row, that you folks weren't ready to go when this money came down. As a matter of fact, the bond was passed in the fall of 18. The bond market didn't get, we didn't go to the bond market until April of 2021. Even then, we couldn't go to the bond market. When, sir, I'm just going to tell you this. The, my, my friends in the bond market have told us that by the grace of God, when we entered the bond market, we entered it at the most perfect time. The low of the bond market, the 20-year municipal bond market, was made in May of 2021. So all I'm content, all, I, all I'm actually saying is, is if the ACC would have been ready to go with the projects that they told the community they were ready to go, do you realize, sir, how much money you would have saved the taxpayers? Now, just to, just to let you know, the bonds that we got in 2021, 1.43%. And everything that we had gotten, they thought it was going to be around 4%. I know some commissioners at the time said it could be as high as four and a half percent. So in essence, we basically got this bond at one third of what we thought it was going to cost. Now fast forward three and a, uh, two and a half years. The bond market right now for the things that you're going to go get is over five percent. See the difference? And the reason I'm even bringing this up is because people have brought it up to me. The question is, why wasn't ACC ready to go when the bond was passed? Why wasn't ACC ready to go with the project that they told the community that they were going to be ready for? Those are valid and logical questions when you look at the, what we're about to do. And the only saving grace here, it's, it's only $19 million. It's not, a, not $100 million because that, that payment would be astronomical. So I just wanted to let you know that the community is asking this question. And as we've seen supply chains and, and inflation start to ramp up, it's going to affect anything that you are going to do at ACC just based solely on what kind of work you're going to do. You're building buildings, and everything in the building space has increased. So I just wanted to let you know that the community is asking that question, uh, why the delay? And I think that's a valid question. So. Commissioner Lashley, I will tell you that when I discovered what you just described, uh, I was concerned as well. I still am. Uh, I have a tendency, I have a penchant for action uh, when we have a clearly defined goal and clearly defined opportunity. And so that's why I've been pushing so hard uh, since I've been here uh, to try to get this thing accomplished in the, uh, to the degree that you're talking about and in many respects for many of the purposes that you just described. I think the longer we delay, the more difficult it's going to be, and I don't know what the bond market is going to do next year or the following year or the following year. I do know one thing, though, the longer we delay to make a good decision, the more difficult it is going to be uh, to explain to the citizenry uh, of our county uh, and our state, uh, but especially the county, I mean, that's, that's the one who's doing all this. Uh, the truth of the matter is, the longer we delay, the more difficult that explanation is going to be. Uh, I will simply tell you there are sometimes things that are outside our control. Uh, I do know that in the um, admin, uh, Department of Administration, our, our friends uh, over in the uh, um, State Office of Construction have been working nonstop. Uh, Shorthanded retirements taking place that have impacted everything in the state, to my knowledge. Uh, and certainly I think it had an impact on what we could do as well and the speed with which we could do it. Um, if I were to look back and, and if I were able to 
modify what you described in terms of our ability, it would have been much, much quicker. It would have been more uh, 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 anticipating more of getting things done today as opposed to having to play the games that we had to play. But that's that's where we are today. My encouragement to you and the citizens of Alamance County, I think those are fair questions, but at the same time, I think the question is, what is the price of our security? What is the price of our safety? What's the price of the assurance that our citizenry is uh, not only protected by, but given the environment in which they can do business and, and uh, raise their families and uh, do the work that we uh, want done collectively uh, for the good citizens of Alamance County. So that's the only way I know how to respond to your question. Uh, I know it wouldn't suffice to say I wasn't here, uh, but by the same token, uh, I, I, I do applaud uh, the people of Alamance County for uh, holding everybody accountable, and that includes us, uh, to be accountable. I will assure you of this, however. You go ahead and provide these resources to get the work done. Uh, we will be expeditious in our process. There will be no more delays and we will work with those that uh, we work with on an aggressive basis, not assertive, but aggressive, uh, to get this done in the way that it should be done and in the time frame that we, we commit to. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anything else? Yes, sir. Mr. Turner. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Uh, no questions. No comments. I've been we like to point out that uh, by waiting to 2021, we saved the county taxpayers thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, as Mr. Lashley pointed out. We're going to unfortunately make up for it when we go for these next almost $19 million. Uh, but ACC really helped us out by picking that, and I'm sure you intentionally picked that May a 2021 day, as I, I wink and say it. <laughs> I know Dr. Gateman probably did. I mean, I mean uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a master tactician. But, um, uh, you know, and, and I applaud everybody that's been involved in that, to include these commissioners. Uh, you know, all of you are engaged in this process, and it's so important. Uh, I know one thing. I know the sheriff, uh, the police departments, and others in our municipalities are ready to move forward. We are absolutely ready to move forward, and uh, we are eliminating delays internally to get us to the point that we all want to be. Mr. Chairman, I, I, yes. I overlooked a couple of my notes, and I do have a couple of comments to make. Uh, Dr. King, there was a comment made earlier concerning the, uh, the, uh, the Public Safety Training Center and um, not needing it to train our local law enforcement. Uh, and there was also a comment made about the cost versus benefit to the county. Uh, we've looked at this issue in the past and we've been dealing with this going as it's come forward, looking at the economic benefit to the training center, one, and the growth in our law enforcement training, number two. Could you address those issues with what BLAT is doing and what we're hearing as an anticipated growth in that? class and what benefit it might create for the county. Yes, sir, I will tell you this. Um, everybody that I've spoken to, to include my fellow presidents, uh, are looking with great anticipation at uh, what we are looking at. And to be frank with you, some of them have some worry uh, because they know the quality we already have in our BLET program. Of the 58 community colleges uh, that we have throughout the, the state, I think I shared with you that we now uh, have the largest uh, of all of those, and it's not just large, the quality associated with what they're doing over there is <coughs> I think secondly, the potential to grow our fire rescue uh, folks as well uh, to larger sizes than we have currently, I think is also on the agenda uh, and a far more uh, effective and efficient uh, method with the uh, facilities that we're talking about. So I think what that really means to me is that we have a lot of people looking favorable uh, at us. And I think many people in the county as well, from what I've been shared, what's been shared with me, as uh, I've been here. Uh, and quite frankly, it gives you another pool from which to recruit. Uh, there are those, in fact, that I would presume that from, who would come from other places that are, in fact, sponsored. Uh, but at the same time, when people have an opportunity to come and experience this community and these communities in Alamance County, you're going to have some of those people decide, I like it here. 
and that will help the sheriff, that will help the police departments, it will help the fire departments because you, uh, again, you combine that with the recruitment activities and so forth that you have, and quite frankly, it gives you another source of uh, folk uh, from which uh, to recruit to maintain stability in your own systems. And I think that's a powerful thing, especially with the difficulties that, uh, you know, organizations in law enforcement and in fire rescue are facing these days, and especially in the volunteer fire departments. I mean, they are really struggling. And so where you have, uh, you know, a state-of-the-art facility, it covers not only the metropolitan areas, but at the same time it covers the rural areas that are dependent on those uh, volunteer fire departments. And so I think you have the foundation, the infrastructure, and the expertise to do something really special uh, for uh, Alamance County and our citizens. I think when it comes to law enforcement, uh, what happens, and I, 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 I honestly, I hate to say this, uh, because I'm comparing two different things. I mean, I'm, I'm doing the proverbial uh, Mr. Thompson comparing an apple to an orange. My apologies for that. But we ran a, a um, uh, when I was in Fayetteville, in Cumberland County, we ran a statistical review and a study on what kind of potential economic impact that would it have on that particular county. And uh, quite frankly, the numbers that we came back with, and, and it was done not by our own people, by, but by a dispassionate third party, it was almost $2 million of uh, revenue coming back to the county, that, uh, and that's per year, uh, that came back to the county as a result of the activities that we had. And that was counting not only people that were coming in the local region, but other people in the state who would come in and buy gas and spend money on food and hotels and things like that. Uh, that they have to do if they're going to take advantage of the required training that is also already there. And then in addition to that, the potential for people coming out of Virginia and South Carolina and so forth, and what that would bring to your communities, I think is just as important as well. So when you do this, you're not just doing it for a local, small, defined number of people. You're really doing it to be far more effective in terms of what you can do and thus who you can help sell on your community and therefore gain people that helps the sheriff fill his ranks, helps the police departments fill their ranks, and certainly the fire departments throughout the city so, and, and the county. Uh, that'd be the best way I could respond to your question, sir. Thank you. And you know, back in during our budget process, one of the things we heard consistently across the county from just about, as best I can recall, every single volunteer fire department is short on staff, short on volunteers, people to, vol people to be trained, prepared to serve in those roles. We need to be better able to try and provide that service. And the college is outgrowing the existing space. I mean, I'm uh, talking about classroom space right now is at a premium. I was coming to one of these meetings the other day, uh, Mr. Commissioner, and I rode by the Dillingham Center, and I've been lost a number of times in your county already, uh, and uh, so this was one of those times I was probably lost. But I went by the Dillingham Center, and we've got one room there that, uh, you know, is a classroom with broken chairs, broken tables, that frankly they scrounged from other places to, to make that classroom. And when I went by that, I looked on the outside of that building, and all those students, there were about 8, 15 to 20 of them or so forth, they were out there doing something. I think they just come from a run or something, and I was glad I wasn't with them. Uh, it was about 100 degrees outside, it appeared. But I thought about it as I went by and saw those young people out there that have an interest in exactly what you're talking about. And we need to ramp up our uh, process as well at the college, and we are going to do that. We're already, we're already working on plans to do that. At the same time, the fire departments, the police departments, the sheriff's department, and other uh, law enforcement agencies in this area, we will, we're going to work with them to do the same thing to attract more people to this county so that you can, instead of wondering about where those those helpers are, those those fire people uh, are, I used to say firemen, I'm changing my, my vernacular now, but the truth of the matter is getting people that come in who have a dedication and a devotion to what they do to protect and serve 
that's what we're all about. And we are just as tightly aligned with you as county commissioners and with our brothers and sisters in the fire and the, uh, the law enforcement communities, and that's what we commit to. I think it's going to be beneficial to you. I think it will put you far beyond where you are currently when you're able to accommodate the needs of all those different organizations. And our request is simply, Mr. Lashley, getting you to that point much, much quicker than what we might otherwise do. I'll be honest with you, I'll tell you of an internal meeting we had. Uh, somebody, people said, well, let's change the fire tower, the dirty burn tower. Let's change that and put that at the, at the, at the site. Well, we've got two problems. We've got, first of all, a lack of water. Uh, and secondly, a way to, even if we could get water, a way to get it to that site, so if, therefore it wouldn't be certified. And uh, besides, when we, if we were to change what we, you, we've already approved, that would add another year to two years to the process, to your very point. That's why we're trying to move expeditiously on this as we can. I'd like to point out and thank you. You didn't start out with, you did not start out with, I was not here. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Um, additionally, we did not have all the contracts and so forth for this uh, safety center that we currently do have in place. And so I'm not sure that we really could have done what should have been done in 2018 or whatever without the contracts and the information that we needed. I'm not trying to defend Dr. Gatewood, but uh, that I think those are the facts. They are. And, and you know, I, it's, it's literally one of those things that, uh, you know, we, how can I say this without being thrown out of here, we stole one from you. Uh, Dr. Gatewood did, I didn't, uh, but I love working <laughs> with her. Uh, the truth of the matter is she is learning how complex, and she will be the first to tell you that, how complex community college systems are really higher education in North Carolina. That's not a condemnation, it's just a reality. And with that complexity comes things that sometimes make it a little more difficult to do the things that we all want to do more, more rapidly. So Mr. Chair, that's the way I would respond to you on that. And I know Dr. Gatewood very well, and, and he's, he's very attuned to what is, a, I wish I could do some of the things that he's done. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we're in a position now with your assistance and your, your guidance to really take it to where it needs to be and get this thing done uh, so that this commission uh, can be extraordinarily proud of, I think, the premier, it would be the premier system in North Carolina. Maybe not for fire. I just built that one. Uh, but, but close. Uh, and certainly in law enforcement, by all means, uh, you will lead the, uh, lead the charge and yet you will uh, adequately meet the needs of fire in your community. Mr. Chairman, I had one other question I had to ask. Yes, um, economic benefit. Can you inform the audience? I, I, I know we've heard this before, but just remind the audience of the different outside agencies that have already indicated an interest in providing students to our for our public safety training center, and what that potential impact can be in economic benefit to the county. Well, I certainly had a conversation with someone from Durham County, uh, uh, from Orange County, uh, from uh, someone who represents Caswell and uh, Person County, um, and Chatham County, and tomorrow uh, will be Randolph County, and, uh, and then uh, later this week, uh, uh, Guilford County. So I think the potential uh, for people coming in from the region is uh, extraordinarily uh, strong uh, and I think the fact once we promote this appropriately that you have a lot of people that come to this they are not sponsored they come of their own volition because they want to serve and protect in whatever capacity whether it's in law enforcement or it's in fire and rescue and they come to do that so uh, we've had a number of people already imply that they want to come there's one that I'm kind of getting outside my lane, uh, but one of the state agencies uh, has indicated that, uh, you know, uh, from what I understand, and this is not firsthand, but from what I've been told by others, uh, that uh, there may be interest in doing some, not just the initial DLET training, but at the same time, uh, some more advanced training uh, as a result of what we are able to create here. And that has implications with the SBI. It has implications with uh, other law enforcement agencies in the system, which when you really evaluate law enforcement agencies throughout the state, they come from many jurisdictions doing many different things. 
and quite frankly, it would uh, it would uh, I would be beaming if we were to have a relationship with the FBI and somebody like that and others uh, as we do things and Department of Homeland Security is not outside it is not outside the realm of possibility. So, uh, but it takes a facility. It takes uh, uh, dedicated and focused effort on the part of organizations such as ours at ACC, working in concert with law enforcement, fire and rescue, and others that may have an interest or a desire in doing the kind of work that we need to do. In some of these classes, too, as I understand it, you're going to have people that come here. They're going to be spending multiple nights in our local hotels and hotels, eating meals in our local restaurants, um, quite possibly shopping when they're here. Um, that's an economic benefit. Uh, here. Green Level has been has been very very concerned about the, the the amount of time it's taken us to get this up because they're looking for economic benefit in that part of our community. So it's much more than just training local law enforcement. It really is. I think it, it becomes a beacon uh, for a number of people to include all of those locally that may have an interest and a desire to protect and serve. You have a state-of-the-art place where they can come. We get more aggressive in terms of what we're doing from a promotional activity and concert with the uh, law enforcement, fire and rescue folks to include others uh, in this community. And then all of a sudden you have not only, uh, well, maybe not somebody as old as I am, but other adults that uh, are uh, interested in doing this kind of work. But at the same time, it's a grand opportunity for you to appeal to the younger generation out there as well, who I will promise you, I dealt with, I, I was in a class this morning, but just before I came over here this morning, you would have been proud who was sitting in that room, how sharp those young people were and how focused they were and how on top of things they were. So all that stuff that we hear about what a terrible generation it is, it's not the case at all. There are so many great kids out there waiting to grow and develop, and we just need to embrace them and take them to the right place. And that's within our finger, to, within our grasp, it's within our, our reach, it's within our fingertips to do so. So I would encourage Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Board of Commissioners, uh, please support us on this. And I'll promise you, uh, for at least the three, next three and a half, four months, uh, we're going to work like crazy to get the thing uh, going. And the only regret I have is on the uh, on the timeline, they don't start moving dirt until I leave. Uh, but I guarantee you it's supposed to be in January, and I'm going to haunt them if they don't start turning dirt in, in January. Mr. Chair, that's we're, my report. We'd point out the sheriff was consistently during your presentation given an affirmative nod. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I'm going to preach for him all day long if you'll just lend me his jacket. I love that jacket. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, it does. Mr. Chairman, call for question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other discussion? There being none, all in favor, please follow us saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No, no, we had, I don't think we had a motion. Well, I thought, I'm sorry. Ms. Evans, would you again repeat the motion? Absolutely, Commissioners. It would be a motion to approve the resolution of the Board of Commissioners for the County of Alamance, North Carolina, declaring its intention to reimburse said county from the proceeds of one or more tax exempt financing for certain capital expenditures. Motion to approve. Second. Just, motion second. Just one thing to say with all this building and all this greatness and all this, you're not going to have any of that if you don't have a teacher. So notice that's who creates the future, their teacher. And in whatever building we're in, that's who makes this all happen. Yes, ma'am. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Atkins. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my OCD is speaking and I have to square this up. All right. So I'm coming back. Last month, I came before you to address the concerns of Mr. Barry Joyce regarding the level of assessment relative between residential property, farms, commercial property. And I stand behind the statements that I made that day regarding that. I think that they're in proportion. We don't have a, a general over-assessment or under-assessment. Um, but as I said at the time, I'm sure if you look around, you'll find specific instances where something is high or something is low. 
one of the items that we talked about last month was the Lowe's Home Improvement in Burlington. And I stated to this board that the valuation at $8.5 was correct. And I used as evidence two sales, the higher of which was in line with our value at $65 per square foot. Well, after that meeting, Mr. Joyce contacted me, and he said, now, do you know that those sales are ground leases? Th those sales don't include the structure value. And I said, Mr. Joyce, I do not know that, but we'll look into it. Well, he is correct. Uh, those sales that were referenced uh, would give us the value of the land in those cases. And of course, our Lowe's has a structure sitting on it. So if we're in line with the land value, we are probably not at a true market value. I reached out to our vendor, Vincent Valuations. Uh, they've been assisting us with the revaluation. They did not place this value. This value was done by in-house staff. Uh, but I asked, can you please review this value with me? I want to know what is it worth really in the market. And I've become convinced through this process that it's probably worth about $125 a square foot, about $16.5 million, not $8.5 so we're at nearly 50% value. Now, of course, the question I immediately had is, well, how did we end up here? Why are we at $65 per square foot? And again, this is a value that we set in-house. So I talked to our commercial appraiser, and he said that his basis was not the market. Well, I can tell that. Uh, his basis was what's happening with other counties and in the appeals uh, boards. So Lowe's has an extremely effective appeal program. Uh, I've been watching this for the last 10 years. They, they've been uh, running the same argument across the state and across the country. Um, they have been extremely effective in bringing in uh, teams of attorneys and teams of commercial appraisers, and counties have thrown tens of thousands of dollars at appeal defense and come up with very little. Uh, one case that comes to mind is the Gaston case, where when they went down to, to Raleigh for the state board, uh, the state board basically determined that neither party has strong evidence and set it somewhere in between and set them at $61 a square foot. Now we're at 65 and the board set Gaston at 61 And so what we're seeing is that's kind of the predominant ruling coming down from these boards. Well, 10 years ago, counties were going to war. Right. They, they wanted to fight and they were throwing money at it. Uh, today, counties are tired and we're seeing kind of a, a, a new normal emerge. What our commercial appraiser did is he observed the results. He observed this is what the boards are doing, this is the new normal that's emerging, and he used that as his basis of value, not the market, but what other counties are doing in response to these boards, what these boards are ordering. Now. To, to make everything straightforward, you have an ABC structure here. So at A, the assessor should set the value per the market, and then at B, that property owner is free to appeal. And if they uh, win the appeals board, good for them, the board will set the value, and at C, we now have an active tax value, that's what we bill on. What we've effectively done is we've cut straight from A to C. We just cut out step B altogether. The assessor, has effectively looked at the, the lay of the land and instead of value per the market, we've taken a guess at what that board would do. We were guessing if you were to go to Raleigh, where would you end up? And that's that $65 a square foot. Now I think that's completely inappropriate. Um, I did not know that that was happening. If I knew that was happening, I would have prevented it. And this isn't to say that I'm not responsible for it. Because frankly, my responsibility is to know what is happening in my organization. I'm supposed to be aware of that and prevent it. So I take full responsibility for this having occurred. But I will say that I completely disagree with the assessor's office taking the role of the property tax commission and trying to guess what that board would come out with at the end of an appeal. We need to set it at market and let those boards do their job. Well, now here we are in this situation. Right? We, on the front end, I would have prevented it. We're not on the front end. We're on the back end. So what, what's the damage and what are the options? And the first thing that came to mind when I realized this is we've gotten other loads. So I looked at it and this is $65 a square foot. And of course, we've got an Office Depot, $65 a square foot. 
And I think to myself, oh my goodness, this is big box retail. Walmart is a big box retail. All three Walmarts, $65 a square foot. So I now begin to go through all of our records, and we believe we've isolated all of them. We have 10 big box re uh, retail. This includes Target, Belk, JCPenney, and Dillard. Can you all read that again, please, sir? Sure. Uh, this is the two Lowe's location, the Home Depot location, all three Walmart, Target, Belk, JCPenney, and Dillard's. Thank you. And these are the 10 properties that are affected. Only these 10 properties are affected. And I want to stress that. We're not looking at a systemic across the board problem with our commercial valuation. Again, as I said at the last meeting, we're up 60% in six years. We're, we're capturing value. But these 10, these big box retailers, they were treated consistently at 65 a square foot, which is the county assuming what an appeals board would do and just cutting to the chase and going right there. Uh, you have seven uh, individual companies represented in these 10 locations. Two of them are currently under appeal, uh, Belk and Dillard's. Now, one of the things that the county could do, this is an option, but I want to, to think through this process with you, is that this board has the power to say, Assessor, go correct that. And at that point, I would value these 10 properties per what we believe they're truly worth in the market, and they're not all worth 125 a square foot. The 65 a square foot is per that board and is flat. If you're looking at true market values, they're, they're going to vary. So I, I don't know at this moment the exact amount that that would be. Uh, the, the highest ones would probably be at 125, some would be lower. We could set those new values. We could notice those seven owners about those 10 properties. I guarantee you will get 10 out of 10 under appeal. On appeal, those seven companies will send their teams of lawyers and will send their teams of commercial appraisers. And if we want to mount a defense, we'll have to do the same. And I've talked with Attorney Stevens. There is absolutely no way that we can defend teams of lawyers coming out on these appeals with in-house staff. This would be a situation where we'd need to get outside support. I've talked with our vendor. There's no way we could defend teams of commercial appraisers coming in, multiple teams. Uh, we would have to get outside support. We just simply could not do that. So I, I don't know how much that would cost. It depends on how far we go. Um, I will say I've heard that Forsyth spent over $50,000 on Lowe's alone and didn't get anywhere. Forsyth County spent over 50000 on just Lowe's and didn't really get anywhere. So I, I don't know how much we would be involved if we really wanted to fight. <coughs> My theory is that the boards would eventually put us to somewhere near where we're at now. This is our best guess as to what happens post-appeal. And so I would think post-appeal we would come back to a very similar number. Right? It could be higher. It could be lower. I have no way of knowing. We could get a high enough value to cover all the legal expenses and be in the plus. We could be in the minus at the end of the day. I simply don't have a way to know that. That is an option. And I think that we would have to address all 10. I don't think we could cherry pick. Um, the other option is that we can say, well, we didn't get there by the right means. The assessor's office should not have presumed what a board would say. This is not the right way to get there, but we got there. And we got to a place that is supported by decisions we've seen from the PTC. We go with that for the next four years, and at revaluation, we do it differently. Uh, we, you know, we've, we've got a few options there. Are we out a lot of money if we do that? I don't think so, because I think what's going to happen is that we're going to get knocked right back down into a similar ballpark. We save the, the cost of um, defending these values, and we end up probably in a very similar place. So I don't know how to advise the board as far as what is the, the best course of action here, but that's sort of the, the fork in the road that, that we're seeing. Are there any questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a question to Mr. Stevens. Our bills went out, and I'm just going to pick a date, August 1st. On those <laughs> bills, I know from my law office and my home, it said, you know, this determination was made as of a date, and there basically aren't any appeals on that. Now, it says personal property, but I, as a homeowner and office building owner, assumed that it also meant 
real property, <clears throat> which may be an entirely false assumption. That's number one. Number two, now that we've built everybody already, can we go back and correct it? Because it was our era, not the taxpayer giving us false information. Two answers. Um, yes, I, I do think we can go back and we can look at the values again. So that's what's called discovery. Um, and specifically in the Machinery Act that we've talked about so far today, discovered property includes property that was listed, but the listing included a substantial understatement of value. Um, barring that remedy, I think the immaterial irregularity provisions of GS 105-394 would allow us to go back and look at values and reassess. Um, there's not a requirement in law necessarily to employ either of those mechanisms to the situation at hand, but those give us options. Yes. Although with real property, we don't go out and ask for an evaluation. If we assess the value unlike personal property. Correct. And that's why I think the 105-394 uh, provision might allow us to look at the value once again. All right. And the second is, is it even smart to do it for this year or within the next, what, three years before our new evaluation? Well, I think Mr. Akins has already kind of laid out the rubric there, right? So I don't believe that saying that the value should be 125 a square foot when it's been assessed at 60, uh, 65, 65 a square foot necessarily means that we're going to come out that much ahead. I mean, it's not necessarily a windfall of money that we're going to gain by simply sending the bills and waiting for the checks to come in. There's going to be a process undertaken. It's very likely that um, the entities that have not yet appealed their valuation might decide to do so, especially because of the circumstances that have happened in the past year. So the board may decide not to take the position that we want to pursue it this year. Um, but I think he's laid out for you the cost-benefit metric there. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, um, you're saying that we can actually go back and send a new bill this year? Yes, I believe there's a mechanism to do that. Okay. Um, what would be their appeal timing then if we send a new bill? Would they not have a within 30 new days appeal of notice. period? Mm -hmm. They would get yes. 30 days of notice. Okay. Yes. It, they'd still get the same due process as if they'd gotten the bill the first time. Uh, so they don't they won't lose any of that just because we decide to go back and reassess at a different value. Um, I think it might be a good idea to look at what our cost might be if we want to defend it so that we can have some insight as a board on what this might cost us if we want to defend that and whether or not what we anticipate the outcome to be. I mean, when this was when this came to light to me, it really bothered me that we have uh, merchants in our community that are competing with our local merchants in a lot of cases. Um, getting a benefit that our local merchants don't get. And uh, um, I, I just, it, 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 it's not right. <laughs> I can come up with a lot of different ways to describe it, but it's just not right. And I agree with what Mr. George said. I appreciate him so much in taking a look at that and uh, finding it out. Yeah, I'd just like to say, too, is we... You know what? Okay. If, unless we bring you up, you cannot. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I, I'll go back to what I said. I think it would be a good idea between now and either our second meeting this month or our first meeting in October for us to take a look at, it may take longer, what the cost might be to put together a team to actually defend it and be prepared to understand whether we want to undertake that cost and what the benefit might be and how to analyze where we might wind up at the end of that process. Understood. Lord, our can we vote to allow Mr. Joyce to address this issue? Are we in agreement to do that? Yeah, because other random people sure. come up and talk. No problem with that. Mr. Turner, you're right. Mr. Yeah. Joyce. Yeah, well, here's the thing. You come you up know. to the mic. Okay. And Jeremy and I have gotten to know each other real well. <laughs> uh, he's a great guy. He's a good employee. Probably the only few, one of the few government employees that ever made it wrong. 
<laughs> but, uh, you know, when I sit here and hear you talk, we, we can't be afraid. Thank you. Okay? We can't be afraid to charge people what they owe. Exactly. Okay? We, we, we can't sit here and, and raise this gentleman's homeowner's value double and say, well, he's not going to appeal because he's going to have to hire an attorney, he's going to have to spend this money, and he's not going to do it, so we bluff him down and he pays. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about doing, okay? At some point, you've got to stand up. And, and let me say this about Jeremy's view. You have got an awful system for evaluating property. I think Jerry would admit that. I admit it. I've looked at it. This is just a shot in the dark approach to appraising property. There's this hard. The only way you can appraise this property, it costs you millions of dollars, is to send somebody out and appraise the properties all over the county every year. So you can't do it. So we're taking shots in the dark, you know, and saying, well, this house in this zone was worth this much a square foot. So we're going to make everybody's house in this zone worth so much a square foot. Okay? That's, that's basically how it works, isn't it? I don't know that's an accurate description. Yeah, well, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can, we can debate that some Yeah, but I'm just saying, he's got it. There's no, his system is dated 1988. Okay? The copyright on our, our software is 1980. You're right. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're talking about a lot of difference in 1988 and 1920. I'm sure there's some more up-to-date software. There may not be. I mean, I've talked to a lot of business people, big business people about this. And they've said this has been going on for years. That it's just hard. You know, when they don't get, when, when the property tax doesn't increase, you don't hear a peep out of them. Okay? When it comes in way too low, they quiet as a mouse. You know, but when it comes in too high, then they want to use their clout, their legal money that the individual doesn't have. And that's what brought all this about, about the homeowner paying the bulk of the tax. When I see something like this where we aren't billing these people because we're afraid. You know, now let me comment here, Mr. George. I never asked Mr. Aiken, I never said not to do it. What was my first comment? Let's go get it. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, well, I understand. But our job as your commissioner is to be informed before we make a move. And so to have some knowledge of what we're getting ready to undertake and understand what the expense might be is the way we approach that. I understand that. I think we need to go get the money. I think you do too. Because it's a one-time expense. And if you get it, you're going to get it forever. And it's not a little bit of money. I mean, you know, $40,000 $40, is not a little bit of money to, to most of these people. You know, that's a lot of tax money. And, you know, as we go through the next four years, this is going to give Jeremy an opportunity to take his folks and start looking at some of this stuff and making sure that we do have a better valuation instead of being afraid. And I don't think Jeremy's afraid. I just think he's thinking about, okay, if I, if I get this, do I, how much does it cost me to get it? Mm -hmm. You know, so is it worth it? Well, it's always worth it. Do the right thing. It's always worth doing the right thing for the taxpayers. And then we might even actually bring our tax rate down to, you know, to help bring some of these values down back on these homes to where they should be instead of where they are. And it all averages out. Okay? But I appreciate Jeremy's help. And I mean that. I did a lot of digging and a lot of questioning and went a long ways up the ladder to find this information out. So, uh, if you want me as a, uh, hire me as a uh, bounty hunter, uh, I'm real expensive, but, you know, I can probably pay my salary. Thanks. Thank you. We may actually set an example for the other 100 counties in North Carolina, right? Exactly. Well, and, and I would say, and, and I do want to emphasize that what we have here is a unique situation. Uh, this is not a failure of appraising property, uh, being able to figure out what a market value is. This is a decision to follow an appeals board and set up the market. 
uh, and it's isolated to these 10 properties. So I don't want you to think that because this has occurred with these 10, that well, that's just the way that they do business. That is not the way. I think demonstrably, again, for commercial property, if we're up 60% in six years, we're obviously not doing this generally. Um, and I would say, um, I don't know that we would, we're talking about enough revenue to move the tax rate. Um, I don't, I don't think that's really what we're, we're looking at. I don't want you to have a false impression that, well, we're going to do this, then that's going to let us drop the tax rate. We're, it's not that much. Um, but I would say I always feel like it's worth doing the right thing. Um, on the front end, I have no other choice but to, to do it properly. If I had known this, even though I was still getting the bill, still we're going to do it the right way on the front end. The only concern I have is that this has already been done. So if I present to this board, I don't want to present to this board only half the story. Have this board make a decision on half the information and then be surprised later. If they follow up and say, Jeremy, how'd that go? And then Jeremy says, well, we lost money. And you say, I never warned you about it. So that's my place is to make sure that you have all the information in hand. I do want to take the opportunity uh, to thank Mr. Barry Joyce for uh, his feedback, his comments. Uh, he was a valuable information source as we were studying. Everything he told me regarding the lows, uh, everything checked out, so he was definitely very knowledgeable. And I appreciate that because um, if he had not said anything, I would not have known. And to my knowledge, in 11 and a half years of coming before this board, I have never misinformed this board before. Uh, if I ever do, I want to know it because I've been chomping at the bit for a month to have a chance to come back and set it right and say, here's the correct information. And without Mr. Joyce, that wouldn't have happened. It's always refreshing to have somebody accept responsibility. And I want to thank you and Mr. Joyce. Um, he and I talk way too much about this matter. <laughs> uh, but we appreciate it. And citizens, you bring matters to us, we do listen as commissioners. And I'm talking about all five commissioners. Um, and we do raise the issues when we need to, uh, but I just want to say thank you to both you gentlemen. Um, my, based upon Mr. Carter's recommendation, I would suggest to this board that we put it on our next agenda possibly, uh, come back, Mr. Stevens, with, you, you only have two people in your office, basically as attorneys. Uh, that's, that's correct, yes. So, you know, we need to know what it will take with these required appeals, um, what is going to be the cost to appeal it and follow through, and the additional legal service cost. Um, and I would request that we put this on our agenda for our next meeting. Board, do you agree? I do. Um, excuse me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I just think about all the folks that have. Um, lost their minds over their tax rates. Literally, the folks, especially seniors, that just don't know if they can keep their homes because of taxes. And um, I just think about little David going into that war with Goliath, and he tore him up. Head on a stick and danced about him downtown. That's my way of solving things. But um, we, we, can't, we can't be cowards here. The big, big Goliaths, you're always gonna have them in your world. And, and I, I'm all about fairness, and um, this could go back years, how much they, we would have been a difference in our tax amount of the money coming into this county. And uh, I think whoever lives in this county pays just like whoever lives in this county, whatever that looks like. And um, I just, um, I, I think we need to go to war with this because that is really standing up for the public in this county because they pay for everything, and everybody needs to pay their fair share, whatever that looks like. And I know how I felt about the tax revow, and I, I just, I hate this has happened, but for um, you to stand there, I said I'd come in and stand with you. I really appreciate it. It's great to see integrity and in leading and different things like that. And that's all that matters when it comes to really leading folks, is you've got to be honest, and even when it gets bad, but... Um, I'm just glad we don't go into war like this. Well, we can't go because they may beat us. No, you go to win, and that's the way I see it. So, but I'm just, um, I'm just. This is unbelievable. This has happened. But now we got to face it and face it right for everybody that pays their taxes in this county. 
I will say for clarity's sake that you know, only this year uh, and the future years are, are yeah. we have uh, in mind. Uh, the last year and previous years were set by the very same board we're talking about, the Property Tax Commission in Raleigh. They previously appealed and our value was, was set to the lower amount. So. Well, they can come in here in their $10,000 suits, and that's okay, because David and Goliath, that's all I have to say. The board, my motion is to table this matter to our next meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Any other discussion on the motion that's pending? Quickly, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Higgins, uh, so I understand we value the Lowe's boxes in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the other eight, nine, um, were those done by the professional appraisers based upon the decisions made for the appeals, or did we in-house, or did we look at other boxes in-house as well? So these are mostly done by in-house staff. We had a couple that was done by the contractor, but they used our numbers. So our staff said we're doing 65 a square foot, okay. and they got those numbers from us. So everything just kind of starts from that assessment? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Lowe's, Lowe's was the beginning point, and everything was set to be similar. Okay. Well, I, thank you. I, by way of discussion, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm happy to, to support your motion. I can tell you that, that when this comes up again, that I will support Mrs. Thompson's view, and we'll be seeking um, that, that we assess the values of what we actually assess the values to be. Right. Any further discussion as I to this have motion? One other question. I do have another question. Mr. Lashley does as well. Go ahead. Personal property. Mm -hmm. What's the impact on the personal property? In the, I mean, that's furniture, fixtures, and equipment in those stores. Or that's assessed separately. And right, so, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But what? It, it has no interaction. That, that was built separately. That was built separately. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lash. Well, I just wanted to make get Susan Evans to make a note of this because uh, just doing my calculations, just took just took a look as sixty five dollars a square foot, and figured out what their tax rate, what their tax bill would be, mm -hmm. and. I've just gotten a ballpark figure around thirty-six to thirty-eight thousand right. dollars is their bill. Right. Now, I feel like the other commissioners that we probably should definitely not let this fall by the wayside. But with one caveat, be careful what you wish for, because if, in essence, you're taking that sixty-five, you're going to double it. So for lows, you're talking about thirty-eight thousand dollars right. for one. Multiply that by ten, it's three hundred eighty thousand dollars. It's not chump change. Mm -hmm. But what good? have you done if it cost you a quarter million dollars to get it? This is a great thing, and I think, Mr. Joyce, this is what citizens help their community by his, taking his experience and speaking up and showing you where this is wrong, and I thank him for that. But just be careful what you wish for and what you want to do, because lawyers aren't cheap. And when you get into, and Mr. Stevens, you step in any time I say anything wrong. Anytime you get into discussions or litigation with lawyers, the, 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 the numbers could be astronomical. So what I'm saying is just let's, let's be careful. I understand wanting to go get it. I'd say let's go ahead and send them a bill and see how it comes out. That's, a, that's okay. But be very careful when you are all amped up to go get $380,000, which, by the way, one penny will bring you two and a half million. So for all this effort, you're not going to move the needle on a tax rate at all. Zero. So let's just be careful about going and doing this. I think we should send in the bill, and I thank Mr. Joyce, but going forward in the next reval, we've got some real hard, fast numbers, and this money won't slip away from us again. So I'm, all I'm saying is that let's be careful. Um, want to dust up a fight with somebody. I'm saying, let's send the bill, let's do the right thing. But I'm not saying that. Let's do that. But let's think about it a little bit more, uh, a, a little more open of how we're going to uh, achieve this goal. Because I think we should ask for the money if they owe it to us. But going and fighting somebody for $380,000 is going to cost you a quarter million dollars does not seem very fair. I mean, does not seem the right way to go. I mean, I just thank you and Mr. Joyce for bringing this to our attention. And I certainly want to have it on the next agenda, and I would like to get the numbers from each one of these entities, these retailers, of how much they actually, what, what their tax bill is, what the tax bill should have been, and let's just make a, make a determination if we're willing to 
I just don't want to go fight these lawyers for a year, maybe, would that be right? And the county gets nothing for it. The only thing the county gets is our, our lawyer, our county lawyer loses all his hair because he's pulling his hair out, having to deal with all these 10 different entities, which is not going to be easy. It's going to be very time consuming. It's going to cost a lot of money to the county. So I just want to be aware of that. Understand, let's do the right thing. Let's send them a bill. But be careful what you wish for about fighting these lawyers because they, like you said, Jeremy, they have they have pockets <clears throat> full of cash. Well, I, and I want to make sure to, to always give a, a clear understanding and a, a, an accurate impression uh, with what I say. You know, when we're looking at the 125 a square foot, um, we're walking through a desert, and up ahead, that sure looks like an oasis. But when you get there, it's just the heat reflection on the sand. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that we can't come out net positive. We might come out net negative. I do not know that. But if we begin to think, well, my goodness, at 125 a square foot, this is the amount of money, that's an illusion. I, I, I don't think that's achievable. I think the principle here is that your county is fighting for its taxpayers that have kind of felt like they took the whole brunt. And when you discover something like this, talking about paying a bill, I would much rather pay my attorneys to do the right thing by me even if I lose, because you've always got to do the right thing. And you take that risk. I think it's worth it. I think our, I think, I'm a taxpayer, and I think it's worth it, because um, what's fair is fair. And, uh, and if they've gotten away with this, I don't mean gotten away with it, that's on us. And, and why would they fuss about it? Oh, please, I need to pay you more. That's just what we do. That's in everything. But um, the people have took a big hit on this. And I would, as, as a person this, in this county, I would really appreciate my leaders fighting for me after what I've just experienced. Because we've heard some, some really tough stories. And, uh, and I, God, I keep blows in business. You should see the flowers at my house. And I love them. But I want them to pay just like everybody else does. It, it balances out much better that way. And we can't be cowards. Okay, we have a motion on the deck. Any other discussion? There being none, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any op anybody opposed? Aye. It's unanimous. Thank See you, you next meeting. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, it's been requested prior to Mr. Atkins' presentation for a 10 minute recess. So I'm going to be fired if I don't give the other commissioners a 10 minute recess. We're back in session. Okay, Mr. Hooch, I'm standing out the back. Yeah, I'm trying to be funny when I say this. Should we cut on the timer? No. <laughs> he, would he, he would probably like it. Yeah. <laughs> Take it to me. Yes. Yes. Please take over the time. <laughs> uh, uh, I have so many words. I, I wrote them down today. Uh, Chairman Paisley, board members, um, it's been roughly 45 days since we first learned of the severe mold in our buildings. I want to take a moment to provide some background for you and those joining us today. When severe mold was first found at Andrews Elementary and then at Newland Elementary, the ABSS board and my staff immediately shifted into crisis response mode. Over the past six weeks, we've been working to assess the situation, to hire remediation and testing crews, and to develop both short-term fixes and long-term <coughs> solutions. I sincerely appreciate that this board of commissioners came to the table for three extensive meetings with us last week to address the urgent issue. You all have demonstrated a real commitment to protecting the health and safety of our students and staff. I look forward to continuing our work to resolve this crisis. Our community, community is counting on us. I want to recap some funding. During, emer during an emergency meeting on August the 4th, the Board of Education authorized the use of $1.2 million from our PAYGO funding to address urgent issues at Andrews and Newland Elementary Schools. The allocation redirected from other planned facilities needs enabled immediate HVAC repairs and mold remediation to begin at the, those two schools. 
the work of those uh, the work at those schools prompted a public outcry from the Alamance County taxpayers who were also our families to check every school. Dr. Butler was also adamant that every building be checked before allowing students back in. Last week you agreed to allow us to reallocate nearly $17 million in funding that were coming to us for use um, on, um, and some of our lottery funding to help us get our children back in school. As you're aware, late Friday, we made the difficult decision to delay the start of school until September 11th after discovering toxic mold in 10 of our schools. We realized in order to reopen these buildings, the HVAC systems would need thorough cleaning to ensure that all mold is removed and to allow time for air quality testing to be done at our schools. We apologize to our families and staff. I want those watching and listening to us to know that this was a difficult decision for us. Yes, we have heard the public outcry of all kinds, but I stand before you today knowing that in the long run, we, the commissioners and the Board of Education, will have done the right thing for Alamance County's taxpayers. As of this morning, 29 schools are undergoing remediation and sadly, we're up to 16 campuses where we have discovered toxigenic mold that I've spoke about, which requires additional funding to correct. Both boards can say that we have been transparent with our community through the entire process. We currently have a mold dashboard on our website to let taxpayers know how we are together handling this situation. As I said last week, we have been in crisis of we have been in a crisis for Alamance County, and we appreciate our students, families, and staff for being patient with us. We continue to have over 2,000 contractors working as I speak right now in our schools to remedy the crisis. We appreciate you prioritizing this facility crisis that we are in and working collaboratively to ensure our schools are safe learning environments for the children and families of Alamance County. We look forward to a productive discussion today on how we can move forward. And we thank you. I'd like to acknowledge our state senator is present well. Thank you. Mr. Carver. I don't have any at the moment, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carver. Um, we're now up to 16 sites with toxic mold. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Yes, I could summarize the information I have on those if you'd like. And uh, I had a conversation earlier this weekend uh, with a member of the school board that indicated that we still thought we were going to be able to get schools open by the 11th. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's our intent. Okay. What are those schools you're talking about, the 16? Ms. Thompson. Sorry, I just want the schools, the 16. Okay, um, so um, there are 16, nine of which uh, were from surface sampling and seven of which were from air sampling. Um, Broadview, these are air sampling. Um, Broadview, Cummings, Woodlawn, Graham High School, uh, Hall River, Eastern High School, and East Lawn. Uh, physical surface sampling revealed uh, varieties of toxic mold at Ray Street Academy, uh, Western Alamance High School, Grove Park, Pleasant Grove, North Graham, E.M. Holt, Beaver Jordan, Sylvan, and Southern High School. Can you say that again? Yeah. That's improper, but please repeat it. All of them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, air, air quality sampling revealed toxigenic mold in the air samples at Broadview Middle School, Cummings High School, Woodlawn Middle School, Graham High School, Hall River Elementary School, Eastern High School, East Lawn Elementary School. Physical surface sampling revealed uh, varieties of toxic mold at Ray Street Academy, Western Alamance High School, Grove Park Elementary, Pleasant Grove Elementary, North Graham Elementary, E.M. Holt Elementary, B. Eric Jordan Elementary, Sylvan Elementary, Southern Alamance High School. 
So I, I, I do want to say the physical samplings, um, surface samples, that may have only been in one spot, but it, it, that's what got it to hit the list. Stops and continue, please. Uh, um, just curiosity, just curiosity, um, like something like the new school Southeast, that has that been tested? Not and yet. Our luck is <laughs> just asking. Not, not yet. Okay. It may be new, but I don't trust mold, so I'm just asking. Mr. Hook, um, is the website up to speed, or is this a new, is, is that list not your list? I just pulled it up for the public. Okay. It doesn't look like the top genetic okay. mold list is, is accurate. Okay. Yes, sir. Just want to be clear. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. I'm good. Mr. Lash. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Hook, questions abound. I have received hundreds of emails, and the first question everyone asks, how did this occur? I mean, can you confirm or deny that the system was shut off at any particular time during the summer? Um, they were set to go off uh, over the weekends and in the evenings, um, and uh, beginning July 1st, we began running them around the clock. July 1st, is that normally what you would do before? I think since 2008, uh, the system has been shutting uh, HVAC, whether we're talking heating or cooling, off um, every day at 5 o'clock unless the school requested for a special event to run in the evening uh, and also on the weekends. And I recall even uh, in the summer times uh, during cer certain years, um, it, it was shut off the whole school except for the office uh, during the summer unless you requested to turn it on because you were doing stripping and waxing or cleaning activities on a certain hallway of school. Uh, the reason I ask is in our meetings last week, uh, Dr. Parker, school board member, made a very interesting thought. And it wasn't his thought, he did some investigation on this. And we were talking about toxigenic mold, which is the highest mold that you have. And you have allergenic mold, which is the lowest one you have. In his presentation, he says that the uh, allergenic mold is these things that can occur in a rapid sense, like it doesn't need a lot of time. But the toxigenic mold is a complete different monster. It's one of these things, and his words were, toxigenic mold cannot grow in one growing season. It takes multiple growing seasons for this to occur. Have, have you done any research on, on that to see if this was a problem that was uh, here over time? rather than just the allergenic mold that we see on surfaces and, and things like that, do you see the toxigenic mold, do you see the same same way he does it? This is a particular process that it takes, in his words, more than one growing season. Could take several growing seasons to get to the toxigenic side of it. Are you seeing the same thing? I'm, I'm not a mold expert, but I'll tell you my opinion. Uh, I've learned a lot from going around with the, uh, the folks that we've had doing our our sampling and testing, um, they're, they're really good teachers. Um, so from what I understand, uh, the uh, toxigenic molds um, come from water invasion, sustained water invasion, and it makes sense of what Dr. Pa Parker has uh, postulated, um, and uh, I would agree with that. The other thing that I've learned is when you have the existence of um, allergenic molds, if you don't get them cleaned up, then other molds will begin to feed on them, and so it will basically transform from one type of mold to another, um, and, and so on. I can't define what a growing season is for, for mold, um, but I, I, would, I would think that anytime we're providing um, water, humidity, a uh, certain amount of heat, and food, which basically is dirt or other types of mold, then uh, we're growing mold. Well, I got one last thing to ask, and uh, Ms. Thompson brought it up, so I figured I would go down this road about the new high school. It is my understanding that things from schools that have current mold problems in them, things were taken out of those schools and placed in Southeastern 
at Southeast High School as a matter of, I guess, space. Do, do you know if that's true? I can't speak to that other than teachers taking their, their computers with them, which they should have taken them home every day when they left. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. You cannot imagine how many emails, voicemails, texts, and so forth that this board has received over this issue. Um, I don't want to point fingers whatever, but Ms. Atkins went on several local news stations blaming lack of funding, county commissioners specifically, for this problem. Um, I know, and I think that one of the board members in one of our hearings said only 17% of our budget goes to the school system. It's more accurately 33 to 35%. The 17% was totally erroneous. And if we're going to blame point fingers, I'm willing to do that. But I do not think that's in the best interest of our students or our parents. Um, I, as a commissioner, do not receive any notification of the postponement of schools from today. I did as a grandfather, because I have two grandchildren that are in the school system, and I received the notice as a second-in-line notification grandfather. Why are we, as commissioners, not receiving the information on the front end and before it's just general information and I find out about it on channel 8 or channel 12 news. Um, firstly, uh, well, firstly I, 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 uh, I agree that um, we need to work together um, to solve these problems. Um, I'm not a fan of finger pointing. Um, you know, as I've thought about this, it's definitely a time for us to rise to our goals and not fall to our habits. And we, I think we all in the three board members' uh, meetings last week recognized that we, uh, we have some bad habits, uh, but we can't rise to our goals by ourselves. We have to do it together, both, both boards. Um, so I'll defer to Dr. Butler on your second part of your question. Thank you, uh, thank you Chairman Paisley. Uh, I was not aware that you were not receiving information in a timely manner. We will fix that. Thank you. Um, that's that's sure. your point. Okay. Um, also, in, in terms of what we're dealing with today, um, we have found out a whole lot since Friday evening. Uh, the numbers have gone up. Uh, Mr. Bass is here from Builder Services as well as Joe Johnson to handle the specifics you may have uh, because the numbers have gone up to the cost, of course. More schools, more money. Uh, I, I think right now, moving forward what we need to focus on in my opinion is a long-term plan we get through this we get the schools clean the schools that have toxic and mold i think we have to clean the air ducts that serves the hvacs but moving forward how do we prevent having to be back up here again and i think that's long-term planning um, and that's got to be our laser focus moving forward not looking backwards that means roofs and what i've emailed my board is roofs Water intrusion, dehumidification, um, those, are, those are the things that cause mold. And until we figure out how to address those and be preventative moving forward, mold's not going to go away. And I assure you that there are 115 LEAs in North Carolina mm -hmm. school districts. They have them too. It's just not here. But we, as in you guys and us, are brave enough to say enough's enough. We're going to fix this. Uh, Look, um, you and my wife talked together at Broadview Middle School for years, um, and I suspect that you, I know she did, at the front of every year, came home, got Clorox, got whatever, carried materials back to clean mold, and that was for 42 years. And I suspect you saw the same, same thing. The news reported that the type of mold in Broadview Middle School where we talked can cause brain infections and potential cancer. You do know what I had. So this is personal, but it's not just about me. It's about the kids and staff members that are there today. That was 20 years ago or more. Was there mold then, there then? I don't know. I know this here now. Mr. Carr. 
I think Mr. Bass, Mr. Bass had an interesting comment in uh, an earlier meeting, I believe from last week, about the other schools in North Carolina that had been that they had had to deal with it. It's not like we're in a category of one. Would you be so kind as to repeat some of the other school systems you've worked for in North Carolina? So? Chairman Page is uh, Vice Chair of the Card Board. Yes, here's the here's the nutshell. You're not alone. You just got it all at one time. <laughs> I mean, other school districts deal with this in the state of North Carolina, Georgia, Florida. The difference is, is you got everything all at one time. Most of the time, other counties or other school districts maybe face one building, one wing, two wings, maybe one whole school, maybe two schools. Y'all guys are facing 30 plus schools at one time. And I want to be, it, it ain't just cleaning them is the thing. These schools are getting, are losing every chalkboard, every cork board, every dry erase board, are all going into the landfill. They cannot be remediated, they cannot be cleaned, and they have mold on them, on the back side. They're made with particle board, so you take a dry erase board, it's slick on this side, it's particle board on the back, okay? I want to address, so Chairman, I'm sorry. Address what, is that, for that purpose, address what, for the audience, what is food to mold? I think a lot of people think immediately of food left lying around or crumbs or something yeah. of that nature. Address what is food for mold? So, so mold, if you think about a three-legged stool, it takes three things for mold. It takes temperature, it takes moisture, and it takes a food source. A food source can be uh, any wood product, any any paper, any you know drywall, sheetrock has a paper, any food source. If you take away one of the three legs, that stool will not stand. If you take away the moisture, it won't grow. If you take away the temperature, it won't grow, okay? And I wanted to address or just answer Chairman uh, Lashley's point about the, the toxigenic mold. You are correct. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes several cycles for it to happen. And the way it happens is prolonged moisture issues. Penicillin and aspergillus can grow very, very quickly. And so I'll address some of the things that's happened since Friday. And I apologize I wasn't there Wednesday or Friday. I had a family member that had a hip replaced on Wednesday, so I've been doing both of these. And I couldn't leave that one. So everything's been email and voicemail and phone. But anyway. Joe did a good job. Well, right? I appreciate it. <laughs> so <clears throat> what's happened is, is these schools were assessed by a third party. Okay? Alamance Burlington School System hired these folks, which is the right thing to do. They're paying these folks. I have no clue what they're getting paid. They go in and they expect, and they say, okay, at this time and date, we found mold here, here, and here. Okay? Then what should happen is they should write a protocol. A protocol, if you think about it like this, you go to the doctor, you tell the doctor, hey, I don't feel good. The doctor checks you out and says, okay, here's three prescriptions, take and get them filled. You take them to the pharmacy. I'm the pharmacist. I fulfill the prescription, okay? The standard of care is the same, right, in my industry. We know how to do that piece. Well, what's happened is, is these reports were several days later, okay? So what they saw on Tuesday, if the report come out on Thursday or Friday once they got the air samples back, well, guess what? We go in and we start these areas. We go in to do quality control before we call, before we send the email for have the industrial hygienist to clear it. We go into other parts of the school and guess what it's got? Mold. Because it wasn't, it doesn't have any dehumidification. So when we remediate the area, we control the climate. So it doesn't Why happen. does it have zero dehumidification? Well, I'm not saying it has zero dehumidification. What I'm telling you is that it has moisture problems. And the reason why is these schools need to be maintained based on grains of moisture. Everybody talks about relative humidity. Relative humidity, you've got to have three other points to get to that, okay? This, these school systems, at Alamance, Burlington schools, we have schools in one structure 
One part may be 69 degrees and the other part's 81 degrees in the same building, okay? 69 degrees is 60% humidity. You only have this much water. 81 degrees is 60%. You got this much grains, you know, water. So if it's all managed by grains per pound, that's how many, how much available water is in the air. It's the only way you can do it. And as long as these schools stay between 55 and 65, you could possibly get up to 68 grains. You won't have a problem. I can tell you that if it's not corrected, you're going to be right back sailing this boat. And folks, it ain't months. You're going to be talking days and weeks. What is your recommendation to the superintendent of schools to have this not occur again? There's what changes need to be made? Well, there's several things. We've, we've already replaced thousands upon thousands upon thousands of ceiling tiles already. When you see a wet ceiling tile, that's like you're having a heart. Okay, where's that coming from? Let me find it and let me replace it. Because any commercial structure that you go in and you see a wet spot that big, well, guess what? The top side is twice as bad, okay? One, it needs to be changed. Two, it needs to be determined where it come from. Did it come from a chiller pipe that's leaking? Did it come from an HVAC pan that's overflowing? Did it come from a roof leak? They've got to, they've got to figure that out quickly, okay? And when I mean quickly, within a couple of days, you know. If they have a leak or a water loss, a sink cabinets, you know, or something, one that's got to be remediated, meaning it's got to be dried out properly, okay? The biggest thing is, is these schools have to have temporary climate control for two scenarios. One, until the heat's turned back on, so you're talking two, two and a half months. I don't know what the schedule is when the heat's turned back on. So you've got to climate control these interior these buildings. And I will tell you, it's not the only county in the state. There's other counties right now that we have equipment that's climate controlled because they're waiting on parts for boilers, waiting on parts for chillers. Okay, so it has to be climate controlled for, until one or two things happen. Either the heat is turned back on, so fall comes, or that system in every building is tested, balanced, okay, and correct. You cannot have a 10 to 12 degree temperature difference in a building. You cannot maintain humidity controls that way. I mean, that is, you're running circles. Some of these roofs, we had inspected on our roofs. We're not a roofing engineer. But when we go in and we replace thousands upon thousands upon thousands, I mean, we're probably up to two, three, four semi-truck loads of ceiling tiles already, okay? There's a problem. And what you see on the bottom side, maybe a spot that big, you look at the top side, it's in motor, okay? I reference the chalkboards, okay? I can show you pictures. Every chalkboard we take down, it's covered in motor in the back side. That comes from humidity. It gets between the wall and the, and the actual masonite on the back of the chalkboard, and guess what it does? It just grows. Okay, colonies. Dry race boards, the same way. So that, somebody asked the question, do we think we can be there? Yes, there's a army of industrial hygienists here. Okay. And when I tell you army, there's, I don't know how many here. There's got to be 12 or 15 of them here that come in yesterday. And they're in these schools, and they're saying, hey, you didn't have a protocol for this, but I'm going to write you one right now. Do you going to do this, this, and this? Man, I mean, I have almost 600 people here cleaning just duct and HVAC system. Not count all those people we have here doing remediation. So we have the workforce here to do it, okay? And, and you know, at the end of the day, y'all are not alone. The problem is, is you're getting it all at one time. And it's unfortunate. But only thing I can compare this to is... Um, Several school districts in Texas I've done, Louisiana I've done, Florida I've done, and I've done a lot of school systems after hurricanes. It feels like Alamance County school system got hit by a hurricane. That's what y'all are going through. Back to my question. Yes, sir. What are your recommendations to Dr. Butler 
to make changes in their maintenance, their procedure, so this does not happen again. That's the, the, the ceiling tiles, when they see it, they got to find out where it comes from. Two, when there is a water damage, and look, you can't have a thousand kids or 800 kids and not expect the water line on a, 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 a water heater to bust or a water fountain. It's going to happen. But when it happens, you just can't take a shot back and vacuum it up and just mop and say it's all good, right? If it affects the drywall, it's got to be dried out. It's got to be professionally done, right? And there's a difference between price and cost, and I'm going to answer to finish that. Price is what you pay today. If I can get through by $2 a day, I'm good. The cost is what you pay over the lifetime. You see what I'm saying? So you've got, they've got to do it right, okay? Well, specifically, cutting off the HVAC systems over the summer. Is that will that not work. So now, you can raise the temperature. If all the systems were uh, effective, balanced. Uh, balanced, and working properly, I mean, I just got a call on my way here. There's a team of industrial hygienists at Williams High School this morning at 7.30. There's part of the school that we, we didn't dehumidify. And it's the reason why is we track this every single day, okay? It's been fine every day. Temperature's been fine. Grain's been fine. Blade's been fine. Yesterday, we have the recording from yesterday. Guess what? That part, that area, and it's only like four rooms, that size. 99 grains per pound. We immediately oh, sent... What? Huh? Grains per pound of oh. Moisture. Yeah, so basically GPP stands for grains per pound. It's in a pound of air, how many grains of moisture, okay? So that's the most, that's the available water that's in a pound, and that's the easiest way to do it. Because to do relative humidity, you gotta have temperature and um, grains to do both, right? And with a, that big a temperature difference, it, you can't do it just on road. You'll run yourself crazy in one building trying to figure that piece out. So, guess what, the HVAC system, has something's happened to it between last night at 9.30 and this morning. But for example, we text Mr. Hook and they've already have a maintenance guy out there. That's the type of reaction you gotta have when it comes to stuff like this. To answer your question, HVAC system, there's another school system that's very close to here um, that's a lot larger than this. They went through the same thing. They used to cut it off, they used to turn them off, and for years, my team spent weeks there in July and the first of August. They changed their process five years ago, six years ago, maybe seven, six years ago. I think I've been there twice in six years. And what they've done is they changed their entire energy load procedure. They don't turn it off. And they, do they raise the temperature? Yes. But all their systems, they spent millions they have them tested, balanced, but they raise them at night instead of, you know, 72 degrees, it may be 84 degrees, but they still have that dehumidification when it comes on, just like your house. And on the weekends, and through the summer, they leave it on the whole time. But you gotta keep it below 86, I believe, is that right? Yes, yeah, so if you do it based on that, that's correct. Because of the volume of air, the moisture that's available in that air, yes. I know that when my wife is teaching and Dr. Butler is a teacher, and I'm not saying that Dr. Butler did, I know what I did, would report something typically to the principal and it just died. Uh, you still had buckets in the hallway, you still had whatever. Uh, so would you recommend to Dr. Butler as a superintendent that the procedure change and that reports be sent straight up and the reports from the health department, for example, and I see our health director here as well, be immediately sent to Dr. Butler, superintendent. Yeah, Dr. Butler's a good guy. He does, he's really trying to make changes. He's very, he, he's adamant this gets corrected. So. And without information, he's very, very handicapped. Oh, okay. And the maintenance people check the schools on a, they've got the entire summer. We should not have known about this problem 12, 15 days before the opening of school. So would you make recommendations also? If it was me making a recommendation in the current situation that y'all are in, the, the, the thing of it is, is knowledge is power. There's some very large school districts, Wake County school districts, okay? They have over 320 some maintenance personnel, okay? 
That's a big force. We still do all of our stuff under contract for the last three and a half, four years. Okay. But they have their own indoor environmental personnel because they have so many. They have 206 schools. But they have a personnel that literally takes air samples randomly throughout the year. And then they randomly do it. And if they have a call, it's, it's addressed pretty quickly. Like, you know, mobile classrooms are always, I mean, great idea, bad design, <laughs> okay? Bad design. But they'll ha they have a few left. They'll get a call. The next day, she's out there testing it. If there's an issue, I'm out there the same day or the next morning, and we're remediating. That's how quick they act, okay? Because it can spread, right? But it's the same way as other counties in the, in the state that have faced it. They have employed a outside IEP firm, and, and they have it done twice a year. They'll get a baseline, and then they'll come in and test, okay, all these are good. Test, all these are good. And if they, you know, unfortunately, some of the people don't like their results because they, I mean, if it's wrong, they'll tell you it's wrong. And you got to fix it. Same way, you know, if the health department finds something that's, you know, it's like me, if I, you know, if I go to a restaurant and I see a rating that's 65 degrees, the chance of me eat, I mean 65, <laughs> great, I probably won't eat there. I mean, I probably won't. Matter of fact, I know I won't. So, you see what I'm saying? So we've got to take that in account, and what they see, I agree, you know, and like I said, I'm just speaking from my professional opinion. I think that them reports should go directly to Dr. Butler's office. That's just my because I'd want to know what's going on, right? And he can't address something that he doesn't know. Correct. You know? But I can tell you, throughout the last, I don't know, where are we in? Day eight now? He had not labor. He's going, he wants them fixed, and he wants them clean. And I can tell you, um, I think if y'all saw it, it would open your eyes. Mm -hmm. And I'll be glad, and, and it, look, it's not even my building, so, and actually, you know, but if, if y'all wanted to, and I've done this in six, six other counties, seven, six other counties, where I took the commissioners on a tour, I'll be glad to do it. And I've got some schools that are done. But I want you to see the aftermath of what they're left with. Okay? There's dust in dumpsters. So, there's chalkboards gone. There's nothing, you know. Sometimes it's a lot cheaper to replace it. Oh, absolutely. Oh. Time oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no doubt. My point is, is when they go back to school on the 11th, they're going to go in there and they need to be in school. I've got kids in public schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, I graduated from North Carolina public schools, right? That's probably why I talk like I do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but, yeah, when they go back, it's going to look different. They're going to go in a classroom and there's nothing on the wall. They're going to walk down the hall and there's nothing up there. I mean, they're going to go in the kindergarten rooms and some of the sink cabinets, there, there's nothing there. I mean, so it ain't just the cost of what you've got to pay for the remediation. The cost afterwards is going to be a lot more than what you pay for the remediation or what the school board pays. Okay? Because we're going to make sure they're safe. And luckily, we have a job we do, but we have somebody that's audits everything we do that the school board hired. So, you know, they're telling us, like this morning, we just received some different direction. Well, that direction is that every single chalkboard, call, all of that has to go. And it's in the state, you know, they're saying, because we have to write, go by the prescription they write, which that part's not that bad, okay? There's gonna be some asbestos costs that you're gonna incur, or the school board's gonna incur. In the state of North Carolina, everything has to be tested, okay? If it comes back positive, the great thing is, is that you can get an emergency permit the same day, okay? So it can be contained, removed, cleared, all of that stuff, okay? So there's some asbestos costs. So the numbers that you see today will be increasing at a rapid clip. And what I want to explain about that rapid clip so when it originally wrote a ROM on a building, we wrote it with no reports, no prescriptions, nothing. 
I wrote it based on historical data what we've done in most other schools, okay? So we write it, so, and we've done that. So now when you get these reports and it shows, okay, that it has chitomium, has stachybotrys, okay, toxic mold, okay? They can't be remediated, they have to be removed, okay? So that there's containments have to be built, negative pressure units have to be set, all of that, full PPE, meaning full closure, respirator, all of that stuff, all cut out, all removed, cleaned, dried, while the containment's still up, it may be two days later, their industrial hygienist has to come in, inspect it, air test it, and when it comes back approved, then we can take all of that down. None of that was quoted in the front because I didn't, nobody knew, right? So you started with that. How many schools is that gonna happen in? Right now, you're probably looking at at least 16 that that's gonna happen in, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that all the, that every room's like that, but you may have four or five rooms in this school, you may have eight or 12 rooms in this school, you may have a wing in one school, so some are worse than others. And a lot of it, I know I'm gonna answer the question before it, before it comes. A lot of these rooms are a result of the roof leaks for years that were never addressed. And it's the waters that come, and it, come, it, it comes down in the cavity of the wall, okay? But this goes back, I mean, look, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, you just gotta, as my grandma would say, tell it like it is. Amen. So, the cabinets are rotting in the back. You can't tell it from the front. When you pull them out, I mean, the bottoms are gone. The, I mean, it, it, there, there's no choice here. At least on my side, there's no choice because I have to do it under the standard of care and they have to be cleared by IEP. So I have no choice. So, Dr. Butler talked about this weekend. There's a lot of costs that went up this weekend. I'll tell you where it comes from. A lot of the cost was, <clears throat> we started out, we have some schools, we, we, in my industry or in my company, we consider them full remediation. That means you send me, you say, okay, clean the whole school. That's a full remediation. We clean the whole school, right? Then we receive what's called partial, meaning that, hey, I only want you to do the cafeteria and the 200 wing. And the reason why, there's two reasons to do that. Because when the industrial hygienist was there, guess what? That's the only two places they saw, was in the cafeteria and the 200 wing. So when my team goes in and they're doing the cafeteria and the 200 wing is contained off to them areas, we climate control them areas, you know, they have HEPA air scrubbers in them areas, all of that stuff's remediated. So we have a QC team in my company that goes through and we quality control before we order a post remediation verification. Through the, we, we send the email to that IH firm, they schedule it, they show up, we have to have somebody there all day, which is no problem. So my team's going through, well guess what? It's in the media center. It's in the 400 hall. It's in the 200, I mean 300 hall. And the thing of it is, we go back and look, so we'll get, so the industrial hygienist, for example, was there last Tuesday or Wednesday, right? They took air samples and that type of stuff. We didn't get the report until Friday, right? So Greg says, okay, we gotta do, because you know, we gotta do the cafeteria and the 200 hall. He sends it out, hey Ben, well, you gotta do this now. We go out there, we start doing it, we find the rest of the school. No, Greg, you mean uh, Mr. Hook, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, so Mr. Hook sends us, we go out and do it. But now we found it. The second thing we found this weekend is areas that we were sending for PRVs that were finished, because there's this army of industrial hygienists are here, right? Areas that we already finished, there's other parts of the school that are in mold, covered in mold now. And so what happens is, and, and, and I'll answer this before it comes up. How can that happen? Mold doesn't stop growing when the industrial hygienist leaves the school, okay? They inspect it, and on an industrial hygienist report, it's only valid for the date and time they were there. So mold doesn't stop. So if the root system is already there and they look and say, okay, this area is clean, it's clean when they see it. But when you go back four days later in an area, it could be covered in penicillin aspergillus. 
surface smoke. Now you don't have any of the toxic stuff, it's just surface smoke, right? But it's on the desk, it's on the tops, it's on the bottoms, on the chairs, on the you know, doors and all that. And that comes from humidity. That comes from the HVAC systems not balanced and not working properly. I have a very good suspicion that some of these schools, the fresh air intakes hung wide open. And unfortunately, at 100 degrees or 90 degrees in the humidity we're in right now, it's like pouring in steam out of your shower right into the building. The system's not set up to maintain that. So that's the reason why you're going to have temporary climate control until you can get HVAC contractors. And look, there ain't a lot of companies come in that can look at 31 schools at one time. It takes a while, right? So you've got to have climate control to keep it so you don't have this problem while everything can be addressed. So that's the biggest thing. So to answer your question, it's action. I think it's what you're seeing right now. But two, there's, a, there's some stuff that I say Dr. Butler can't do. He can't get up there and fix the roof, and he can't get up there and fix the HVAC. But that's the biggest thing. And if not, the amount of money you spend now, I mean, you're going to turn around and do it in a couple months or a couple weeks or next year. You know? How soon do you think you'll have us in a condition that we can safely send our teachers and students back into school? Monday morning, that can go back. That is that. This I mean, coming Monday. Oh, yes, sir. So, so what's happened is, <clears throat> so we clean. So, so far, out of all the schools, we got a, we received either a, either a brief summary, which is very tough on our side. That means, you know, Mr. Pays, uh, Chairman Paisley, there's some mold in the cafeteria and some in the 200 wing. Nothing else. So, 16 of the schools, that's all the information we got. That's not good. 16 of the schools, we get a full report. It says, hey, here's where all the temperatures were, here's where all the humidity was in every building, here's where we sampled everything, this is how you do it. Oh, by the way, recommendations, protocol. You've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. We received that on 16 schools. Okay? So what's happening is we're trying to, we're having to do double work sometimes on half of these schools because we don't have the information. We don't, you know, and, 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 and Mr. Hook's team doesn't have the information either, okay? So that's one of it. So, but there's an army here, so a lot of these schools were very, I mean, were clean, right? What's happening is, is that that was our plan, to get them all clean, okay? Now we've added some, um, the last, Two days we've added seven and the reason why is they just got the reports I mean the school system I mean they don't they didn't know what it, I mean until you get the reports right so that's fine but all these other schools we already started already clean so the IEPs are in the schools right now I mean they started at seven o'clock this morning I think there's 12 or 15 out okay and so what they're doing is these schools that we had this brief summary that we didn't have no action plans they're right the action plan so now guess what we got to do we got to go back and do all that which is fine, we have the people here. So that's not an issue. So our goal is, and our, I mean, the almost five, 600 HVAC duct cleaning and, and crews here, that they'll be done. I have a commitment from them. I have two crews here working 24 hours a day, working two shifts, okay? Got all these HVAC systems that has been identified so far, and I will tell you it's only a few, okay? will all be done by Friday morning because they have to be clearance tested as well, the buildings, okay? So we have some that we've already finished with the protocol. They're in this morning, they're gonna clear them, and they're gonna come back and clear it again after the HVAC cleaning. And you may say, well, why do you do it twice? Well, here's why you do it twice, is because now I can delineate whether it was my team that didn't clean it well, or if the HVAC guys messed it up, made it dirty. And if the HVAC guys mess it up, they're going to turn around and reclean it again. Right? So th this is all happening at a pretty rapid pace. So Monday, Alamance Burleson Schools should go back to school. We'll be done. And they'll have a, the, the board will have a clearance report for every single school. Um, if not, my team will work 24 hours a day through the rest of this week. 
We've done it before. Mr. Carter, questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm still thinking. <laughs> I'm still thinking. She was right the first time. I'm kind of in the same boat. I mean, it's um, yeah, kind of overwhelming. Ms. Thompson. Um, I'm mean, saying last week this was our Katrina, and it certainly is. And sometimes things just have to really hit the fan before things are really looked at. And I am um, just so thankful that Sasser and Builder Services have done the job they've done. It's been, it's just been our own personal miracle. And the one thing I said last week was about the mold goes to the HVACs, goes to the roofs. As a former board member on the school system, I know about roofs. And we need to fix what we need to fix so this does not continue. And because um, every kid deserves the right kind of school for them. I know it's expensive, I know it ticks a lot of people off. Um, but right now, is the goal is to get everything we need done to our public school system that will make it right. And we don't have to be back in this situation again because we are not the only school system that has ever had this happen to them. And sometimes you don't even hear about those school systems. And um, Alamance County has put it out there for everybody to know, and everybody's got their opinion back because they should. Parents, teachers, um, board members, everybody. So um, this commission board is going to have to look at what we're going to do about roofs because we are always um, talking about capital and maintenance. So that's what we have, and we've got to figure out how to do this. And um, I don't know, I kind of liked having us all at the same table last week whenever we were kind of like a family getting mad at each other and we reconciled and then we was okay when we left. This is typical because when things like this are so serious, they're emotional, uh, and, and you just have to kind of find your way through it and get stuff out of the way. So um, I think total upfrontness and communication, um, not tag and things like that. I just, we've got, we're all about the same thing here and we cannot forget that because we just saw about taxes, you know, with these big box stores, we have a lot of work to do in our county. And sometimes, you know, if it's in the dark, it thrives. When it comes out in the light, you can really face it and, and take care of it. Do and you might not like it because, like I said, I heard that, you know, it's, it's my fault, even when it's not. And that's how you have to look at this because we're all in the same boat with it and nothing matters but our children and the teachers that teach them. And um, a lot of things are said, that's emotion, and it's, it's just what it is. I, I tell you, I understand that. But um, I'm just glad you're here to give us a different perspective of reality. And sometimes we all need a dose of it. So I appreciate it. I feel like, like you're my family now because I've seen you so much. Well, I, I appreciate it. I will tell you that there can be a silver lining. Um, one of the counties I can look to actually have got some funding, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're actually well looked upon as Granville County. They went through this about five years ago, and they were the only school system in the state that didn't have no time. Okay? We did all of that. Well, guess what? They worked out some deal, and I don't know, y'all, but they done a study, elementary schools that had a certain process versus elementary schools that didn't, what the absentee rate was, and they have all of this data. And so now school systems from all over the country are trying to model what they've done. And, and it was the, the absentee rates because they have a cleaning process the way they do it. So their schools that just done the normal stuff still had the same higher absentee rate versus the schools that were, they trained the, the staff how to clean it. The absentee rates went way down. I mean, they, they've done a lot of stuff like that over the years, but Dr. McLean um, was there and Dr. Winborn and, and them, and, and like I said, they went through the same thing. But I can tell you, I've done probably two projects for them in four or five years. But they went through what y'all are going through right now. So what happened last week? It's kind of an old saying. I've seen that picture, and I know how it ends. Yeah. I've seen it in Onslow County. I've seen it in Pender County. I've seen the whole joint meeting. I've seen both sides. And the so, thing of it is, is we've got to do things different. But I would make one recommendation. You're talking about roofs and stuff. Roofs are not immediate. Immediate need right now is these HVAC systems. That is the immediate thing that whoever pays for it, that's not my opinion. 
I'm just telling you, the HVAC systems right now, starting like now, need to be addressed because it's going to take months to fix this. Okay? Yeah. Months. So I wanted to give just kind of an update on some costs. I wasn't there on Friday. Um, I, I watched it online the best I could. Um, I tried to watch Wednesday, but that's kind of hard sitting in a Tahoe at a surgery center waiting for a patient, but back and forth. But anyway, so these schools, so I have, I'm going to do it in two ways. We're going to go with schools that were already, everybody knew about, knew about the original ROM. There was $1.27 million worth of ROM, ROM added this weekend. Okay. So, and what these ROMs reflect are additional areas that either the IEP found or we received the reports from the IEP that stated what exactly had to be done, what areas must be removed, that type of thing. Okay. So, Alexander Wilson, ROM went up $75,000. Okay. E.M. Holt. ROM went up $170,000. Highland Elementary. ROM went up $520,000. Southern Alamance High School. ROM went up $120,000. Sylvan, I'm sorry, Southern Middle School. ROM went up 120000 Selvin Elementary School, ROM went up 265000 Yes, sir. Selvin Elementary School. 265000 Yes, sir. So, for example, we're wondering, how, where does these come from? Okay. Selvin Elementary School is a toxic school. Nobody knew that until we got the report back Friday, after Friday night, or we received it Saturday morning. It's a toxic school. Okay. Things got to be done totally different. Southern Alamance High School, toxic school. We just received them reports. Okay. Excuse me, was that, was that in the old part or is that the added on all the bond money that they used to make new classrooms and stuff? Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't have that, but I can get you that answer. Okay. Or, Mr. I can get that answer for you, exactly what was that. Okay. Highland Elementary, the IEP director said that Every wet ceiling tile, that school's got some leaks. That they would not clear for octa for meaning that it air tested and cleared to their standard unless we replaced every wet and damaged ceiling tile in that building. There's a ton. How old is that school? I don't have the dates. Which high on elevation? Two thousand. Twenty three years old. Really? No. Is that right? That's a, that was uh, that was uh, Garrett, I guess, uh, two thousand. They're the newest rounds that we built, Jack Smith and Colin and Garrett. I'm shocked that we would have roof issues at the newest school in the district. Because they're metal. Yeah, I wouldn't be. Mr. Tom would be shocked. There's a lot of brand I mean, schools that are 10 years old. To do. But the amount that's on this. Because I think we've got a 20 year roof. I mean, most people have put 20 year roofs on Yeah, but I don't know if. Yeah. Oh, I'm with, uh, yeah, if it's metal, if it's been lifted, water intrusion. But here's the thing I want everybody to understand. These ROMs are written. These are not lump sum numbers, okay? And so, I, you know, I explained it last Monday, and I hope, you know, if, if not, I'll be glad to re-explain it, how a ROM works in rough order of magnitude, okay? So... I just lay down there. There may be warranty issues and coverage, and we'll ask you guys to get back to picture with Highland. My staff is looking into that already. Thank you. So... There's some additional uh, money that was uh, this weekend was uh, Alamance, Eastern Alamance High School, uh, HVAC, this has a toxic air sample, samples in it, 363000 East Lone Elementary, 170000 these are for HVAC complete so duck and HVAC cleans. Graham High School, 360000 Hall River Elementary, 180000 
Woodlawn Middle School, $255,000. That was what occurred from the reports, the age reports that we received Friday night and Saturday. I got them all. What did you say before East Lawn? I think it was the very first one, maybe. Eastern High School. Eastern High School. Eastern High. And what was that amount? Uh, three hundred sixty-three thousand. Thanks. Return again. Total for Eastern High School. For all of them. A million two seven. Make one point two seven million. Correct. There's two more schools to be added to this list that we'll have the bomb when I get out of here. That they went down is Ray Street and um, hold on, uh, North Grant. Both of them are toxic air samples. So the I say they have to be careful. I will tell you, there's two more, two more schools that will have additional, or I say additional, that haven't had ROMs yet, that we just received reports yesterday, or uh, read, I'm, I would phrase that. They have very small, minor, so Woodlawn Elementary, uh, I mean Woodlawn Middle School has a basement that has to be remediated. It's a small basement, they use it for storage, but it's, it's contaminated. But they have a cafeteria in one wing, so it's nothing huge there. Um, and then uh, I'm going to actually walk Sellers Gun uh, with Mr. Hook to come up with a plan how we can do part of it for the school and the rest of it can be done after hours or when nobody's there. It's a, as my understanding it's a warehouse part and all of that and it needs to be remediated but we don't have to remediate that to get the kids back into school. We can wall it off. And you get the stuff out of that building to take into the school buildings, right? So I, I, I hope not. Well, if it, if anything comes out, it has to be clean and remediated before it goes in. Yeah, you can't take one out of the other. And you mentioned something to me this morning too, as we were coming in. Yes, sir. What are we getting ready to face? Hurricane. I don't know if anybody's seen the update. But we're in the same boat. I swear, I feel like when I come <laughs> to see y'all, I, I, I like coming to see y'all, but not under these circumstances. But there's two storms, and they're predicting both of them over 70 chance of hitting the Carolinas. And I, to be honest, I felt kind of bad because I didn't even know that. Somebody called me. I was telling Mr. Carter, I'm like, I'm just receiver bad news. So um, I, I, I know, look, I'm a taxpayer. I'm a father. The amount of money y'all pay for this remediation is going to pale in comparison to what you're going to have to pay to fix these buildings. I'm just going to tell you. So any other questions, I'll be glad to answer, but... I, just, I don't want y'all to think that this is the this is the grand slam that you're going to pay for. Let me tell you, this is a bump that you're paying for to get them remediated. The amount that it's going to take to pay to get them where they need to be is going to be the, a very large amount. And time. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bess. I have questions. For, yes, sir. Uh, for the, oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to create a structure in my head to how to go through this. Um, 1995, I went down to flight school in Pensacola, and uh, we learned how to do air-to-air -air intercepts. And we, the goal was, depending on what you were trying to do, if you were trying to ID somebody, the goal would be to arrive at somebody, another aircraft six, at a mile and a half. And so you'd set up your intercept based upon your speed and their speed and how fast you were going, and your, the angles that you wanted to, to arrive. And you think you'd have everything suitcased, everything was fine, and something would happen, and your plan would just completely go to pot. And you wouldn't end up a mile and a half behind somebody. The person would get by you, and you messed up your intercept, and you know it was training, so that was fine. I, I feel like over the past week, we have been managing the information that we have in order to end up a mile and a half where we're supposed to be behind the bogey. Um, I feel like things have have changed to the point where 
the, the plans that we were assuming could get us there are, are not contained assumptions that no longer are valid. Um, and part of, part of my frustration about the process that's gotten here is that it's been a lot of amorphous information uh, and changing information um, about what the problem is, where the problem exists, what the process should be to fix it, and the funding. It's, it's come in, and I think, a, into just a data stream that's been difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. What I think we've tried to do is to say, where is this, what is the scope and severity of the problem at each school? How do you tackle that scope and severity, specifically at each school? Um, and I think what, what I need in order to wrap my head around the current situation is a very specific list of every school, of what we have allocated so far. Let's just take Williams High School. Just take it. Because it's, it, that's been an evolving situation. Let's use that as an example for the whole district. So Williams High School, we initially allocated a certain amount of funds for the problem that we understood at Williams High School. Later in the week, we allocated additional funds from an additional source because we had the toxigenic uh, mold and we had to we had to add the HVAC remediation, which was you know the extra measures Mr. Bass was talking about. Um, I, I think we need we need that level of detail for each school. Okay. What existed on Monday? What did we fund through the week? What exists now? How is that different? What additional funding are you recommending based upon those for every single school? Uh, you know, some some funding we've we've allocated was not specific it was a right. bucket what are the true numbers what's left over in terms of is there a refund from that allocation to be put somewhere else is it not uh, and I think we need a get well meeting I don't think we can do that today I think we need a get well meeting to understand where are we and I, I would like information about what what's been done at each school what's not been done at each school what's what needs to be redone if there, if yeah. something needs to be redone, and why is it, is it because of the cleaning of the HVAC? Is it because Mr. Bass's folks need to, to go back because of their, because their efforts fell short? <laughs> I, I think we need to know that level of detail in order to, to be able to legitimately to do our fiduciary duty to the yeah, county. To I say, totally agree. This is what we need. Uh, in terms of airplanes, we're flying this one as we're building it. Of course, uh, things are flying at us. <laughs> we do have a list uh, that we made for our own benefit to, to keep up with this. But we can add some columns about the amount of money and where that money came from. That would be helpful for us too. Uh, that's our goal today when we leave here. Um, I do agree that Mr. Bass is correct. This is a, this, this will get us back to school. But based on what the conversations we've had about the severity of some of these schools, there's a, a bigger challenge ahead of us. So I think, I think what you're trying to get to is how do we fix this? Well, for me, it's it's been it's there are two issues. I mean, all last week, my focus scope and severity, severity of the school to remedy that so that kids can get back into safe schools as quickly as possible, and that has been my sole focus. And the second phase, I think, is is prevention, right? Um, which we do need to we do need to have a you know start laying groundwork for a plan for that. But again, we. We need to know the scope and severity of that. I mean, I think we just need specifics. Totally agree. I, I think today you're right. What can we accomplish today to make sure every school can go back on September 11th? Uh, and that's, that's why I wanted David to be here, because he's the only one that has that information specifically as of today, because, again, things are flying left and right. And some of these reports just came in last night or this morning. So I think we need to get well point. We need to get all this information, gather it, lay it out so everybody can see it, and then, and then move forward. I also, we need to look at our our revenue sources. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's some additional revenue sources that we can talk about. I think we need to understand the the ESSER funds as well. I mean, if we're talking we're talking about a large, large undertaking here, I think we need to understand those ESSER funds. We need to understand what, what application has been made and the justification for the application that the school system made for that funds to be able to understand exactly what's available. This 
I think we put all of that together, all of the potential funding sources, and we can come up with a plan. Uh, I just think in the in the next, I don't know, day or two, we need to have a, a get well point to understand all of this information. That's that's my goal, because it's it's a bit it's a bit tough to manage the data at this moment. Agreed. Mr. Connor. Well. Three. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I have to commend you on a very eloquent presentation there. You covered a lot of bases, same ones that were, I think, in all of our minds. Um, I have to admit, my first primary was, my primary goal was to get the young people back in school, the teachers back in school, and the clean environment as well. Um, and uh, to that vein, uh, I think we've tried to accomplish that. Um, it really bothers me that we're going to be looking at a lot more money, a lot more what, what we've just learned this morning about replacing the equipment, uh, I doubt you'd have a bunch of that sitting in a warehouse someplace. So uh, yeah. there's a lot more on the table that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and, uh, you know, we get criticism from both sides. We have people who tell us, uh, get the schools open, get them safe. We have people who say, don't spend any more money on the schools. Well, you can't do both. I mean, we sit in here and try to find a middle ground trying to find a place to make things work. We've got to try and find a way to make it work for our citizens, for our students, for our teachers. Um, we can't let schools be closed. We don't have enough classroom space as we are. Um, so we've got to find an answer. I think a follow-up meeting is a good idea. Uh, Thursday might work well. I don't know. If you can have the information available, I know your team will still be here, Mr. Bass, at that point in time, so we can get some of the rest of the information. I'm okay with a, uh, a joint meeting again, like we've done in the past. I don't know how the rest of you feel about that. I thought that finally came to some fruitful discussions on Friday. Um, A lot, to, a lot right now to try to digest. Well, not to make light, I went straight to Top Gun Maverick when you said bogey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you go, Craig. Um, I, I just, I just, whatever. It's, it's just one of those things where we just have to suck it up and do the right thing, whatever that is, because we're supposed to. And I appreciate you, Dane. And I, I appreciate your staff. I, I appreciate everybody that's really come to the table to work through this. Because this is, boy, this is overwhelming. Um, but we're going to get through this because we can. And we're going to work together. And that's the big thing about it. And that's really all that matters. Whatever we got to do, we got to do. Because um, you don't operate businesses like this, and we're not going to have school like this. We just can't. I dare say none of us would want to sit in our living room with the water pouring out of the ceiling. Think, why well, I got something. We just got to do better. And prevention, I said this last week, is so much cheaper than intervention. And I'll, I like the fact of having people on site that go behind us because um, when you got a skinny maintenance in number team, it's hard to take care of 38 sites. I like the detention officers in the jail. It's just it doesn't turn out safe. We got to have the numbers to really go in after something, and to train people to do all that. So, yeah, bogey. Mr. Lash. Oh, thank you, Chairman. I think the question that I have is I have a question for Mr. Betts. Uh, last last week in the meeting, in a joint meeting, we heard several. <coughs> things concerning air quality samples. Yes. And it seemed to be that every time this subject came up, it was always, we we're always given a timeline of one to two weeks for the air quality samples to come in. Is that wrong? Yes, sir, that is wrong. What, what is the, what is the uh, air quality samples? How long does something like that take? Are you talking on a normal time on this project? Well, I'm talking about this project, and I just lay it out for you. Um, I spoke to several industrial hygienists, and they walked me through the process. Yeah. And the way I understood it was, is uh, that you remediate, and then you come in and you take air samples throughout the building. And those air samples, I was told by the hygienists, are pretty much quick. They're much quicker than a, a, a week. And that's the reason I wanted to focus okay. in on that. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure. So, that so let me explain this. There's, there's Three parts of what you asked. Yes, sir. Okay. 
So the pretest, which is done, so f so the pretest, they're done surface tests and air samples throughout the school. Okay. Then random tests are then taken to a lab. Yes, it takes a lot longer to read pretests than they do clinch tests, and the reason why is there's a lot more to read. There's a lot more matter. There's a lot more spores. There's a lot more everything to read. Right. An average analyst on pretest per person can only read 30 slides per day on average. Okay. So they're not just reading Alamance County Schools. They're reading everybody's. And there's not that many labs, right? So on this project, taking two days, three days, and the lab people don't work like you know we do 24-7. So they take Friday afternoon off, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So two days, right? Clearance test, the way that this firm has it set up, we're receiving clearance data back from them in 12 hours. Okay? So, oh yeah, yeah, these, so if you're asking how it would happen up front, I'd be glad to explain that if it was in a, if it ever was to happen again. Well, Mike, I was only trying yeah. to focus in yeah. on that, I, we both agree that one to two weeks is probably that's not true much. yeah that's uh, not yeah. yeah they can be overnight and you get them the next morning or like here now this IEP now we get them in 12 hours so literally whatever they took this morning we may have the answers this afternoon or at the latest by eight o'clock in the morning okay. so the clinic stuff will be so that's the reason why uh, they actually can clear up uh, Saturday and Sunday and they have answers the same day so that way, the, the ABSS will have a clearance report from a, their IEP on every school. And as soon as my company gets a clearance, we have the climate control part still in place, so it doesn't go back. But we give the school back to they get the staff back in there and do whatever they need to do to get prepared for the kids. So it's not like we hold them to the end and say, here's all of them at one time. If we have six to pass today, they're going to get them back tomorrow. Okay. If we have eight to pass tomorrow, they're going to get them back. That'll be 14. I mean, that's how it works. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that no, quality right. samples are, uh, takes less time. And, oh, yeah. and I think if we, I just saw this week, there's probably no way you could get it back in school. No, no, no. Following no, Monday. No, no. So I thought it, maybe the air quality. Yeah, so a, a normal pretest, analyst reads usually 30 in a day. <laughs> Clearance test, they can read 55 to 70 in a day. Because it doesn't, I mean, the slides look like this versus, you know, they don't have as much because the air is clean. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Not right now. Dr. Bauer. I'm not sure whether we can wait until our next meeting, two weeks, whether we need to meet again. I do not want to meet back at ABSS. My wife and I both have runny noses and whatever <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons meeting in your facility. That building's not been tested yet. <laughs> so I request that our next meetings be here, not there. Okay. Um, one. But two, how quickly we've got to have a change in what ABSS has been doing for years. How soon can you come back to us with recommendations and assurances that those changes will be made, such as, you know, I know Whole River Elementary is a great example. We funded that same roof project and removal of, of the brick fascia and mold remediation and replacement. 2015, when I was on the board, that was one year. I'm told 2017, I don't know that to be factual. I think again in 2021, we have monies going to the school system or designated for specific projects and it not happening. Can we, one, get your list of what has to happen? Two, how are you going to change your maintenance, your inspections, your whatever? And three, assurances that if we give you the money, that it's going to happen. I think that's very fair, very fair request. I would like to mention my How opinion. How soon can we get that? Um, we'll start working on that immediately. Uh, I want to go back to the air being off in the summer. Uh, I do remember when I was here in previous roles, I think it was 08, 
that the, the board, the school board at that time did approve that as an energy efficient plan uh, to cut off the air in the, the summers to save money. Well, obviously that was a pretty bad idea. <laughs> now, let's face it. Yeah, now, when I returned yeah, last summer, sure when I returned last change. summer and visited some yeah. rooms, yeah, I didn't we, even realize that. Yeah. And now I do, so we but, won't do but, it again. We commissioners don't make those decisions. I'm, I'm owning, Mr. Pose, I'm owning yes. the fact Thank that ABSS you. made a bad decision in 2008. Right. That shouldn't have happened. Yeah, I, I wasn't paying about. attention like I am now because I was a superintendent. Right. But I do remember that. And I remember last summer when I first got back here, the schools I went into, I did not notice the the climate being any different. Mr. Hook has informed me that not every school had that situation, that scenario, but one is too many. So since July 1, 2023, the air and heat or whatever is going to be running. That's that. Well, I, I agree with you guys, that was not a good call. Yeah, let me apologize. I did not mean to, I'm not trying to, but we're getting tons of emails, tons of calls. I mean, voicemails you would not believe about we, the county commissioners close the schools. And obviously we don't have anything to do with that. Um, and you guys have total responsibility and thank goodness you do. And thank goodness we don't. Uh, but I think the general public needs to understand that there's a clear line between county commissioner responsibilities and school board responsibilities. And too often the lines are confused. They blur, they blur. We get a lot of calls about, uh, um, you know, why don't you fix this? Well, that's, that's capital, and they, uh, lots of people don't understand how that works. So hopefully between the two of us, we'll uh, educate as we move forward. Thank you. How soon can we come back with answers to those issues? Uh, well, as Mr. Turner said, and like Mr. Carter too, uh, today, my hope was whatever amount that Mr. Bass needs to get this done, you guys can discuss that, and then whenever we have the next meeting, um, you know, we'll do our best to bring something towards to the, the, the group the joint meeting to talk about what we think the future looks like with accountability. I think we had, when we left the meeting Friday, I believe we had provided about $750,000 in excess funding through the uh, penny plan. And, and my staff had been working on the numbers trying to figure out exactly what is needed since Friday. And Mr. Bass's number that he uh, released earlier, uh, we have not had time to talk about that prior to this meeting. And I believe you said 1.275. That was just an increase. And that was an increase. So you want to you want to speak about what is left? Yes. That, that's my priority right now. So, so just the the increase was the HVAC and the ROM increases from the weekend. Um, so which was. Actually, there were some schools added from the weekend, too, because of the report. And if y'all want them, I'll be glad to give you them. So AO Elementary, 155000 That's a partial remediation. Uh, EM Yoda, 27000 Partial remediation. Graham Middle School, 560000 Grove Park Elementary, 360,000. All this was happening, this is 9293, so this was after. Uh, Highland Middle School started out as $15,000. Okay, so just, that, that was 92. And then it had the large ROM that was added to it. Hillcrest Elementary, 565,000. North Graham Elementary, 350,000. Pleasant Grove Elementary, 185,000. Race Street Academy, 225,000. Smith Elementary, 300,000. Southern Alamance High School started out at 92 and then had a ROM increase at 120. So, just so we. So the numbers I just gave you was the original ROM, but all of that happened, transpired Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And the reason why is these reports were just provided. They just got them. So um, that's where that comes from. 
And unfortunately, like I said in the beginning, we only received reports on 16 schools. The other 16 schools had very brief summaries, a sentence or two, versus a full protocol report. So there's a lot more that has to be done to figure out what's wrong. You have to get an IEP to go back out there to write it and do everything to get that information. Dr. Baldwin, can you be ready in two weeks? Two weeks? To meet back and discuss more funding. In two weeks? In two weeks. I think that's very fair to do that. Much better than two days. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I, uh, that's a at long Ms. time uh, of damage that can continue to happen. Don't we need to meet sooner than two weeks? Well, I, I, I'm assuming you mean two weeks to talk about a long-term plan. Exactly. I think it's going to take us a little time to get there. What, what I want or need, I guess, is assurance that Mr. Bass can move forward with the schools he just mentioned, and that means money for you guys. We don't have it. And but we don't have numbers yet. Well, our numbers. He just gave you the numbers. They keep moving daily. Okay. They just moved again. And we need hard numbers. We just gave us a million. $1.275 million. Yeah. That's what, as of right now, you need, builder services need. So, so you have two different things. You have what's happened on that. Grand total. Oh, okay. So HVAC's $2,027,750. The ROM increase was 1270000 and the amounts, the schools that were done uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, rough math, because I don't, Mr. Commissioner Lashley probably has it already, already figured out, but the ROMs I just give for uh, 155, 27, 560, 360, 15, 350, 185, 225, 300, 92, 4. Do you have a time? 2,834,000. I knew he would have it. 2,834,000. What a new, uh, the, the one you just gave us for, nine, two to nine, four. Yes, sir. That's just the original loan, and then you have the increase of 1,000,000, because right. the increase was from other schools, and then you have HVAC cleaning, and there's two more schools, which are smaller, Ray Street and North Graham. Lord, I think we have two or three choices. One, it is basically one o'clock. We can readjourn later today, or we can postpone for two weeks. We can postpone for one week. We can postpone for another period of time. What is this board's preference? I think we need to take a recess and reconvene. Yeah, we don't, we don't need to postpone. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to take a recess and reconvene today. Uh, let me tell you this, and this is my frustration. I, I have dug into these numbers. I have dug into the allocations for each school. I'm completely lost as I sit here right now about the scope and the severity of the mold remediation issues required for each school that we've talked about. I'm lost. And I've studied this probably more than half, you know, more than most people in the county. I, I, need a sh I need a spreadsheet. I need to see what I, what we just talked about before. I'm happy to reconvene today, but I've, I've got to see that in order to understand where we are. And I just don't understand where we are right now. And how we got there. Yeah. And I may be a Presbyterian, but I'm going to say amen, brother, anyhow. <laughs> uh, Coming into the Baptist territory here, bro. I, I'm not sure how long it's going to take Mr. Hook or Mr. Butler or Ms. Evans to come up with actual numbers. And the numbers, again, keep moving. Um, staff, any suggestion? I would definitely like to review the numbers before we were to reconvene because several of the numbers that Mr. Bass gave us were projects that had been approved at the Friday's meeting. Um, when we were talking through the other, I believe it was the six schools, I did agree with his $1.2 million. However, when we get into HVAC numbers, that was an additional 1.3. So I think we definitely need to have some conversations. How much time do you need? Uh, however long they need. Because I would need to get their figures and then just take a quick look. Dr. Butler? Well, 
you have what I have right now because of this being a crisis. I've not had time to sit down and look at this. Uh, we've worked all weekend. Mr. Bass has been very responsive. The numbers he just gave you, I believe Mr. Rogers was writing some things down as well as probably Mr. Hook. Um, we can confirm the numbers. My goal was the new projects that were not approved on Friday, so after Friday's meeting until now, the brand new schools that need remediation, either full or partial, plus the additional revisions to the ROMs already in place. Those two things are the monies that are needed for Mr. Bass Builder Services to finish out and get us in school on the 11th. I'm totally with you, Mr. Turner. Uh, we can go back to our spreadsheet, make another column, and add the things you're asking for, the amount of money that has been spent on each school. We can do that. That won't be a problem. That will be pretty quickly done, I think. I think we need a, what's already been spent, what's being proposed to be spent, and what the new total looks like it's going to be. What time frame do you need to get it to our personnel, and then they need time to review it as well? I might need a day at least. Okay. I, I just think I can. Okay. You're not leaving, right? Well, no, okay. I live here. <laughs> no, I, mean, no, I, mean, I, I, mean, I just want to make sure you're not leaving. Yeah, I mean, I live here. Okay. I mean, I live turn this, road. turn this into a night meeting. I mean, yeah. 6, 6 30. Tonight. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure we have time to get it right. I, we're, this is all, this on the fly here. Um, we will do whatever this board desires, and we'll try to make it work. It sounds like we have asked for a day, but if you need a night meeting tonight, well, I'm just, I, I don't want to lose progress. But I, 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 well, let me can I, can I ask a quick question, Mr. Bass. I think I'm hearing you say you're going to keep moving. It, oh, I, we, we're going to keep moving. Okay. We're, we're going to work. I mean, if we have to work 24 hours a day, we're going to keep working. We're not stopping, like, just to say, but, you know. Do you think you can have the numbers by 630 tonight? I think we're talking about a quick conversation of just totaling some, okay. some numbers. Uh, I just want to you sure. folks have uh, been, our county staff has worked overtime last week, and I just want to make sure that you have as much time as you need. I didn't want to put any extra pressure on you, because I know you have other county business you have to take care of. No worries. I think it's totally unrealistic to say, we're back at 2 o'clock and here's the number. I think, one, you can't get us the information that quickly. Two, we can't review it that quickly. Um, I'm thinking possibly, I'm just picking something out of the air. 6.30 Wednesday night, possibly. That would give you guys Tuesday and throughout the day Wednesday. But we've got to review it. You know, if you hand it to us at 5 o'clock on Wednesday, we're going to postpone our meeting. So you're proposing tomorrow night at 6.30? No, Wednesday night. Well, I didn't, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm thinking two days. I'm trying to give you guys some time. So tomorrow would work for you? Like 20, 24 right. hours, or you want to do it tomorrow morning? You want to do it this afternoon? Basically, what I need to see is here the pro here through the course of last week when we were presented figures, here were initial costs. If those ROMs have increased, here's that additional increase. Because Commissioner Turner is correct, at a couple of those meetings, additional funding was uh, budgeted and approved. So we just need to get those costs and find out here's the true additional that's needed at this time. So I really don't think it's a long, drawn-out process. It's just taking, the, taking those base numbers, having that difference column, and then evaluating that figure to the amount of money that we know has been allocated. Can like everybody be ready there, 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 there were extra funds yeah. within there. Yeah. So, like I said, I think it's a real quick conversation, whether that be direct with building services or working through ABSS staff. We can do it today. So we can do it today. My, my board chair is saying as soon as possible. Two tomorrow. hours. I think they need the money I think two hand. hours would be decision. Can you get lunch so it's tomorrow, tomorrow evening? I'll take a 15 minute lunch. <laughs> <laughs> take as much time as you need. I got them. Yeah, that would be great. Ms. Yeah. York said that she thought they could do it today. I don't know. 
do it today. We could do it today. We could do it. So we're just going to take a long bathroom right to 3 o'clock. Uh, yeah. Does that sound good? Does 3 o'clock work for ADSS? Does that give you enough time, Susan? That will give me plenty of time. Okay. Uh, one of the problems I see in this, though, That's is we seem important. to have a constantly moving number. Well, it's going to continue. So where do we go if we get it? If we get something today at 3 o'clock, where are we Friday? I think we need to make some decisions about larger pots of money. We keep dancing around the exactly. ESSER issue, and I think we need to settle on pushing the use of those funds to give them a large chunk of money so that we're not having this conversation on the daily. So, I, I, Commissioner Carter, that's a great question, and we face that a lot in my industry. And I want the best way I can explain it to you is you had a plane crash. You got 250 people on it. What do they need? You're a doctor. What do each one of them need? You got to save their life before you figure out what they got. Okay? Because one right now may have a broken leg, but when you're working on him, guess what? You figure out he's got a heart attack, you got to have quadruple bypass. So I will tell you right now, that number is going to grow. Right. I can tell you that. Can I stand here at this minute and tell you it'll grow by 10%, 12%? I can't tell you that, but I will tell you point blank, that number will grow. Because we've gone from a plane crash to getting everybody stable. So now we've got to do surgery, some specialized surgery on some patients to save their life. So it, that's the sort of number. So it's not like a normal construction job. You say, how much does it cost to hang that door? Well, I think it's going to be X. That's what it costs. It doesn't work that way in this. And unfortunately, this is like going into the mercy room and they're trying to figure out what's wrong with you. Triage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because the reporting that we got on half of these schools does not work. So now there's another IEP team in here telling us exactly, writing the exact prescription, okay? Because I don't believe that the fox should watch the hen house, and I don't think it's fair for me to go in and dictate what needs to be done, okay? So that's what's happening is, is now there's an IEP team that's right now exactly what needs to be done on half these schools. That's the reason why the numbers grow. And Commissioner Turner, I absolutely agree with you, and that information you're requesting, I can work with them. And, and get it out, and you may be able to get it at 3 o'clock today, because I had it. Mr. Chair, I, the manager is correct, and Mr. Turner has asked uh, about this, but I think we need to get some answers from the schools related to ESSER and where those funds have been committed, when they were committed, how they're committed, and if they're available to spend on the projects we're talking about now. Because the scope and the magnitude of the project has expanded so exponentially that those funds need to be in play if they're available. I'm in total agreement. Can you have those that sort of funds, what you spent, where you spent it, and so forth to, to gather at 3 o'clock? Mr. Rogers, will speak to that really quickly. Mr. Chair, members of the board, of course, we've gotten several uh, bits of information from DPI and from our state leaders as well. It, it appears we can work with our plan. Um, it just really comes to the available funding that's available within that at certain ESSER pod. Um, the majority, of course, we have a portion, I think, which was discussed before, the 20% that is, needs to be allocated for learning loss as required with using that ESSER money. The remaining, we have a small portion that's still available. I think it's around a million dollars. The rest of, rest of that money is dedicated to the, the HVAC uh, plan, which I know has been discussed at length. Um, so that's there. Um, and anything to make those changes, we would have to change the application or amend the application, which is available um, from what the state leaders have provided to us. Can you have those ready at 3 o'clock? Have the changes? No, the, the have numbers. the numbers. Oh, the numbers. Well, this, yes. it's about it's $26 million for the HVAC plan. I provided that at a uh, previous meeting last we week. I think there was a gap. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, we need those provided again. And I okay. want to know where those ERSA monies have gone. You had, what, $100 million? It's going to take a lot of time. Yeah. Well, if we're just focusing on the application that they most recently submitted on the 18th, I think we could get a breakdown of what was applied, and then it's a discussion about what we could amend from that application to get some 
quick funding available to move forward. Yeah, I don't think anybody's suggesting no. use of the $26 million that's already no. allocated towards HVAC. I think what we had seen on Monday was that there was a gap between eight million or about mm -hmm. between the total that still remains and that which is dedicated yeah. toward ESSER. And of that eight, uh, I understand there's some different restrictions, but I, th I think that is the pot that is yes. even possible. So yes, as a, as a, as a potential I, source, I think your eight million number though includes that twenty percent required. Does. Yes, I think it and does. And so that left us with about a million um, that we we could um, fund or use different different ways if need be. It was kind of uh, it was left my understanding as part of the plan as um, in case for that HVAC project because it was so large. But I mean, obviously we can look at that and and if. if uh, I'd be interested in seeing the application itself. We keep talking about it theoretically, but I'd like to see it. Just a copy of the application that was submitted. Okay. I think that's public record, but yeah. Absolutely. Can you be ready at three o'clock? I will do my best, sir. <laughs> we know where you are. <laughs> not going We've been there before. <laughs> 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 Can we do 3.30? Is it 1.06 right now? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Lashley suggested exactly the okay. same. Okay. You bring your school bell. That's what you yeah, We still have a little school more adjourning hours, but we're going to push through that to our 3.30 adjournment. Is that correct? Everybody agree? Um, I was wondering, do we, I don't see but one or two people here. We might have a comment that addresses the comment that was being made earlier. Do we want to go to that? So that they don't have to come back at three thirty unless they want to. Oh, they can pick it up online. Uh, okay, that's kind of going to be one of my board comments about people waiting to t for us to talk back to them because when they come here, they want the answer right then. That's just being respectful, and they have to wait here at night. And we can talk about that, but I think if they've been some comments, we need to answer them right now. Because they're not here for all this other stuff. They, as far as all the stuff we're going to have to do to get numbers and all that, they are in a sense. But they would like to have some answers or comments from us. Yeah, we were having four, five, six-hour meetings, and we changed the procedure. I and know that, but if we have to have ten-hour meetings, that's <laughs> what we ran for office to one, do. One thing I'd say, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. That, that, that may may deserve some comment before we break is that I know Davenport representative is here. I don't know if he's prepared to stay later or not, but if he's here, to the extent we want to. So this is Mr. Ted Cole from Davenport who's joining us. We had asked for him to update the um, the school debt affordability model and we have sent you a copy of that. He can speak to you know the impact of drawing down additional bond funds on our model. Well, I'm happy to stay if that would be a better timing for you all. Susan has copies of the update to distribute. Sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. Susan, this is August 30th draft on the cover. Yes. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Ted Cole with Davenport. So we have been working with staff over the last week or so to update specifically the ABSS capital model. Remember, there's a county capital model, a school, and a community college. What you have in front of you, which should be dated August 30th on the cover, it says draft. 
was the latest iteration of the update to the school capital funding plan um, where we have worked with staff to bring it current for, although unaudited, you know, final FY23 figures as it relates to where did sales tax actually come in, things like that, that, you know, we project certain revenues or uh, in our model, and every year when the data is available, we update it. So this reflects the most current information we have for FY23 results and FY24 budget, the budget you all adopted fairly recently, and then projections going forward, which are consistent with what we've always projected. Um, the long and short of it is the remaining ABSS bonds that are authorized by the voters but yet unissued, yet to be issued, of about $19.5 million, you all could issue that debt. This particular analysis um, assumed that it would be issued in the spring of 24. We actually ran one this morning. I don't have a hard copy. You could issue it as early as this fall if you wanted to, and the, and the model would work. In other words, the revenues that we have identified collectively as being available to support the capital plan for ABSS are adequate. Um, we're using a 5% borrowing rate on the debt. If you wanted to issue that remaining debt as early as this fall, certainly works if you wait until the spring. I'm not sure exactly how that ties into your ongoing discussions about funding for everything that was talked about, but that was the context of what's here. Um, with that, that that capacity, that affordability exists within the ABSS model. I don't know, Susan or Heidi, anything more you would want to? No, the only problem we get this presentation now is we just had all of our school staff and personnel, some of the board members leave. They need to be privy to this information, I think, as well. So that, send them a copy. <laughs> I agree, Mr. Lashley. This and won't be the only conversation no. that no. we have about and, this. And page two, it's the third page of the PDF, is the page that you would want to look at. Let me just reorient you quickly to this as you work from left to right. And remember, this model goes all the way back to 2019. We've purposely tried to keep a, a record uh, of how things have evolved. So. B, column B, is all the debt that you have issued and committed to for ABSS to date. It's existing debt. Column C is that new $19.5 million that you could issue. This particular page assumes you issue it this coming spring. And you'll see in column C that the payments start in FY25. If you issued this fall, you might have a payment next spring, but we verified this morning that that would work, and I can get you a hard copy of that. But for now, just assume this is issued in the spring. Column D is the PAYGO capital. It's cash-funded improvements. And you can see what those dollars have been in recent years, $11.4 million in 2023 with a, 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 appropriate, a budget appropriation or a budget amendment, you're at $10.8 million estimated for 24. I don't know how that ties into this ongoing discussion about what you're funding. That 10.8 figure, commissioners, does take into account the 7.5 that has been <coughs> approved and appropriated from capital reserve balance for mold remediation. So the 7.5 plus the 3.3 PAYGO gets us to the 10.8. Thank you. So the cap funds the 3.3 pay go into the capital reserve, and then it goes out of the capital reserve to ABSS. It's paid directly from the general fund, but those figures are incorporated into this model so that we're showing that we are able to sustain that capital funding. Right, the 3.3 being the baseline and then the additional. So, right. so nothing changes? Nothing changes, okay. nothing changes. So in that F column D, FY24, there is some money that have recently been mm -hmm. appropriated beyond the original $3.3 million. So column E is just adding all of those things up. Existing debt, new debt, and pay-as-you-go capital. The middle of the page, F through L, are all the sources of funding 
that have been identified for the ABSS capital program. And so you've got some federal subsidies, uh, big dollars, Article 40 and 42 sales tax. You can see how those have evolved over time. Uh, FY23 ended at about 11.1. 24 budget was a little over 12. And then we revert back 25 and beyond to a little over 8 million, which is a planning number. You've been well above that in recent years, but at this stage, the decision's been made, let's go back to the original planning, not knowing what the future might hold. Stay conservative. Yes, sir. Lottery funds under column H, it's been at that number for some time. You've been at or above that number, maybe a couple of years, a tad below it, that million four fifty nine. dollars um, I believe any excess um, that you might collect in lottery funds we were, we're not capturing any excess. Where if there was access in a prior year, that's either been spent or it's accumulating at the state in a lottery fund. And there are some dollars at the state in the lottery fund that may come in play here. I don't know how that will be handled, but um, there may be some additional dollars in lottery funds. Um, column I is a, goes back to a qualified school construction bond. That's small dollars. J is the tax rate dedicated to the ABSS plan. You'll remember when all of this, the referendum, everything was adopted, there were, um, footnote five, there was 3.71 pennies dedicated, and in this most recent budget, um, that was reduced, with the reval and whatnot, that was reduced to 2.71 pennies. So that's column J, K is some small dollars, some interest earnings. So L sums everything up. M is comparing the dollars going out in E, payments, versus the revenue coming in in L. M is the sort of the sum of those two, and you'll see we're positive, some years we're negative. Where we're negative, that's where we're using that capital reserve over in column R. And our check here is that column R never goes to zero. It minimum balance is about a million dollars. So that was sort of the takeaway in my comment earlier that that new debt could be issued in column C. We're using a 20-year term, 5% interest rate, which is a bit higher than current market, and if you will, the model cash flows. We don't go negative. But there's not a lot of room. There's not a lot of excess capacity um, within this model for additional debt in the near term. Speaking of additional debt, um, is it possible to get a premium on the $19.5 million issuance? Yes. Not guaranteed, but possible. Maybe 10%. Maybe 10%, uh, a couple million dollars. Um, would, would that be, would the model cover that? That the, our 5% interest rate should cover that. Why? Because your actual interest rate, as we measure it, it's called a TIC today, would be about 4%. Right. So we, and if you didn't take the premium right. from the bond issue, you would be paying debt service at about 4%. If you right. took the premium, that kicks you into a higher interest rate that's based on the coupon, and you're going to be closer to 5%. Okay. So you, you, you would, you it through, it'll be your choice. Now, if... Um, this is just ABSS's piece Correct. of the Davenport plan. That's right. So we're getting ready to issue some bonds uh, for ACC. Correct. This is completely separate from what we're talking about today. The issuance of those bonds doesn't impact this presentation. That's that at all. Accurate? Correct. But the county were to issue bonds for its own, not, not bond, but it means take debt for its own capital needs. It doesn't affect this. Not at all. Okay. When the model was created, um, we had the intent to keep them as three separate. Um, there was discussion about having one pot, um, but we thought it would be in the best interest of each agency, meaning county, school system, as well as ACC, to keep them separated so that when one entity is having an issue, it's not impacting the other two. If we take the premium and or additional monies, what, if any effect, will that have on the rate for ACC? Which rate are you referring to? 
the uh, interest rate. Yes. I mean, in the current market, a 20-year financing would be under a sort of a single interest rate um, number would be about four percent, and and that's true um, if you don't take the premium. So you take 19 and a half million. If you want to take 22 million, if you got a premium, your annual debt service would be closer to five percent. Still cost the taxpayers. Well, you're getting more money, um, so it, it it's. I don't think one is better than the other; they're just different. But it's also an additional one percent interest. Yes. Now, in order to for the bonds to issue, don't. We have to have contracts in hand, or, con or bids complete, and contract the, the actual sum. Yeah, with the and that's that's uh, that's driven by the local government commission, and and that's a, at this for this type of debt, you're dealing with the staff. You're not going to the actual commission itself. These bonds have already been approved by the local government commission. Right. If if and when you want to issue, you've got to work through staff, and it's they have discretion to hold. Um, you know, to hold to that guidance of bids in hand before you can sell bonds or give you some latitude. What staff? What staff do you mean? Local government commission staff, Local government commission as staff. opposed to the commission itself, which is the the body that takes the uh, action. And staff typically requires bids in hand, yes. actual dollar amounts, which would require. So we can't just go to the bond issue, you know, in October and say we want all this money. No, no, no. We, there's a process, the school system would have to get bids, yes. know what the scope of the project is, have, have a contract for each, each thing that they're asking for, and that this could fund at that point. That's so when we're talking about timeline, it, it may be that spring of 24 is, is as close as realistically you can even get. Yep. And I, what I would say on that, I think it's important, um, is staff has some discretion over that. The, 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 the guiding rule is when you want to borrow money, you have bids and permits in hand. They are able to make exceptions if they see the facts and circumstances to support that. And we have done situations before where we've said, look, we've got $19 million of bonds to sell, but we got $30 million of projects, so bids in hand become less critical because there's enough, more than enough projects to spend money on. So I would just say, it's it's worth a conversation with the LGC staff with your specific situation to determine what they will and won't do. So their goal for their requirement is not uh, that the, that, the, that they know the exact amount for each project, but that there are enough projects to to use the money so you're not spending the money on something else. That's right, and and they want to make sure you're. In this case, it's a little tricky because the LGC is already, the commission has approved it. You're not going back to the commission. They've already said that these bonds are going to be issued and your amount is adequate but not excessive. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think you're right. They just want to know this money has a home, that you've got the ability to spend it within three years. That's kind of the initial test that um, bond attorneys and others would say is you've got an expectation reasonable expectation to spend it within three years and at the LGC level um, they just want to know you're not over borrowing or under borrowing um, and if you have a list of projects where you can s spend the money until you're done it's not all one project they don't want you building three quarters of a building but if you have many two million dollar projects you just stop when you're done. I'm not saying that they will buy into that, but that is within the staff's purview to make that decision if they determine that it's important. And this is pretty important. This is high, high level process. This goes to the reason for having fund balance in the first place and setting a target of having 20% and maybe looking at a higher target. Um, we've got about a 20% fund balance right now. Does a reimbursement resolution work here for us to use fund balance funds to address some of these projects and then reimburse ourselves when the bonds are issued? 
when that decision, when the board would make the decision that you didn't want to pursue that route and issue the 19.5 million, then just like today, we would go through the logistics and have the board adopt that resolution because there's a certain time frame from when that resolution is issued to the time that the bonds are actually issued that you can claim reimbursement. So we would have to make sure that we were staying within those parameters and then working with the LGC to get the bonds so that they could be spent within that three years. And, and there's another parameter. You want to make sure that if you're going to do that, whether it's from these geo bonds or some other debt, doesn't matter, that you you have that reimbursement resolution adopted ideally within, uh, I think it's 30 or 60 days of having spent the money. So that's an important consideration. Or spend the money today, spend the money today, you, you, you need to have a reimbursement resolution done within 30 days. Okay. That gives you a little bit of a look back, saying, hey, we didn't adopt our resolution until October 1, but we've got that 30-day look back. We can re reimburse ourselves for some money we spent as early as September 1. Okay. Plan ahead. Yeah, and the use of these funds is governed by the scope that the voters approved in 2018. That's correct. So the 19.5, if the board should choose to issue those bonds, those funds would not be able to... Mold, uh, fund mold remediation. However, HVAC roof projects would fit within that scope. Any other questions? I think we're voting to get a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm happy to stay if you think it might be helpful. Do you think we need Chad for this afternoon? I think we're focused more on the project cause right. at this point. This is everything so. you need? Yeah. Okay. We want to thank you. Okay, great. Thank, yeah. you. Yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Good thank seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thanks, sir. I hope, I hope, I got a feeling maybe we're trying to all get in the same boat finally. <laughs> Uh, let's just make sure the name of the boat isn't Titanic, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have a motion to uh, so so move? Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We're back in session. I uh, had a chance to talk to our financial director, Susan Evans, just before this meeting. My understanding was that the ABSS were going to give us numbers of what has been taken care of, what has not been taken care of, and, and titles before this meeting. That has not happened. Mr. Mayor, Mayor just walk in with Okay, walk. would you please give them to our financial director, and we will have to be on hold waiting on your number. Guys, I'm going to take a, what do you need, 10 minutes to put a new spreadsheet together? Um, about five minutes will be fine. Right, we're going to take a five minute break. Mr. Walker, I think you have an announcement. Walker? Um, yeah, for those who are watching this morning, we had a technical difficulty with the sound so that when we republish it in the next day, we have a backup recorder it'll be a little more clear for those folks. We did fix it halfway through. Uh, it should be fine for this session. We apologize for the inconvenience, but the restored version will be up within a day, and uh, everybody can watch it uh, at their leisure. Thank you. Hey, Bruce. If we want to project something, can you do that for us? Yeah. Just send it to you. Yep. All right, I'll send it shortly. And additionally, one of our speakers, uh, I'm getting an echo. You're good. Yep. All right. We turn um, you on. About no one at the diversion center. That might be because it's not open yet. Right. <laughs> uh, but anyway. One or two cars, that's construction. <laughs> Guys, he was talking about RHA. What's located at the end RHA of the road behind the diversion center? Yes. It, well, it's what's going to be in the diversion center, right. but that's where we consider that being diversion right now. So it's at the back of the mall, down there on the end. 
it used to be on its cares. Yeah, that's where RHA operates. And this was right. right. It's where the uh, current yeah. facility is, but it's uh, shorter hours it's all kinds of things. Yeah. Just uh, it's a shorter hours. Yeah. 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 I don't remember which speaker it was this morning, but I want them to know that Virgin Center we're having an open house. What is the date for the open house? It's like November. Have we announced a date? Mm -hmm. No. I don't think we've announced a date yet. Okay, we don't have a date even yet. <laughs> okay. And we're waiting on a spreadsheet. Sorry, I wish we had gotten your ABSS numbers before the meeting was called. Best we oh, could do. Yeah. Sorry. We're here. It's all there. I feel like this is very helpful. While we're waiting, I do have a question. Um, some of these HVAC cleanings, and Mr. Bass, you and I talked during the break. <clears throat> Um, are being replaced. We already have the money money funded to replace some of these HVAC systems that are currently to be or are being cleaned. I guess, Dr. Butler, this is your question. Can we do some shifting of building, shifting of whatever, to get students back in the classroom and go ahead and not clean the to be replaced soon? HVAC systems, what's, what's the story there? I'm not aware of which school you might be referring to. I know that Pleasant Grove has a brand new system and we're not going to touch that. It's still being installed. <coughs> um, so outside of that, I'm not sure which schools you may be referring to. Mr. Bass, can you? The, the IEP, so the industrial hygienist stated that the, and it's written, that the schools that had toxic, toxic mold, the system had to be cleaned before they would actually clear it with an air test and give the approval for people to be back to reoccupy that school. Can you tell us which schools that are going to be replaced anyway? I don't know what's going to be replaced. I, I don't have, I know what schools going to be cleaned, but I don't know what schools going to be replaced. Is there any way we can determine that? But I will tell you, the IEP is clearly stated, if they're not clean, they will not give a clearance for that school for anybody to be back in. I'm saying that we're replacing the HVAC system anyway, and we don't even know which schools. Mr. Hook is looking that up right now. Uh, Two different things. In terms of this crisis, 16 schools have been said to have toxigen and mold. Those air ducts there and HVAC has to be serviced. That's where we kind of drew the line with what we're, rec we're asking for in terms of full cleaning. But in terms of replacing HVACs, are you referring to other capital funds that we're using to do that? You have designated mm -hmm. uh, capital funds for HVAC replacement. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, which of those schools that have HVAC replacement, the money's already set aside, mm -hmm. are being cleaned before they're replaced? Uh, and if that's an issue, we want to get the kids back in school, can we not shift them to maybe a shifted schedule with other schools, do something to get the kids back in school? I hate to spend, pick a number, half a million dollars to clean HVAC and then destroy it and replace it. I don't know how to answer your question right now because I'm not sure which schools we're referring to. In terms of going back to school, our intentions are everyone's back on Monday. September oh, I'm, uh, clearly I'm saying so, Mr. It. Hook, any idea? Yeah, he's referring to the ESSER projects. Okay. And, uh, you want to come up here? Yes. <laughs> so I'm looking up the schools here. I'm missing one of them. Does it say specifically HVAC? Mm -hmm. It is. It's HVAC. Um, so we do have uh, HVAC projects going at eight different schools. Uh, I'll read the name of the schools. Williams, South Graham, East Lawn, Turrentine, Western Middle, South Mevin, Broadview, uh, and AO. Um, so um, the situation with those is all the equipment's not here. We're putting in some ducting work at, uh, at some of the schools, but uh, all the equipment's not here. So uh, 
we need to run with the current systems that we have. So uh, we have one, all the school the equipment's not here for any of the schools. Part of it is like the ducts, but not the units that go overhead. Uh, but this is not complete redo of the HVAC system. For example, at Williams, they're going to run some fresh air ducts down the hallway, but that will not replace the ducts that need to be clean. So that has to be clean. In fact, that was already done. Oh, let me slow you down there. Yes. So those new, the new duct work will have to be cleaned again when you get the new HVAC in. Um, no, sir, I don't think so. I mean, at Williams right now, they're, you know, they've cleaned uh, the HVAC system there, the existing HVAC, which will remain, but we're putting fr a fresh air system into Williams. So it's separate ducting that will run down the hallways that does not connect to the existing ducting. We'll have two, two separate ducting systems. That's one of the schools at which we're talking about cleaning uh, ducts now. Uh, another one is East Lawn, uh, and that project, those, uh, the equipment won't be in until February. At the earliest, we need to start school there now. Um, let's see. Uh, in Broadview, they've already cleaned uh, the ductwork there, but that was new, new equipment there in Broadview. Mr. Can you just repeat those um, again? I think yes. I just missed a few. You said eight. Yes, eight eight schools that are part of the ESSA project. Would you like me to read them again? Yes, sir, please. Thank, slow, Thank you. Slow, slow, please. Yes. <laughs> Williams High School, South Grand, East Long, Return Time, Western Middle, South Mevin, Broadview, Altamaha, Ospi, AM. So that's part of that twenty-six million dollar contract with the Astro Funds. On those eight, which will be replaced first? Well, they're piece milling it based on the uh, supply chain, so they're doing bits and pieces. Um, they have a lot of equipment in Williams, uh, but um, you know we're, we'll be lucky to get all these up and running by summertime. You have just uh, next you, summer. Yes, you have to deplete your Astro Funds by September twenty twenty-four. So all the equipment for these sites has been ordered, and as as equipment comes in, they're they're installing and doing different things. But to get it all together and running next summer. When was the equipment ordered? Uh, we signed that uh, contract with Samet um, at the the main meeting that we had at Highlands Elementary School. So right after that meeting, they started ordering all that equipment. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is Samet over all these age racks? Is that who's supervising that, so to speak? Samet is that well, person? They, they receive the, uh, the contract for the ESRA uh, HVAC fresh air projects, uh, but typically we use lots of, lots of different companies. This is the first HVAC project that we have done with Samet. So they're like the lead person? Yes. Are they yes. subcontracting other people underneath that, or is that their... Uh, they had engineering design firms do the design work, and then uh, Sam does the construction work. But like everyone else, they sub out. They sub out the work. And that was the, bids. I mean, they're, they're doing some of the work, and then they sub out lots. And of then bids were put out with Sam or brand A, brand B, and Sam got the contract. Yes, and that that's not a brand. This was all. But you know what I mean. Like, there were other companies. Uh, yes. Okay. This was put out uh, almost two years ago at the beginning of that project. We just signed the final addendum in May, but the wheels started turning on that at this least a not, year and a half ago. This, this stuff at this magnitude is not overnight. Yes. Right. That is. The question came up to me uh, over the weekend, and I think I got the answer from um, Chair uh, Alec Graves sitting over there in the corner um, about having uh, licensed general contractors on staff. Could you address that for us, please? Could you clarify the question? Do you have licensed general contractors working under you? Um, well, we have some folks that work in the in the maintenance department right. who are uh, licensed general contractors. That's what but that's not required for a school system to have a licensed right. uh, contractor. And uh, typically, you wouldn't want to use, like, a, a, a if you had a plumber with a plumber's license, you wouldn't want them doing work for the school system under their license. They would do it under the school system name, so it doesn't tie them in with any kind of liability issues. Do you have any HVAC certification certified people? Uh, we have some folks who have been to HVAC school, and they have some uh, certification you know, through the, the classes that they have taken. Uh, we only have four HVAC staff, uh, two of which would have some some certifications. Have you looked at the 
the, uh, I think you told us last week that you had 25 in maintenance, 25 personnel in maintenance now. Is that accurate? Yes. Probably. Yes. Uh, is that sufficient to handle what you're trying to do? No. no. Um, four of them are grounds, grounds crew, four of them are warehouse, so when you count, um, you know, boots on the ground that can do things related to uh, you know, carpentry, HVAC, electric, or um, plumbing, um, we're, we're struggling. I think the place we need to start looking and lots of other counties do it, uh, lots of service contracts related to preventative maintenance on the HVAC systems um, and, uh, and and going forward that, that way, using the folks we have to, to do emergency kind of things the best they can, but it's, it's just too much, it's too much. Dr. Miller, well, we're still waiting on numbers. Uh, I think we're all set. Yeah, yeah. You have it? Yeah. Can we have it? Oh, so Bruce, okay. Bruce is going to stick it up on the screen for us. I'd love to have it in a paper format. Okay. Uh, is it this? Yeah, it's going to be what you have before you, Mr. Paisley. This one. There's, There's two sheets because they have this too. Yes. Okay. So it's for the projectors. I don't have this in a um, Excel spreadsheet, but I can run scan it. We can email it to someone if you can tell us who. Bruce Walker. Yeah. Or me. I think that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be really because this is this is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm glad to see the virtual schools do not need clean. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not in outer space, they're housed in a building. <laughs> I, just, I thought they'd give a little laugh. Oh, no. <laughs> well, while they're doing that, I think I have a couple questions that could get us. Take make use of the time, um, uh, Dr. Beller or, or Mr. Hunk, whoever. I, I think it would be helpful for me to, to go back to where we were on, on Friday and and use this spreadsheet to see where we've come since then, uh, in order just for for scope and severity and cost. And where where I remember we were on Friday, we had we had allocated a total of. One million three hundred fifty-five thousand dollars for HVACs, not knowing what their, well, knowing what a range would be for their use, but not or for their uh, fixing, but not knowing the actual amount. Um, and as as I do the math that we have in front of us for the HVAC estimates based on your spreadsheet here for East Lawn, Hall River, Williams, which we knew was one fifteen, Eastern, Graham High School, and Woodlawn, I come up with. One million four hundred forty-three thousand dollars. Do we have that? Is that? Do we have? We total that number. So it's which I which I see is eighty-eight thousand dollars more than what we had, what the estimate was on Friday. It's in the ballpark, but it's. I'm just trying to count for everything that we've done before. So does anybody anybody help me with that math? We're talking about the HVAC column for East Lawn. Not Broadview, East Lawn, Hall River, Williams, Eastern, Graham High, and Woodlawn, which I total to be $1.443 million. You said 1443? 1443. Now we had allocated $1.355 million on Friday, which I show a difference of $88,000 for those projects. Okay. If anybody's, y'all follow me on that with me on that? Mm -hmm. Which schools were you highlighting? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's there. Okay. East Lawn, Hall River, Western, I'm uh, sorry, East Lawn, Hall River, Williams, Eastern, Graham High School, Woodlawn. No Cummings? Cummings we had already covered okay. with a different allocation. Okay. 
right. Woodlands, Woodlands is the name. Woodlawn, Hall River, East Lawn, and Cummins. Not Cummins. Not Cummins we've covered with a different allocation. Okay. I'm just trying to, we had allocated some money as, as a bucket. Right. That yeah. we, hadn't, we hadn't filled yet. And so I'm trying to account for all that. Mm -hmm. So we had allocated 1.355 million yes. for those six projects. They're coming in with the actual quotes of a little bit more, of $88,000 more. And I'm just making sure that we all agree that the, that the quotes are $88,000 more than we had allocated on Friday. That's all I'm asking. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out how much more money we need. We good? Is that... We're good? Okay. Now we also, um, as I'm looking at the sheet here at Woodlawn Middle, we had, on Friday, we knew that Woodlawn Middle uh, needed some HVAC repair, but I don't think we knew on Friday that Woodlawn Middle needed this 178, 750. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, sir. Okay. So that's that's a new item. Okay. So going back to, to what I have been asking, what is the... Why is that number here? What is the scope and severity of the mold at Woodlawn? Because that's the first time we've seen that number. So I can speak to why it's there. Okay. It, it's there as we, we just received the, the wrong for that, the, the cost estimate for um, remediation there at Woodlawn. Now, can someone yeah, yeah, if you share know, what, that, what that, it is that, at yeah. Woodlawn? So explain to who's listening what ROM is. So, so ROM is rough order of magnitude. Thank you. So what it does is it allows you the range. So in, in Woodlawn, the it come back, the air sample is actually toxic. Okay? Toxigenic. Room uh, 308, the gym, and uh, has elevated aspergillus. Room 308 as well, I'm sorry, if I already said that one. Cafeteria is affected. And there's a basement under the media center that's affected. And then the gym's affected. Okay. So there's about 27,000 square foot that's affected. So when you go in, them areas have to be contained off so you don't affect the rest of the school. Uh -huh. And then the HVAC system, because it's toxic, yeah. the HVAC system has to, but that one was. And so that one we already accounted for. It's yes, just, sir. It's just $15,000 more than what we had scheduled on, oh, okay. on Friday. Uh, and then AO on Friday, also AO was a whole, AO was an unknown yes, sir. on Friday. And so now I'm seeing uh, $155,000 for AO. That's a new number, isn't it? Yes, sir. And what's what's the scope and severity of the mold issues at AO? So AO is actually uh, all the hall, uh, 100 hallway, uh, more especially, uh, even emphasis on classroom 101, classroom 107, 200 hallway, media center, and music room, and uh, there's a hallway right out by the music room. Okay. And so that's... Um, These are part, that's a partial wrong. Yeah, so that's we're going to get to that in a second. Yeah, that's not the whole school. That's just partial. Mm -hmm. uh, that so now, when I add those numbers, the eighty-eight thousand dollars, the hundred seventy-eight seven fifty, and the one fifty-five, I get four twenty-one seven fifty as additional funds needed for cleaning for the schools that we touched on on Friday. Right? That's that. Can y'all check my math on that? What I'm just trying to do is true up is true up where we were from Friday to now, so that we're all talking about the same things. All right, so that was AO. Mm -hmm. It was AO. It was uh, Woodlawn Middle, the um, on the ROM column, and it was the eighty-eight thousand dollars additional that was needed for HVAC cleaning for the six schools that we talked about before. Four twenty-one seven fifty. Okay. Now, so I think we're all cleared up from Friday. What, what I want to talk about now is what's new. And it looks like we've got updated ROMs at one, two, three, four, five, six schools that we mentioned this morning. Those are Alexander Wilson, E.M. Holt, Highland, 
Southern High, Southern Middle, Sylvan. Um, and so let's just go down the list. Um, particularly interested in Highland, but I mean, starting with uh, with Alexander Wilson, an additional seventy-five thousand dollars. What is what is that for on that additional on that ROM increase of seventy-five thousand dollars? Well, they received the inspection report. Looking back, sorry, uh, they received the inspection report. He's got that. Yeah, I'm actually looking for score. I got it. So actually, if you look, oh, did you put it on one? Right. Yeah, I did it wrong. The thing I would is so just so we're all on the same page. AO, EM Hope, Highland, Southern Alamance High School, Southern Middle School, Silver. We received the protocol and report between nine two and nine four. Two days ago. So I mean it's a it's a bunch. I mean it's half a page of email for each school. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, I mean, general, I mean, I don't, um, just kind of yeah, I just got it. I mean, let me find. I mean, like I said, it's in three different ones. So I had AO, but like um, Hillcrest, I mean, I have it on this one. Uh, let me, let, let me well, so find I, it. I, I'll, I'll take it though. I'll take it. So, Alexander Wilson, right now you're not showing any HVAC remedy for Alexander Wilson. There, there is none scheduled for that. Okay. So, that's a $75,000 increase based upon the reports that you got. From the industrial from hygienist, the industrial hygienist. Uh, uh, additional areas that were never noted up again. Okay, and does that require cleaning of the areas that have already been cleaned? No, sir. Okay. These are additional areas that that areas. Addition. So we've seen molded some additional spaces within the building, and so we're cleaning more. That's correct. So what's what's the original ROM has already been completed? Right. Yes, sir. And I'm just trying to give everybody yeah, no, a clear perspective yes, on what, yes, what's yes, changed. Yeah, no problem. So EM Holt, uh, it was. Uh, on Friday, it was a thirty thousand dollar fix. Now it's an additional one seven hundred seventy thousand dollar fix again. So what's what's new there? That so that one there come out toxic. Okay, that's one of the uh, toxic schools. So let me get you the exact thing on that. That one's right much. Just the media center. There's a bunch of stuff in that one. You're finding generally you're finding mold in more places than what than what you originally. Yes, sir. So when we originally done it, we were given the direction to do A and B area. That's what we priced. Okay. The hygienist, so we have two different issues here. We the hygienist sent us a report, and it says not only do A and B, do C, D, E, F, and G areas, and that's why that ROM increase is based on the IEP that we received either 9-2, 9-3, or 9-4. That's where the additionals come from. Now, going to Highland, um, so this one, I mean, this is orders of magnitude different. Yes. Um, so I'm seeing fifteen thousand dollars on Friday, and now it's an additional five hundred twenty thousand dollars at a school that's pretty new. So what, what's what's happening there? All right. So Highland. That's some other question about the same issue. For probably took a new school. Let me, let me find that one here. But that one there has a very large amount of had a very large amount of single tiles in the, in the Originally, we were told to do only one of those small areas. Then we received the IH report. IH protocol said that every stain and wet ceiling tile in that entire building had to be replaced. Every wet ceiling tile. Stain, if it's stained, even if it's dry, if it's stained because of the top side, every, that, every one of those ceiling tiles, have to, there's a large number in that school. Plus, there's four of the areas, the cafeteria, the media room, and there's two uh, hallway with 20 some classrooms, you know, when you add the two hallways together. Can you see that from just standing in the room and looking at it? I'm sorry, so can you see that? Visible, is that visible standing in a room and looking at the ceiling? Uh, yes, yeah, it's right. Yeah, sure. Can you see the old actually? I, I walked to school, yes. Yeah. yeah. It was back to principals walking the building, right, Dr. Butler? Correct. We need to go through. Okay. I can get Commissioner Tron. I'm gonna research it. I'll get you the exact details here in just a second. Okay. Well, as with okay, can you do that in just one second? Go to these other three. On oh here? yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Southern High, the same thing. at Friday, ninety-two thousand four hundred, and now it's uh, an additional one hundred twenty thousand. What's the additional uh, scope for it? Southern High. Is that in our 
new area. So this is no, this is a separate area. Separate area. Yes, sir. So South Alamance High School. Is that one you asked about? There? All right. Toxigenic mold, stacky boxes, in the library. So the library was never included. E building, auditorium, G building, and there's a um, uh, part of the bookcase stuff in the uh, library has to be demoed. Say that one more time. Part of the bookcases that holds the book in the library, part of that has to be demoed, meaning toy. The shelves or the books? Both. Okay, you can't suck salvage the books? No, they have stacky boxers molding them. I mean, it, it, can we restore them? Yes. Would y'all want to pay for them? No. It's a, it's so much the cost of restoring a book that has mold roots in it. Yeah, we can. I mean, we can. I mean, the IH protocol has got to dispose of them. And then finally, Sylvan Elementary, uh, it was 80000 an additional 265000 What's the additional scope there? Right. Sylvan originally was only the one part of the half of the 100 hallway in the cafeteria was the um, original um, part. The ROM increase was the media center has toxigenic mold in this one, multiple areas of the ceilings, walls, duct work, demo needed for further investigation, 200 hall, hall bathroom, 208 classroom, 207, 209, <coughs> module number two, and we got to remove and replace all damaged ceiling tiles in the entire building. Now that's greened out. Why is it greened out? That's just part of my. Day. And I, I apologize for the coloring. I didn't get that cleared up before I finished. It's just a working document to help me to keep track of things. All right. So, not being able to read the number, did you give me that number? The increase. So the increase for silver. So two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. Thank you. So when I add these new numbers um, for the ROM increases over the weekend, I get one point two seven million dollars. Yes. Which when I add add to the uh, the four hundred twenty one that we just earlier talked about, the, I see the total for new requests for funds at one million six hundred ninety one thousand seven hundred fifty. Is that right? So we need to revise one number of. While we were talking, I've taken this and put it into a spreadsheet so it's a whole lot easier to calculate. Yeah. Um, when we look at the HVAC that was approved on Friday right. versus these, it's actually a difference. I'm coming up with 27000 Oh. So 27000 plus the 155, 178, 750 gives us additional cost there of $360,750 and then adding that to the 1.27. Want to repeat that, please? Sure. All right, so the change in the HVAC and what was already allocated is an additional 27000 Then the AO project, 155000 Wood loan, $178,750, brings your total to $360,750. And then with the additional ROMs that we are bringing showing that is an additional one million six hundred thirty thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. Okay. Mr. Bass, why are you looking at that? Which of these schools um, on, on your spreadsheet are the estimates, well, are, are either the estimate or the actual contracted price no, completely known at this point. HVAC. But I mean the whole school. No, you're asking which one is known out of this whole sheet. Right. Is the HVAC. So no schools do we know the price no. to remediate. Well, the ROMs we know, but the the final price no. Do we know the final price for any school? No. Because the way it went, you know, these guys are working 13, 15 hours a day. All that information is entered the next day or the next 48 hours. When you're entering a couple thousand people, plus all the pieces of equipment and all of that, all of that stuff goes. And then we actually send it to a, the national subject matter expert in time and material building. They audit it before we turn it into the cloud. Are any of the schools 
do any of these schools have ROMs that are uh, final to include HVAC or, to, or, or knowing that HVAC is not needed? Or any of the ROMs I, final? I, as of this moment, this is the information we have. But let me tell you how easy it changes, okay? So from when we recessed, when I left here at whatever time it was and got back, I can go ahead and tell you William High School is going to increase dramatically. And here's the reason why. The I, industrial hygienist, the chalkboards have to be removed in that school. The chalkboards tested positive for asbestos. Asbestos. So I can, so they have to be, one, the state has to issue a permit, and then they have to be remediated. So that is not included in this ROM because I would have never wrote that up front. Does every single blackboard in Williams High School need to be? The first floor and second floor, every one of them has to be disposed of. Yes. Why? Um, it's full of mold behind it. It's glued to the wall, and the problem is, is over time what they've had is they had a block wall or, or substrate. They've had corkboard, chalkboard, corkboard, uh, and then another chalkboard on top. The actual chalkboard itself is that asbestos? It's asbestos, yes, sir. All right, I've got a question. But that's not quick. Or, you can Mr. Hook, we're just blindly taking whatever numbers we're given. What check or who are you bringing behind these folks? to make sure everything is done, one, correctly, two, cost is correct, three, you have contracts, you've indicated they have no caps whatsoever. This is a totally unknown and unknowable number. I don't disagree that there's some concern, but it's our only option. There is no other option right now. Do you have other bidders? Not, they were higher. They were higher. Those bids were higher. So it, it, anything else we do in public schools, we take the lowest bid typically. And builder services were the lowest bid. Have you got someone going behind these folks and checking the work? Well, the inspectors have to come in and clear the buildings in order to make it good to go. That's what you mean. Yeah, but that's why we're where we are today. Because mm -hmm. nobody was checking, nobody was looking. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got years apparently of neglect, not from county commissioners. And, that, and obviously on the various news channels, they're blaming county commissioners for not funding. I'm not blaming anyone today. I'm, I'm saying, trying to say solution driven. We can have a conversation later about preventative maintenance and maybe what the funding model should look like moving forward to make sure we are being preventative in maintenance. That's a conversation for another day, in my opinion. Today is getting schools open on September 11th. And the only way I know to do that is to continue to work with builder services right now. Yeah, right. And we, I think I asked you in the morning session to meet with us in two weeks. Correct. Next meeting with ideas on one, why sure. this happened, and two, what you as superintendent are going to do to prevent it from happening again. That's what I'm going to focus on is the lab, what we're going to do to move forward. Appreciate it. I think going back and looking in, in the past years, I'm tired of talking about it. I wasn't here. I can't hear you why. It's pointing fingers. I think we talked about that earlier. That we're not getting anywhere with that. So I'm taking the high road at this point and saying we're going to get better. Could we have done better? Yes. Now when we come up with a preventive prevention plan, I believe that it's going to mean that we do talk about what funding looks like more so because I think contracts are going to be what we land on, bringing people in to do this work so it can be accountable and trackable more so than it is now. And we thank you for that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Can I just ask Mr. Bass a question? Cummins is a monster, and I know it is. I saw it. Um, in the library, in the roof, kind of basically just lost it. There was plastic covered all the bookcases. All books. Or is, is all that to be just destroyed? No. The books and the book. Okay. No. Okay. No. Okay. No. okay. I'm checking my cell phone because those that could not hear this morning promised to text me if they could not hear this afternoon. 
So give me just a second, please. If you see me checking mine, just to make sure I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. Thank you. Mr. Walker, thank you for that correction. Yes, yes sir. Ford, what else do we have? Quick question for, uh, I think, Mr. Rogers. I think looking at the, uh, the ESRA fund availability and what, uh, what, the, what was available out of the $8 million. So this would be the, the blue sheet that's in your folder. Um, that I provided last week. Um, when we were talking about this previously, we looked at the ESSER 3 K-12 Emergency Relief Fund, which is the large section in the middle. Um, you see that's where um, a large amount, it does not show the $26 million, but that's where the $26 million is currently budgeted out of. Um, I had mentioned previously the 20% for to go towards learning loss would actually need us to move some money from that $3.3 million over. And so we're estimating right around $1 million remaining in that fund that um, we could look at uh, redoing the application or amending the application. Um, but it would have to be focused on uh, a response to COVID-19. Um, I think some of our avenues for that use have been just with the um, publicity has kind of taken taken away or be concerned that uh, auditors would see this and see if it's not related. Yeah, well, I think if, if the, uh, my understanding is that if the mold is, if it's new mold, then perhaps this response would not be appropriate if it had mold that had been conditions that were creating mold for a time, for instance, the toxigenic mold. <coughs> It may have been there for a while, we don't know. But if, if that is the source, then those funds are available. And I think that and the county would be in a position that if there was an audit that in the, in the scope of time was not allowed, then the county would be in a position to backfill whatever funds were ultimately not allowed. I mean, I, I haven't pulled the commissioners, but I mean, I think that's something the county would have to do. Do I understand the Unfunded is one million nine hundred ninety-one thousand five hundred dollars. Is that the unfunded amount? I got the one one point six three. So one point six three seven fifty is the difference in the projects from where we were Friday to now. We've identified those costs, um, but if you look at the bottom or on the screen. Their funding difference right now is one million nine hundred thirty-four thousand three hundred seventy-five dollars. Give me that again, please. One million nine thirty-four three seven five. Mr. Chairman, can I explain that? No. I thought we were at one million six hundred thirty thousand seven. Can I explain that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but Mr. Oh, sorry. Explain that. It's okay. Can I explain it? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, perfect. So there are um, the difference. If you if below the black bar, you'll see some other costs related to testing. The forty thousand dollar and the three hundred twenty thousand dollar. These are using agencies to uh, pre and post test. Um, if you'll, the PDR, the the post verification remediation. Am I on the right page, sir? It, it would be the green, the green page. Um, so that's the additional cost, and I think changes um, alters your number some to the one point, a little over one point nine million dollars. And then we still are waiting on two HVAC quotes for. I do need to point that out. North Graham and Ray Street Academy. That's there is a reason for that coloring. That's why that's yellow. Um, to remind me that we are waiting on those quotes. So, Ms. Evans, what is your number? So, my number matches Mr. Rogers at the $1.9 million figure. Right. Mm -hmm. With the additional cost. Motion, Doug. You have a motion? Uh, well, no. So, the $1.9 $1. 9, 
I'm sorry, one million nine hundred thirty-four thousand three hundred seventy-five. Now, on Friday, there was an, we allocated monies in excess of what the request was uh, at seven hundred forty-five thousand dollars. Is that right? So, if I need to know what's left, I would subtract from the one point nine million to seven hundred forty-five thousand. So, on I did. I'm gonna jump in. You go right ahead. There's a um, an additional sheet in your packet. This goes over each motion that was made. This includes um, the special call meeting of the Alamance Burlington School System on April, 4, I mean, uh, April August 4th and August 16th, um, where we used uh, PAYGO money currently allocated to Alamance Burlington School System. Um, but then you'll see with the start of the uh, August 28th, the August 30th, and the uh, September 1st joint meetings, you'll see those motions that were made um, I tried to provide some detail that I could hear on those recordings. So yes, so in those there were there were because we didn't know the, the full values, we we allocated an additional seven hundred forty-five thousand dollars. And so that's accounted for with that difference. It is a difference. It is. I'm just trying to figure out what, what's the new money and what money covers it and what what additional money are needed based on where we're on now. Yes, sir. Um, it, it seems to me, I mean, we've still got to work towards mold remediation. Uh, you, you guys need a cushion in order to do what we've talked about. Um, this is how I would do it. Um, and I would like to talk, before I put it into a motion, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to, to talk about it. I'm happy to put in a motion. Um, Last meeting, we transferred, we, we used the existing funds in the ABSS system in, in the form of building funds to essentially re remediate mold with building funds. That it, based upon the 7.5 million in funds that were um, available from bond savings. I, I would do that again. I, I would allocate the remaining monies from um, the ABSS uh, Graham High School roof. I'm sorry, the Southern High School roof, which totaled right about $3.9 million. I, I would then backfill that money with the, the bond project money. Uh, that would give $3.9 million for mold remediation, which gives you, um, what, a cushion of about $2.7 million. I would then hope that ABSS, if it saw itself this week needing additional funds, you've got your $1 million that you've identified and you could use for extra funds. That gives you plenty of money to work with to continue to move these things forward, we, even with projects where we don't quite know the scope. Um, and then, I, I, like we said, that if if an audit showed that, based upon the application, that the extra funds were, were not appropriately done, then the county would backfill that information. And if we do that, none of the projects that are currently in progress for ABSS, capital projects, are, lose any steam at all. Um, the, those roofing projects continue. We are drawing down funds that are allocatable to um, cap additional new capital projects. You know, we had a conversation this morning about with Davenport about bond funds. We're going to probably have to look at that. But, I mean, that's... That's how I would keep these moving forward in this meeting right now to give them some additional funds to be able to do some of these things. The people where you pulled the money from, I was trying to get that to balance to what you said. The Southern High School Roofing Project. And you said, uh, how much are you saying that? Three point nine, three million nine hundred and five thousand dollars That's the total. That's so can left. I, yep. can I clarify left. that? Yes. So the handout that you all have, commissioners, is a combination of two numbers. It'll be the combination of bond interest of 1.7 million and the remaining Southern High Roof Capital Reserve of 2.1. With that, if you do move forward with that, I would also need within that motion to us budgeting those, because the 1.7 has not been budgeted yet, so we would need to have a motion that would budget those as new funds. I don't think you have to get there yet. Right. Um, and now let me ask this, if, if we were to use interest that has accrued on bond monies, mm -hmm. does that pot have the same restrictions it does. as the original monies? It does. Okay. It does. So by reallocating that 3.9 million figure, 
that would pick up the 1.7 of bond interest and the remaining 2.1 million. I thought we'd only allocated $980,000 from the Southern Loop project, which would leave 3.9. And then... So of that 3.9, right. we were looking at total bond dollars that were available. That was right. including that 1.7. So the bond interest was already added into that figure because the southern high roof was 4.8. Yes, you're exactly right. And then the you're additional exactly right. at would take additional funds, not all of them, but some of them. Right. Yes. Is the southern high roof everything that's not new? You know what I'm saying? Is it the, the former southern high not including all the additional bonds? I will have to defer to um, Mr. Hook on that. What, what is that? Right. Yes, that? It's, it's everything that's not the new the new portion. Okay. So we don't need to let that continue to leak if it's leaking, so to speak, right? It's not as bad as the rest. It's not the last, as bad as still leaking. It's the last one of the group of four. That's, <laughs> that's like kind of pregnant. No, you either are or you're not. So. But, but this plan won't. I know. <laughs> I know. It does not stop that project. I like Mr. Bass, but I don't want him ever here three months talking to me about leaking. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, he can come back to the Nothing personal. Nothing personal, but still. Have you got that in the form of a motion? Yeah, I'll make it the form of a motion if y'all want to make it the form of a motion. All right. Uh, Ms. Evans, make sure this is, this is right. Um, all right, Lily, we allocate 3.9, I'm sorry, $3,905,000 from a combination of ABSS capital reserve funds previously allocated to the Southern High School roof and funds from interest that has been earned on unspent bond funds to mold remediation to cover the new items that we've talked about in this meeting and additional projects that may arise over the course of this week and further that we reallocate unspent money from bond projects and from interest earned on unspent bonds, unspent bonds, totaling the same $3,905,000 to the Southern High School Roof Project. Is that your motion? That's my motion. I'll second it. From instead of two, right? There's a from and a two. Mm -hmm. Right. But not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure it's done correctly. <laughs> okay, and you got all of that? Yes, sir. All right. Any further discussion? I'm just really concerned. We keep throwing more and more and more taxpayer dollars and we've got to clean up the issue. But I'm really concerned that school systems entering contracts with no caps and no way to determine an eventual end. Uh, just I've only practiced law for 50 years, but I would never tell a client to do that. Um, it just really concerns me for the taxpayers and the students and the teachers and everybody else concerned. Um, any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? School system, you have your money. We will see you in two weeks. Mr. Chairman, question. Do we need to set a meeting, potential meeting date, between now and Friday in case something else comes up? Is that a need we need to look at? I'm not sure. I, I, this afternoon, when I left here, a yellow jacket flew in my window as I got about, landed on my neck, and my wife, who's highly allergic to bee stings, grabbed it and threw it out the window nice. and then uh, I got home and we had other issues at my home a guy almost ran me off the road uh, 
I'm tired of all these meetings. <laughs> I want to clarify, if I can, um, Mr. Turner's motion gave us a little bit of leeway for some overage. Do we know, I've not done the math, do we know what that number is? So we can pull that real quick. It's not 740 anymore. 1934375 minus 745,000. Okay. I'm hopeful that we won't need to come back if we can stay within that figure. We all are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. concerned about it. I think it's good to have that number. I mean, appreciate it. It's good. I think it's around 1.9. Yeah, that's yeah. what I have. One million nine hundred seventy thousand six hundred twenty-five dollars. Awesome. Is unallocated right now. That's, that's the cushion. And hey, we do use really the cushion when we vote on pre right. yes. I'm just clarifying that that's what we're going to work off of. And we're not adjourning, by the way, but hopefully we're getting beyond Get this up. immediate issue. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry, what, was your issue? what they need on these, on the, what they're asking for today is one million nine hundred thirty-four thousand eight hundred seventy-five dollars mm -hmm. mm -hmm. minus seven hundred forty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. I did not take out the seven hundred forty-five thousand. What I'm look because that seven hundred forty-five thousand is built into the one point nine figure. It's not. Well, the one point nine figure so, that they were showing as the difference was already is in with the funds that they need. So That's what, not how I understand it. So what I was taking was the three point nine million dollars that we've reallocated from capital reserve to bonds to free up that money, subtract out what was needed at one point nine million, leaves a buffer of one million nine hundred seventy thousand six hundred twenty five. Well when we looked at new monies that were needed today, it was the one million six hundred thirty thousand seven hundred fifty plus the additional figures here of three hundred and uh, sixty thousand to make one million nine hundred thirty four thousand three hundred seventy five. We gave additional monies, which are these these are these are expenses. These are not revenues. Right. We gave additional revenues on Friday to the tune of seven hundred forty five thousand dollars, and now we're giving an additional three point nine million. So I'm seeing two point about two million. So the point seven five million dollars. The one point nine million figure and Mr. Rogers can can explain it if I'm not saying this Mr. correctly. Mr. Rogers is saying it is accounted for in what he gave you, the seven hundred thousand figure. Yes. yes. It's within that because if you look at their their figures that they have, they're showing the the overall project cost right now of the eighteen point four million dollars. And when we subtracted out what we had already allocated, um, including what they spent in PAYGO for Alexander, up uh, for Andrews mm -hmm. and for Newland, that's 16.5 million. That gives you the funding difference of the 1,934,375. Uh, right. okay. so, so how much money do they have extra? So according to my calculation, $1,970,625. We'll go with that, but I'm not convinced. But, but uh, I'll look. At, I'll talk after. And uh, so there's about two million dollars out of these identified funds now. I'm not sure if your board has to vote on that or not. Uh, and then I think we talked about that our board would, uh, I think, would backfill one million in Nesser if those funds were to shows to be. So that totals about three million dollars right now okay. for additional. Work this week. Okay. So let me clarify. Thank you. Thank you, board. And that includes the 740 that well Ryan was talking about. Just in case we have these other schools, we got to come. We're coming. Remember that was Mr. Bowden. You know the 700. That was like the extra in case the ones that hadn't that's, tested at all. That's what we're disagreeing tested. about. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. right my numbers match you, but this. I'm off by a decimal point. So Ooh. I think you're right. <laughs> Well, it's it's a right. it's a minimum of of uh, two of one point nine million dollars. Okay. Minimum, yeah. it could be an additional seven thousand. Okay, thank you. And hopefully, we'll see you in two weeks with how to never do this again. <laughs> oh, that's what I was going to say. I'm sorry. I would like the uh, opportunity to work with Mrs. Gray, Ellington Graves, to schedule that with you. I have to make sure we're all going to be there, okay? In two well, weeks. our regular meeting will be two weeks from yesterday. So that gives you two weeks, minus a day. Okay. Um, and 
it will be a joint meeting that I guarantee you'll have time to present. I'll figure it. Quick, 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 quick question, my name is Chairman. Was your, I think it would be good for us if, if you all would, would update us daily sure. on the changes. We can do that. that. Therefore, we know how much how much slop is left. Slop. I mean, how much and how much allocation is potentially left. Sure. And, and Mr. Bass sends us a daily email every morning. That would change that. that would be our and send that to our Alamance County email sites. For we'll do. And we've been getting more updates from the public and from the news media than we have. For well, we just added chance. you to our emergency uh, PIO uh, listserv, so you're going to get a whole lot of stuff. Excellent. Because I definitely had told Mr. Hook at, in our meetings this week that I would certainly like to have any and all mm -hmm. documentation that you have to fix in any school down to a bricks. Because this is we we can take this information and we can scan it into our right. into our computers and we can always have it at our fingertips sure. and that's why it's really important to get every single document because not just for this commissioner board but the next one. Sure. So you're on our list, sir. May I receive you. all of that, just like my board would. Thank you. I probably should not say this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Discretion is not a part of my life. She may get you again. <laughs> if she's, if she's if recalling she's like that, you probably should do that. If you go online, it's either Saturday or Sunday, I think it's Sunday, um, Facebook, and they had... That's bad for you, sir. Yeah, sir. I totally agree. Yeah, talk about there was a Facebook right? release that said you were going virtual. And it was online for about an hour, and then it was removed. I'm guessing that was not from no, ABS. We've not released anything. ABSS has not released anything about going virtual. Uh, that is not our intention, and we have worked very hard the last few days, as a few, a few, to make sure that we go back in person on September 11th. And Dr. Butler, the purpose of that statement was not one finger to make it happen. It was go folks out in radio land, mm -hmm. TV land, whatever, believe everything you see on the Facebook. Because that was totally erroneous. It was up for about an hour and then was removed. Yeah, so. I not, was not aware of that, but no, we're not playing on one version. Thank you. <laughs> the timing and the cost of going virtual, as I understand it, would take us longer to get up and started than being ready to start on the 11th. Am I yeah. correct? We would have to come back to you to ask you for more funding for hotspots. Uh, and the amount of prep work for the teachers to get ready to do it with Fidelity is immense. Uh, I know I have a lot of educators and teachers out there right now don't, that don't agree with some schools not going back right now. Uh, Ms. Thompson made a good comment about like this winter weather. We're trying our best to stay on the same calendar for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and in my opinion, in-person learning always is a better choice than virtual. Definitely. So we're going to get there on September 11th. Right, Mr. Bass? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> How does this impact the school calendar? What, what, what kind of adjustments have you so about that? We have submitted uh, a formal request for this to be considered an emergency situation. Uh, State Superintendent Catherine Truitt have, has reached out to us. They are inquiring about what that would look like. We know some of our days are already going to be excused because of the number of instructional hours we already have. Right. Excused, right. So we still have uh, some work to do on that. My goal is to put out a survey to our teachers and give them a voice as to what they would prefer in terms of if we have to make it up. But there's a lot of balls in the air right now on that. And sometimes waiting pays off. Right. Right. So. Well, again, my statement was solely to say to anybody in the audience here on TV land or whatever, don't look at Facebook. Yeah, that's, that's great, great advice, <laughs> great advice. Thank you. Thank you guys, appreciate your time and support. Okay, that's the last thing on our regular agenda, attorney's report. Nothing for the report, thank you. Best report of the day, thank you. <laughs> County manager. We've talked a little bit about wanting to sit down with the schools at some point in the future to do a comprehensive roofing, HVAC assessment that gets us an engineer uh, to come through and assess all of our buildings, facilities, and then put us on a long-term matrix that is ranking prioritizing needs. Um, so we will reach out to ABSS at some point in the future 
to see if we can start coordinating something like that that gets a little more proactive. Uh, we've all been mentioning it, um, so I'd just like to note that we'll, we're going to work on that. Um, there was a question raised during the citizen comments about the percentage of the county budget that goes to education. I'm not sure what the apples to apples comparison is, but you typically would say your percentage of general fund because the other funds are not with tax dollars. You don't have a lot of say in, in those pieces of your budget. So if we're looking at general fund for Elements County, about 24.3% of your general fund budget goes to education. If you include debt service, which you are paying for this on behalf of the schools, it goes to 31.25%, just as a point of clarification on that. Um, so 31.25%. If you want to include debt service. All county funds that go to ABSs. That is correct. County funds. We're not talking about state, not talking about federal, we're talking about county. Is that fines and forfeitures in it? General fines and forfeitures, I can understand, because the schools get that completely. Yes, that it does include that as well. Thank you for bringing that up, because I was going to definitely ask for <laughs> And I had it on my note. <laughs> this way. So the rule of thumb that I told Mr. Marsh in the meeting that day, was a rule of thumb is one out of every three dollars taxpayers send to our local school district. I'm off by 1.75 percent and I <laughs> certainly apologize. It's okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Yes. Okay, Kathy Grisham. Mr. Thompson, you've been quiet. Well, I'll you first. <laughs> well, that's right up there with the bed. So, yeah. um, I just, um, had made a statement earlier just from all the you know, people contacted me and um, we've changed it before we've changed it this kind of thing when we come on um, it's about it's about the public comments and I'm, I'm just so proud of people that feel the freedom and the courage to come in here it takes a lot of guts to come in here and say your piece in front of this you're on television live stream whatever and I mean they're right on top of us I mean um, I understand that being on the board of ed previously. But I, I just, um, I hate that, especially at night meeting, that they have to wait an entire meeting and sit here and wait to get a response. And last, I think, meeting for last, a lot of those folks, it was a night meeting, just left and went home. Um, this is what we do, and, and the county folks too, this is, you know, when they come to the meeting. I just really want us to consider allowing us commissioners to reply back to them when they come here and not just pour their hearts out, but show their concerns because um, it is frustrating to sit here as a commissioner and not be able to say something back, you know, and let me make sure you understand this or to comfort somebody or to thank them. I just feel like we keep them on hold and the county people that live in this county kind of run the show. That's who funds everything. And I think they look maybe need a little bit more power when it comes to us being able to answer them. It's um, it's just something to think about. And we've talked a lot about um, the maintenance thing. And, and I, I can tell you, before, I would hear whenever work orders would go to a principal, it would, we just can't do that right now. We don't have the money to do it. And you know, that's just what it is. You have that in all kind of businesses. And, and sooner or later that becomes your normal. You just don't. And, 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 you know, I just want us to really stay focused because, you know, we talk about we do capital and we do maintenance. I think we need to be more involved in that. And that is not under usurping anybody's authority. That is not undermining. That is not doubting. That is just us having more of a role in that as far as a partner and accountability. Um, the more we are involved in that with what's going on, the more support they'll have, and the more we will have to own, not just saying we do that. I don't know if that's how you can do that with law or whatever, but I do think we need to have a person um, that's involved in that, that is that position, that that's what they wanted to be when they grew up, so to speak. They're licensed to do that, they're a professional at it. And I really want to speak about that because um, this has been an ongoing thing for a long time, and it's been a battle with power between our board and their board. That, if anything is going to show us with that, is uh, mold has really showed us who the power is. It's been in control. And we're kind of our, it's victim, so to speak, at its beck and call. So I just really want us to consider that. And that's going to 
put us more in a responsible line as well with the school system because um, I've heard it said so many times, well, we give you money for your buildings and your maintenance, and then there's some kind of remark that goes with it. If we're involved in that more as a partner, then um, it's like I said the other day, it's, it's my fault even when it's not, and that's what leadership is about. And I just really want us to consider that. And um, that's and this this meeting you guys have, oh, what's it called? The little abbreviations. OSC. I think I would appreciate it once that meeting has happened that that is reported back to this commission board because I don't never hear about it. Not because it's not you know I don't go to it. I'm not part of that. But I would like to know the outcomes and the conversations of that so we can be more supportive on both sides and just be more knowledgeable. That's it. I think the more that we commissioners talk about the boards we sit on to make each other aware of that, um, just the better leadership we'll have. We just need to really be informed. Mr. Lashley. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I guess the only thing I really have to reply to uh, is um, uh, I think uh, it was like blowing my own horn and giving myself kudos for something, but the only thing I can really say to that lady uh, is when you get accused of not doing your job and you have evidence to prove the fact that you do, then it's incumbent upon you to speak that. And that's all I was doing in that meeting, Craig, is we were being told that we weren't, we weren't doing what we were supposed to. And in the meeting that night, Mr. Thorpe gave us a $54 million request. And we sat down, we listened to them, we sat down, and we made our... our we talked with the school system about showing us your top 10 list. That's what we asked for. Just give us your top 10. We took that top 10 list and we went through it and we funded the top seven priorities. Now, in the process of funding those priorities, those priorities were funded two years ago. Two years ago. We funded them at a two-year clip of $16.5 million. There were two projects in that particular scenario in which the Hall River Elementary, I think you mentioned it today. October 22nd, 2022, they came and requested $1.4 million for Hall River Elementary. Roof project, $1.1 million. Masonry project, $3.64,000. And we granted that to you. Five months later, February, the third meeting in February, the school system came to us again and asked for an additional million dollars for those same projects. And how it was broken down was $800,000 for the roof and another $210,000 for the masonry project. So just to let you know, those, this is why people get a little bit up in arms when they see this because it does happen. So I think that we try to do the best we can with the information that you folks give us. And we definitely listen to you. And I don't like the fact that people say we don't listen to you. Because this is just a prime example of yes, we do. And we take our job seriously when we have a department that comes to us. For example, environmental health came to us, had an emergency, had a hole in the floor in the manager's office. We took care of that immediately. So I just want everyone to know that when you come here and you tell us that you have a problem, we listen. And we try to figure out, every single person up here is a problem solver. We try to solve the problems that we have in front of us. And the only way we can solve those problems is if we get the complete and total honest truth on how we can fix these things. Because we definitely want to make your organization as strong as possible. Because it makes most folks in this county stronger. So I just want you to know that, that we do listen to you and we do try to help when we can. And I think that Ms. Uh, York gave you the real facts today. That the Alamance County taxpayer, like someone said this morning, they do support the school system and they do it in a big way. And I just hope that, you know, this is a lesson to all of us about that we still have more work to do. And um, I just also want to uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank the county staff. I want to thank you all so much for all your hard work and your dedication and your overtime hours that you folks put in this past week because I know that you have a ton of things to take care of. I, I see your desk. <laughs> you are always busy and we do appreciate it. And just want you to know that people of Alamance County appreciate your hard work too. And we definitely are thankful that you have the dedication to Alamance County that you do.
So I just wanted to let all the Alamance County staff know. Bruce especially, thank you so much for all your help. <laughs> he does a great job, Thomas. I don't care what you say. <laughs> but I just want to thank the staff for their hard work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, I, I'll just, I'll just say that I, I, over the past, the course two weeks, past over the course of the past two weeks, I have been trying to be laser focused on getting kids back in safe schools as quickly as possible. Um, we've had a number of meetings. That's fine. Um, uh, what I have tried to understand is the scope and the severity of the problem and in school. When we've been provided with that information, we funded remediation at that school. Um, and that's that's important because we, we simply have to get kids back in school. I've got, many of you know, I've got three kids in, in ABSS schools. Um, one of them has um, probably got PTSD about virtual learning. Uh, and so the thought about that was, was very difficult for, for her to accept. And so you know, I hear about this at the dinner table. We go through this uh, with our family. Um, this, is, this is personal um, to me and obviously to uh, 26,000 kids in the, in the district. So um, I will continue to be laser focused on getting this mold remediation done in the schools where it needs to be done until we get the kids in safe schools as quickly as possible. Mr. Carver. Sure. This Carver. <laughs> well, going back to what's already been said, asset management is critical. Got to do it. Got to do a better job of it. Whether that's doing a combination with the county and the schools, or a third party, whatever we do, we've got to come up with a solution to make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, commissioner comments. I concur with what Ms. Thompson said. I, I, it really troubles me when I see somebody come here, take their personal time to stand before us and bleed their blood. And I, I think it's easy for a lot of us who speak publicly all the time to just assume it's easy for everyone. It's not. I, mean, I think we all know that. And we need to recognize that if they come to us with a question or with a problem, we need to be able to address that without telling them they've got to wait three hours and listen to everything else we have to do. Whether that means inserting a commissioner's comment section after public comments and then a final commissioner's comments, because there are commissioner's comments that will come up as a result of the items. And I think we, at one time, we had two commissioner's comments. One was after public comments. Another one was after the, uh, at the back, at the end of the meeting. Uh, I think that's a good plan. Uh, Matter of fact, I'd like to put forth a motion that we amend our policy, operating policy, Let's to include. Please wait on that. Do we have further discussion? Might as well do it. We're all here. We're sitting here. We don't need public comments on public comments. Um, I don't think. Um, make a motion that we add commissioner comments below public comments the way it was done historically. That's your motion? I'll second your motion. All right, now, comments from commissioners, and we'll take the first shot. We did exactly that when I was commissioner in 2015. Mr. Lashley, your father was on the board at that point. Uh, the meetings lasted three to five hours. There was constant bickering and battle. They were shorter than they are now. Yeah, well, <laughs> at this meeting, Thomas, that's out of order. Um, <laughs> This meeting is unusual. We don't normally have meetings that extend into the afternoon. And I think this meeting was necessary to have the school board and the school administrators have the funding to do that. But you had bickering during the comments from people from commissioners. And the meetings were just went on forever and it was a personal fight between county commissioners and public speakers. It did not work. Um, yeah, we can we can do that, but it's such a. I, I've lived through the old system, and I've lived through the new system. Our meetings typically are an hour and a half, no more than two hours, morning or evening, 
with the exception of things like today, where you have a major crisis <coughs> ongoing, um, uh, we've changed the procedure in 2000 for a reason, and it was to stop the bickering between commissioners and speaker, public speakers. We don't, that so lowers the level of our meetings for starters. You don't start having arguments from the podium with the public speakers. That is such a bad idea. Uh, but, and if they don't care enough about their comments to wait to the end of the meeting, then they are all in it anyway, first off. Secondly, they can go back and listen to it online. They're all recorded, and they can go back and listen to our comments at the end, whether live or on tape. And additionally, we have to consider staff time. Yeah, they were spending 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night in county commissioner meetings because of bickering going on between speakers and the folks on the podium. It just, it's just such bad procedure. I, see, I saw it before, and I see how much smoother our meetings are currently running. Um, yeah, I'm going to oppose... Call the question. I'm going to oppose making the change. Call the question. Call the question. I, I call I'm sorry, I'm going to call you out of order. I'm just pointing out that you called the question. If you continue, we will have you removed. I'm the one that said call the question. I understand that, but he's repeating and interrupting. All right, my point. Uh, do we have any other discussion for commissioners? Just one thing. You say that it's... Um, you, you, you say that it's, it just runs a lot smoother if we don't have that. Um, that it's just easier for us. I don't think it's supposed to be easier for us. I think we're supposed to sit up here and, okay, girl power, take it like a man, because that's what we do with leaders. Sometimes it's going to be really tough, and sometimes it's going to be really easy. Um, this week has been really tough because of how important it is. To me, it's been life and death because it just has. The effect on moms and dads and kids not knowing that, that uncertainty will work you out. But you know, um, I, when we used to do, not to regress, but doing transfer appeals and when kids had gotten in trouble like Appeal 23, we would be sitting up here as a school board member and they'd come in and they're just so intimidating. Like, we're just like the Wizard of Oz, the big bald head and the thing, you know, and then there's the line and all them people. And I, that's just not how you deal with people. You gotta really come down to them and hear them and have empathy for what they say. Um, because we work for them. We are here at their mercy. And we can be out of here at their mercy. And I respect that. And I just, you know, it's, it's, it is something that is so important for us to be able to be in tune and talk to people. I personally know what it feels like to be cut off. And whenever they come in and have the nerve to stand there, like Steve is saying, not everybody is comfortable there. It's like you just you're opening yourself up. But to have the courage to come here and make a comment, I think it's very important to be respected. And I don't think it's going to kill us to actually answer a question. They can go on. And it's really up to us to bicker because we need to hear them and decide if we want to go to war with somebody or not. We just got to be bigger about that. But I think they deserve an answer when they come here. Mr. Cole had all those questions and I, the other week and I, at his tax rate, and he ended up leaving before he got his answer. And um, I mean, that was his choice, but um, I, we just can't ever put ourselves above anybody. And um, that's, that's just the way I see it. You know, if it passes, great. If it doesn't, great. I just wanted to give an opportunity for the people to hear something from us before we go through all this because they may not be here to hear about this. And um, this has been a long week, but we've also went through tax reevaluation. And then what we found out today, that's big. Talking about pitchforks and shovels, uh, hey, uh, it's something to think about. Eras like that, they're human because we're all human. So um, I, that, that's it. I'm just, um, I'm always about communication it's it'll, it'll break you or it'll make you 
And uh, sometimes all this stuff on Facebook, everybody thinks out loud. I've heard the F word dropped more on Facebook than I ever have in my life. And it's a shameful because it's out of emotion. You don't get anywhere like that. you got to know your facts before you get on, on media. We hear enough, what is it, misinformation all the way at the top. Way up at the top, up north. Okay. May I speak? Sure, I'm done. Okay. All right. One, Meridian, the school personnel would wait two to three hours before you have a chance to have your session that's on our agenda. And that's the way it used to work. And the administration, our manager, financial director, county attorney, assistant county attorney, assistant attorney, whatever, uh, are all going to sit here for hours hearing us having our way arguing with speakers before we get to any of the business that it should be ongoing. It's not just unfair to that one speaker. It's unfair to everybody. And we're sitting up here playing, I started to say high school games, but that was not allowed in my high school SGA. Yeah, uh, elementary school games, we don't need to be arguing with the speakers. If they are really that concerned, they'll hang on. Or guess what? All five of us got tons and tons and tons of telephone calls, both on our county phones and our home phones. I still have a home phone. Um, on our um, every emails, you name it. I have lost count with the number of people that I talked to over Friday afternoon, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and starting again this morning. I talked to the speakers. I talked to the voters. But I beg you not to vote to spend hours arguing with speakers. Just think it's a really, really bad motion. Mr. Chair, if I might, I just wanted to point out one thing. Uh, we've not discussed. So the law requires that the board meet at least monthly. It doesn't require that if the board meets more than monthly that the board hear from public speakers at every public board meeting. So there is somewhat of a middle ground option that we could tread here in saying that we would allow speakers perhaps at the beginning of the meeting, one meeting a month, and then not at the other. So there is, there is some availability of option there. But again, I like to have speakers at every meeting is it gives input to us as commissioners. I, yes, I we can do, I clearly can do that. And Mr. Stevens is dead on the money with that. But it cuts out public speakers at least one time a month. And I guess you would have the public speakers in the morning meetings so you can go through the evening or send out for lunch or do whatever else has to happen. But that's what would happen. Could also staff could could take a more active role in keeping track of directives or questions and then we could respond in writing and make it available to everyone if that would be helpful just so the board doesn't feel like they have to address each comment but we could keep a list and respond on behalf of the board if that would be helpful yeah, absolutely and mr paisley you're right on what you say uh, because i saw the mood and the attitude change of the county commissioners when that particular thing happened. Uh, at that particular time, there was actually, uh, uh, you didn't have the meeting started for like an hour after it was gaveled in because of the back and forth. Because, you know, for example, someone comes in and tells you, like uh, the lady today, that I was blowing my own horn. Well, if I wanted to step forward and say, hey, look, you're wrong because of A, B, and C, that's just going to cause it. That's just going to cause, that's not going to be good. I've seen it with my own eyes, and I have heard it with other commissioners are saying that was a horrible idea because it took away time from the meeting, first and foremost, and secondly, it did create angst between commissioners and speakers, and I, to be honest with you, I've heard speakers go out the door and county commissioners meet yelling. Mm -hmm. I was physically here that night when, after that back and forth and the speaker left, it was yelling out the door in a commissioner's meeting. 
So we should definitely make sure that we give the speakers time to speak. Definitely. I think that's mandatory, and I want it at every meeting. Once a month's not good enough. Because what you could do is just have the speakers come in in the daytime when everyone's at work. And then at night, you don't have to worry about anything, because that's when most folks are off of work and want to come and to the commissioners. I'm not advocating for oh, the position. No, I know I'm just making sure you understand that. Thank you. And that's what I'm saying. Personally speaking, I want speakers at every meeting. I think it's meant. Look at, uh, we wouldn't have found out uh, about the incident with Jeremy Akins if it hadn't been a public speaker brought it up to us. So there, there, we need speakers at every meeting. I, I, I just think there's a time and place for it. Thank you. I digress. Mr. Brief, Mr. Mr. Chairman, two points. One is I, I think our rules discourage motion making during commissioner comments. The rules that we're, that we're operating under now. So I'm not sure that the motion is proper. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'd also say that I, we are a chatty board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we are a chatty board. And if we have, I think if we have commissioner comments on the back side of public comments, we are going to get a bog down. And a lot of issues that are off the agenda and the folks who have planned to present uh, are going to get moved further and further and further back. And I, I don't think that's uh, fair to them. I don't, I think the way it exists now is, is, uh, is okay. I'll withdraw the motion and finish my comments. Excellent. Thanks. I still feel the same way because I'm chatty. That doesn't mean I have changed my I'm mind. Chatty I'm chatty, I don't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> well, three of us have other jobs. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's interesting. Mm, the job. I yes, think sir. you provided me with a number. This was probably back late spring, early summer on what the and I, I know, I think, I remember where it was. I don't know if you recall where it was. There was a comment made earlier today about the quarter percent sales tax. Uh -huh. um, and how much, somebody said something about it raising $8 million. Based on this year's sales tax revenue, I think we projected it at $4.5 million. Is that correct? It's a $4.5 million increase? Yeah, we're we'll going to have to look seven. to my yes, it was. finance director. So. Bear with me just a minute because I do have that file. Yeah. We have a sheet for that. And you'd asked me over the weekend as well if we were tracking to meet budget on right. the sales tax number, so we can pull that um, as well. Yes. So what we had for fiscal year 22 was that an estimated quarter cent on the sales tax would bring in $7.1 million. Yep. Can you look at the sales tax projection for me? Just to add to that, it's amazing how credit card debt is over a trillion dollars now. So um, sooner or later, that decline button's going to come up, and then what's going to happen? It's really something to think about that. Give us a You had the full work on it. Well, I had <laughs> asked that as other question, too, and she's looking up the information. Okay. Um, she hadn't brought me the information. Uh, Commissioner Carney, your, your uh, question was what was the uh, after the, the, uh, when, we, when we ended the budget? She was looking at the, uh, the, at the trend in sales tax. I asked for that question. I asked that question over the weekend. Oh, I thought you were asking like what was the projected ink, uh, overage that we would receive for this well, year's the, budget? The question was the first question was the projected overage mm -hmm. or the projected value of a quarter percent sales tax, seven point one million dollars. Second question is where are we trending in sales tax right now? Are we level? Are we up? Are we down? We, earlier this year we were going down. So is that in regard to fiscal year 23? Okay, so fiscal year 23, um, we came in receiving total receipts of $46.5 million. And that's all articles. For 23-24, I just received an email Friday about the first um, distribution, so I have no information on fiscal year 23-24 at this time. Because okay. they are two months delayed. They are two months delayed. So our payment that we've received for September is for July. Um, so it'll take a day or two to get that processed. So how does the 23 compare to 22? So 23 to 22, we were up 
three point, uh, about $3 million, slightly under $3 million. So we're slightly up $3 million, okay. And you said the total was 46 and a half? 46 and a half, yes. And granted, that is all articles, so please remember that there is a portion of Article 40 and 42 that is restricted. Yes, right. And those numbers are in that total. And I think you can see it in the Davenport model as well, how it trickles down. Yes. All right. People talk about the quarter percent of sales tax being a uh, being being a negative for the lower income bracket, but it's not on groceries and it's not on gasoline. So I'm not saying it's not a factor, but two segments of the something everybody has to buy that it doesn't impact. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I, I got one question for Ms. Evans. Yes, uh, the the the, uh, the sales tax number, the forty six and a half number. Uh, when you take out buckets forty and forty two, and I believe those are the things for the school mm -hmm. system, that forty six and a half number is actually larger. And if I got my calculations calculations right, that should probably be between ten and twelve million dollars more. I would have to look at that in greater detail. No worries. I was just thinking of that those two buckets because I keep an eye on these things quite closely because I do realize that that's what helps the ABSS uh, fund their Davenport model to fund the, the bond projects and other things. Yes. They also are able to, uh, we get a lot of money on sales tax that actually makes their uh, capital reserve account expand. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, my comments. One, I want to thank this board. The boards used to interrupt each other constantly under the old procedure. It was just Katie bar the door and chaos. That has changed tremendously since 2020 with our new procedure. And I want to say thanks to each of you. Secondly, to the school folks, and I'm talking to Dr. Butler, uh, Mr. Hook, school board members, and I thank you for being here. Um, but Hall River Elementary keeps coming to mind, as Mr. Lashley just mentioned. We funded that in 2015, they're talking about the roof, the brick fascia, mold remediation. Uh, I'm told 2017, 2021, whatever it was that you just talked about, uh, say, and, and we don't, the North Carolina General Statutes, monies that you as a school board, school system receive, from the state, and you do not spend by law, by under the general statutes, you are required to refund that to the state. There is no if, ands, or buts. On the other hand, the North Carolina general statutes do not allow the counties to recover monies that are appropriated in one or any number of years. We do not, by statute, get that money back. We have another request, whatever. And Dr. Butler, I have a lot of uh, respect for you. And I'm trusting you and Mr. Hook um, and the other school folks that are here to turn that around. Uh, please don't ask us for the same money multiple times. If there's an overage, I understand that. But we've got to prevent what has happened. In the, and I understand that's in the past. Uh, Dane, you were here as a school teacher, but thank goodness you're now here as a superintendent, and I expect you to turn those things around. Uh, and then the last item I have is I look forward to our next meeting and having from you school folks, and I don't care who the presenter is, but I want detailed information, and I'm really looking at Mr. Turner, who I called Carter earlier. Uh, we all need actual requests, numbers, accurate numbers, as fully as you can. Uh, and we need to be planning together these projects. I really don't want the public, the taxpayers, the students, the teachers, to be hitting these surprises again. Uh, and I understand uh, there were some issues with maintenance in the past, those sort of things. So, Dr. Butler, I 
pray that you come back with us on how are you going to correct it, and this will not happen again. Uh, and I'll look forward to that meeting in two weeks. Thank you. Okay, that's all I have. Any other commissioner comments? Okay, do we have a so moved? <laughs> Do we have second. a second to adjourn? I'll second. All right. I think Thomas just seconded as well. <laughs> All in favor of the adjournment, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.local.gov.com tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.